Chapter 30 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jeff Blanchard. Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. The Pony Carriage. On Saturday morning, the doctor was called to a place a good many miles distant, and Juliet was left with the prospect of being longer alone than usual. She felt it almost sultry, although so late in the season, and could not rest in the house. She pretended to herself she had some shopping to do in Pine Street, but it was rather a longing for air and motion that sent her out. Also, certain thoughts, which she did not like, had of late been coming more frequently, and she found it easier to avoid them in the street. They were not such as troubled her from being had to think out. Properly speaking, she thought less now than ever. She often said nice things, but they were mostly the mere gracious movements of a nature sweet, playful, trusting, fond of all beautiful things, and quick to see artistic relation where her perception reached. As she turned the corner of Mr. Drew's shop, the house door opened, and a lady came out. It was Mr. Drew's lodger. Juliet knew nothing about her, and was not aware that she had ever seen her, but the lady started as if she recognized her. To that kind of thing Juliet was accustomed, for her style of beauty was anything but common. The lady's regard, however, was so fixed that it drew hairs, and as their eyes met, Juliet felt something, almost a physical pain, shoot through her heart. She could not understand it, but presently began to suspect, and by degrees became quite certain that she had seen her before, though she could not tell where. The effect the sight of her had had indicated some painful association which she must recall before she could be at rest. She turned in the other direction, and walked straight from the town, that she might think without eyes upon her. Scene after scene of her life came back as she searched to find some circumstance associated with that face. Once and again she seemed on the point of laying hold of something, when the face itself vanished and she had that to recall, and the search to resume from the beginning. In the process, many painful memories arose, some connected with her mother, unhappy in themselves, others connected with her father, grown unhappy from her marriage, for thereby she had built a wall between her thoughts and her memories of him, and, if there should be a life beyond this, had hollowed a gulf between them forever. Gradually her thoughts took another direction. Could it be that already the glamour had begun to disperse, the roses of love to wither, the magic to lose its force, the common look of things to return? Paul was as kind, as courteous, as considerate as ever, and yet there was a difference. Her heart did not grow wild. Her blood did not rush to her face when she heard the sound of his horse's hoofs in the street, though she knew them instantly. Sadder and sadder grew her thoughts as she walked along, careless whither. Had she begun to cease loving? No, she loved better than she knew, but she must love infinitely better yet. The first glow was gone already. She had thought it would not go, and was miserable. She recalled that even her honeymoon had a little disappointed her. I would not be mistaken as implying that any of these her reflections had their origin in what was peculiar in the character, outlook, or speculation of herself or her husband. The passion of the love is but the vestibule, the pylon, to the temple of love. A garden lies between the pylon and the aditum. 
they that will enter the sanctuary must walk through the garden. But some start to see the roses already withering. Sit down and weep and watch their decay, until at length the aged flowers hang drooping all around them, and lo, their hearts are withered also. And when they rise, they turn their backs on the Holy of Holies, and their feet toward the gate. Juliet was proud of her Paul, and loved him as much as she was yet capable of loving, but she had thought they were enough for each other, and already, although she was far from acknowledging it to herself, she had, in the twilight of her thinking, begun to doubt it, nor can she be blamed for the doubt. Never man and woman yet succeeded in being all in all to each other. It were presumption to say that a lonely God would be enough for himself, seeing that we can know nothing of God but as he is our Father. What if the Creator himself is sufficient to himself in virtue of his self-existent creatorship? Let my reader think it out. The lower we go into the scale of creation, the more independent is the individual. The richer and more perfect each of a married pair is in the other relations of life, the more is each to the other. For us, the children of the eternal love, the very air our spirits breathe, and without which they cannot live, is the eternal life. For us, the brothers and sisters of a countless family, the very space in which our souls can exist, is the love of each and every soul of our kind. Such were not Juliet's thoughts. To her such would have seemed as unreal as unintelligible. To her they would have looked just what some of my readers will pronounce them, not in the least knowing what they are. She was suddenly roused from her painful reverie by the pulling up of Helen's ponies. With much clatter and wriggling recoil, close beside her, making more fuss with their toy carriage than the mightiest of tractive steeds with the chariot of pomp. Jump in, Juliet, cried their driver, addressing her with a greater abandon, that she was resolved no stiffness on her part should deposit a grain to the silting up on the channel of former affection. She was one of the few who understand that no being can afford to let the smallest love germ die. Juliet hesitated. She was not a little bewildered with a sudden recall from the moony plains of memory and the demand for immediate action. She answered uncertainly, trying to think what was involved. I know your husband is not waiting you at home, pursued Helen. I saw him on Ruber, three fields off, riding away from Glaston. Jump in, dear. You can make up that mind of yours in the carriage, as well as upon the road. I will set you down wherever you please. My husband is out too, so the slaves can take their pleasure. Juliet could not resist had little inclination to do so, yielded without another word, and took her place beside Helen. A little shy of being alone with her, yet glad of her company, away went the ponies, and as soon as she had got them settled to their work, Helen turned her face toward Juliet. I am so glad to see you, she said. Juliet's heart spoke too loud for her throat, it was a relief to her that Helen had kept her eyes on her charge, the quickness of whose every motion rendered watchfulness right needful. "'Have you returned Mrs. Bevis's call yet?' asked Helen. "'No,' murmured Juliet. "'I haven't been able yet.' "'Well, here is a good chance. Sit where you are, and you will be at Nestle in half an hour.' and I shall be the more welcome. You are a great favourite there. How kind you are, said Juliet. 
the tears beginning to rise. Indeed, Mrs. Wingfold. You used to call me Helen, said that lady, pulling up her ponies with sudden energy, as they shied at a bit of paper on the road, and nearly had themselves and all they drew in the ditch. May I call you so still? Surely, what else? You are too good to me, said Juliet, and wept outright. My dear Juliet, returned Helen, I will be quite plain with you, and that will put things straight in a moment. Your friends understand perfectly why you have avoided them of late, and are quite sure it is from no unkindness to any of them. But neither must you imagine we think hardly of you for marrying Mr. Faber. We detest his opinions so much that we feel sure if you saw a little further into them, neither of you would hold them. But I don't. That is, I... You don't know whether you hold them or not. I understand quite well. My husband says, in your case, it does not matter much. For if you had ever really believed in Jesus Christ, you could not have done it. At all events, now the thing is done. There is no question about it left. Dear Juliet, think of us as your friends still, who will always be glad to see you, and ready to help you where we can. Juliet was weeping for genuine gladness now. But even as she wept, by one of those strange movements of our being, which those who have been quickest to question them, wonder at the most, it flashed upon her where she had seen the lady that came from Mr. Drew's house, and her heart sunk within her, for the place was associated with that portion of her history, which of all she would most gladly hide from herself. During the rest of the drive, she was so silent that Helen at last gave up trying to talk to her. Then first she observed how the clouds had risen on all sides and were meeting above, and that the air was more still and sultry than ever. Just as they got within Nestle Gate, a flash of lightning, scarcely followed by a loud thunderclap, shot from overhead. The ponies plunged, reared, swayed asunder from the pole, nearly fell, and recovered themselves only to dart off in wild terror. Juliet screamed. Don't be frightened, child, said Helen. There is no danger here. The road is straight, and there is nothing on it. I shall soon pull them up. Only don't cry out. That will be as little to their taste as the lightning. Juliet caught at the reins. For God's sake, don't do that, cried Helen, balking her clutch. You will kill us both. Juliet sunk back in her seat. The ponies went at full speed along the road. The danger was small, for the pack was upon both sides, level with the drive, in which there was a straight ascent. Helen was perfectly quiet, and went on gradually tightening her pull upon the reins. Before they reached the house, she had entirely regained her command of them. When she drew up to the door, they stood quite steady but panting as if their little sides would fly asunder. By this time Helen was red as a rose. Her eyes were flashing, and a smile was playing about her mouth, but Juliet was like a lily on which the rain had been falling all night. Her very lips were bloodless. When Helen turned and saw her, she was far more frightened than the ponies could make her. Why, Juliet, my dear, she said. I had no thought you were so terrified. What would your husband say to me for frightening you so? But you are safe now. A servant came to take the ponies. Helen got out first, and gave her hand to Juliet. Don't think me a coward, Helen, she said. It was the thunder. I never could bear thunder. I should be far more of a coward than you are, Juliet answered Helen. If I believed, or even feared, that just a false step of little Zephyr there, or one plunge more from Zoe, 
might wipe out the world, and I should never more see the face of my husband. She spoke eagerly, lovingly, believingly. Juliet shivered, stopped, and laid hold of the baluster rail. Things had been too much for her that day. She looked so ill that Helen was again alarmed, but she soon came to herself a little, and they went on to Mrs. Bevis's room. She received them most kindly, made Mrs. Faber lie on the sofa, covered her over, for she was still trembling, and got her a glass of wine, but she could not drink it, and lay sobbing in vain endeavour to control herself. Meantime the clouds gathered thicker and thicker, the thunder peal that frightened the ponies had been but the herald of the storm, and now it came on in earnest. The rain rushed suddenly on the earth, and as soon as she heard it, Juliet ceased to sob. At every flash, however, although she lay with her eyes shut, and her face pressed into the pillow, she shivered and moaned. Why should one, thought Helen, who is merely and only the child of nature, find herself so little at home with her? Presently, Mr. Bevis came running in from the stable, drenched in crossing to the house. As he passed to his room, he opened the door of his wife's and looked in. I'm glad to see you safely housed, ladies, he said. You must make up your minds to stay where you are. It will not clear before the moon rises, and that will be about midnight. I will send John to tell your husbands that you are not cowering under a hedge and will not be home tonight. He was a good weather prophet. The rain went on. In the evening, the two husbands appeared dripping. They had come on horseback together and would ride home again after dinner. The doctor would have to be out the greater part of the Sunday and would gladly leave his wife in such good quarters. The curate would walk out to his preaching in the evening and drive home with Helen after it, taking Juliet, if she should be able to accompany them. After dinner, when the ladies had left them, between the two clergymen and the doctor arose the conversation of which I would now give the substance, leaving the commencement and taking it up at an advanced point. Now tell me, said Faber, in the tone of one satisfied he must be allowed in the right, which is the nobler, to serve your neighbour in the hope of a future, believing in a God who will reward you, or to serve him in the dark, obeying your conscience, with no other hope than that those who come after you will be the better for you? I allow most heartily, answered Wingfold, and with all admiration, that it is indeed grand in one hopeless for himself to live well for the sake of generations to come, which he will never see, and which will never hear of him. But I will not allow that there is anything grand in being hopeless for one's self, or in serving the unseen rather than those about you, seeing it is easier to work for those who cannot oppose you than to endure the contradiction of sinners. But I know you agree with me that the best way to assist posterity is to be true to your contemporaries. So there I need say no more, except that the hopeless man can do the least for his fellows, being unable to give them anything that should render them other than hopeless themselves. And if, for the grandeur of it, a man were to cast away his purse in order to have the praise of parting with the two mites left in his pocket, you would simply say the man was a fool. This much seems to me clear, that, if there be no God, it may be nobler to be able to live without one, but, if there be a God, it must be nobler not to be able to live without him. 
The moment, however, that nobility becomes the object in any action, that moment the nobleness of the action vanishes. The man who serves his fellow, that he may himself be noble, misses the mark. He alone who follows the truth, not he who follows nobility, shall attain the noble. A man's nobility will, in the end, prove just commensurate with his humanity, with the love he bears his neighbour, not the amount of work he may have done for him. A man might throw a lordly gift to his fellow, like a bone to a dog, and damn himself in the deed. You may insult a dog by the way you give him his bone. I dispute nothing of all that, said Faber, while good Mr. Bevis sat listening hard, not quite able to follow the discussion. But I know you will admit that to do right from respect to any reward whatever hardly amounts to doing right at all. I doubt if any man did or could do a thing worthy of passing as in itself good for the sake of a reward, rejoined Wingfold. Certainly, to do good for something else than good is not good at all, but perhaps a reward may so influence a low nature as to bring it a little into contact with what is good, whence the better part of it may make some acquaintance with good. Also, the desire of the appropriation of the perfect might nobly help a man who was finding his duty hard, for it would humble as well as strengthen him, and is but another form of love of the good. The praise of God will always humble a man, I think. There you are out of my depth, said Faber. I know nothing about that. I go on then to say, continued the curate, that a man may well be strengthened and encouraged by the hope of being made a better and truer man, and capable of greater self-forgetfulness and devotion. There is nothing low in having respect to such a reward as that, is there? It seems to me better, persisted the doctor, to do right for the sake of duty than for the sake of any goodness, even that will come thereby to yourself. Assuredly, if self in the goodness, and not the goodness itself be the object, asserted Wingfold, when a duty lies before one, self ought to have no part in the gaze we fix upon it. But when thought reverts upon himself, who would avoid the wish to be a better man? The man who will not do a thing for duty will never get so far as to derive any help from the hope of goodness. But duty itself is only a stage towards something better. It is but the impulse, God-given, I believe, toward a far more vital contact with the truth. We shall one day forget all about duty and do everything from the love of the loveliness of it, the satisfaction of the rightness of it. What would you say to a man who ministered to the wants of his wife and family only from duty? Of course you will wish heartily that the man who neglects them would do it from any cause, even were it fear of the whip. But the strongest and most operative sense of duty would not satisfy you in such a relation. There are depths within depths of righteousness. Duty is the only path to freedom. But that freedom is the love that is beyond and prevents duty. But, said Faber, I have heard you say that to take from your belief in a God would be to render you incapable of action. Now, the man, I don't mean myself, but the sort of a man for whom I stand up, does act, does his duty, without the strength of that belief. Is he not then the stronger? Let us drop the word noble. In the case supposed, he would be the stronger, for a time at least, replied the curate. But you must remember that to take from me the joy and glory of my life, namely the belief that I am the child of God and heir of the infinite, with the hope 
of being made perfectly righteous, loving like God himself, would be something more than merely reducing me to the level of a man who had never loved God, or seen in the possibility of him anything to draw him. I should have lost the mighty dream of the universe. He would be what and where he chose to be, and might well be the more capable. Were I to be convinced there is no God, and to recover by the mere force of animal life from the prostration into which the conviction cast me, I should, I hope, try to do what duty was left me, for I too should be filled, for a time at least, with an endless pity for my fellows. But all would be so dreary that I should be almost paralysed for saving them, and should long for death to do them and myself the only good service. The thought of the generations doomed to be born into a sunless present would almost make me join any conspiracy to put a stop to the race. I should agree with Hamlet that the whole thing had better come to an end. Would it necessarily indicate a lower nature or condition or habit of thought that, having cherished such hopes, I should, when I lost them, be more troubled than one who'd never had had them? Still, said Faber, I ask you to allow that a nature which can do without help is greater than a nature which cannot. If the thing done were the same, I should allow it, answered the curate, but the things done will prove altogether different. And another thing to be noted is that while the need of help might indicate a lower nature, the capacity for receiving it must indicate a higher. The mere fact of being able to live and act in a more meagre spiritual circumstances in itself proves nothing. It is not the highest nature that has the fewest needs. The highest nature is the one that has the most necessities, but the fewest of its own making. He is not the greatest man who is the most independent, but he who thirsts most after a conscious harmony with every element and portion of the mighty whole, demands from every region thereof its influences to perfect his individuality, regards that individuality as his kingdom, his treasure, not to behold, but to give, sees in his self the one thing he can devote, the one precious means of freedom by its sacrifice, and that in no contempt or scorn, but in love to God and his children, the multitudes of his kind, by dying ever thus, ever thus losing his soul, he lives like God, and God knows him, and he knows God. This is too good to be grasped, but not too good to be true. The highest is that which needs the highest, the largest that which needs the most, the finest and strongest that which to live must breathe essential life, self-willed life, God himself. It follows that it is not the largest or the strongest nature that will feel a loss the least. An ant will not gather a grain of corn the less that his mother is dead, while a boy will turn from his books and his play and his dinner because his bird is dead. Is the ant therefore the stronger nature? Is it not weak to be miserable? said the doctor. Yes, without good cause, answered the curate. But you do not know what it would be to me to lose my faith in my God. My misery would be a misery to which no assurance of immortality or of happiness could bring anything but tenfold misery. The conviction that I should never be good myself never have anything to love absolutely, never be able to make amends for the wrongs I have done. Call such a feeling selfish if you will. I cannot help it. I cannot count 
one fit for existence to whom such things would be no grief the worthy existence must hunger after good the largest nature must have the mightiest hunger who calls a man selfish because he is hungry he is selfish if he broods on the pleasures of eating and would not go without his dinner for the sake of another but if he had no hunger where would be the room for his self-denial besides in spiritual things the only way to give them to your neighbours is to hunger after them yourself there each man is a mouth to the body of the whole creation it cannot be selfishness to hunger and thirst after righteousness which righteousness is just your duty to your god and your neighbour if there be any selfishness in it the very answer to your prayer will destroy it there you are again out of my region said faber but answer me one thing is it not weak to desire happiness yes if the happiness is poor and low rejoined wingfold but the man who would choose even the grandeur of duty before the bliss of the truth must be a lover of himself such a man must be travelling the road to death if there be a god truth must be joy if there be not truth may be misery but honestly i know not one advanced christian who tries to obey for the hope of heaven or the fear of hell such ideas have long vanished from such a man he loves god he loves truth he loves his fellow and knows he must love him more you judge of christianity either by those who are not true representatives of it and are indeed less of christians than yourself or by others who being intellectually inferior perhaps even stupid belie christ with their dull theories concerning him yet the latter may have in them a noble seed edging them up heights to you at present unconceived and unconceivable while in the meantime some of them serve their generation well and do as much for those that are to come after as you do yourself there is always weight as well as force in what you urge wingfold returned faber still it looks to me just a cunning devised fable i will not say of the priests but of the human mind deceiving itself with its own hopes and desires it may well look such to those who are outside of it and it must at length appear such to all who feeling in it any claim upon them yet do not put it to the test of their obedience well you have had your turn and now we are having ours you of the legends we of the facts no said wingfold we have not had our turn and you have been having yours for a far longer time than we but if as you profess you are doing the truth you see it belongs to my belief that you will come to see the truth you do not see christianity is not a failure for to it mainly is the fact owing that here is a class of men which believing in no god yet believes in duty toward men look here if christianity be the outcome of human aspiration the natural growth of the human soil is it not strange it should be as such an utter failure as it seems to you and as such a natural growth it must be a failure for if it were a success must not you be the very one to see it if it is false it is worthless or an evil where then is your law of development if the highest result of that development is an evil to the nature and the race i do not grant it the highest result said faber it is a failure a false blossom with a truer to follow 
to produce a superior architecture, poetry, music? Perhaps not, but a better science. Are the architecture and poetry and music part of the failure? Yes, but they are not altogether a failure for they lay some truth at the root of them all. Now we shall see what will come of turning away from everything we do not know. That is not exactly what you mean, for that would be never to know anything more. But the highest you have in view is immeasurably below what Christianity has always demanded of its followers but has never got from them, and never will. Look at the wars, the hatreds, to which your gospel has given rise. Look at Calvin and poor servitors. Look at the strifes and divisions of our own day. Look at the religious newspapers. All granted, it is a chaos, the motions of whose organization must be strife. The spirit of life is at war with the spasmatical body of death. If Christianity be not still in the process of development, it is the saddest of all failures. The fact is, Wingfold, your prophet would have been king of the race if he had not believed in a god. I dare not speak the answer that rises to my lips, said Wingfold. But there is more truth in what you say than you think, and more of essential lie also. My answer is that the faith of Jesus in his God and Father is, even now, saving me, setting me free from my one horror, selfishness, making my life an unspeakable boon to me, letting me know its roots in the eternal and perfect giving me such love to my fellow, that I trust at last to love him as Christ has loved me. But I do not expect you to understand me. He in whom I believe said that a man must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The doctor laughed. You are then one of the double-born Wingfold? He said. I believe, I think, I hope so, replied the curate very gravely. And you, Mr. Bevis? I don't know. I wish, I doubt, answered the rector with equal solemnity. Oh, never fear, said Faber, with a quiet smile, and rising, left the clergyman together. But what a morning it was that came up after the storm. All night the lightning had been flashing itself into peace, and gliding further and further away. Bellowing and growling the thunder had crept with it, but longer after it could no more be heard, the lightning kept gleaming up, as if from a sea of flame behind the horizon. The sun brought a glorious day, and looked larger and mightier than before, to Helen as she gazed eastward from her window, he seemed ascending his lofty pulpit to preach the story of the day named after him, the story of the sun day, the rising again in splendor of the darkened and buried sun of the universe, with whom all the worlds and all their hearts and suns arose. A light stream was floating up from the grass, and the raindrops were sparkling everywhere. The day had arisen from the bosom of the night, peace and graciousness from the bosom of the storm, she herself from the grave of her sleep, over which had lain the turf of the darkness, and all was fresh life and new hope. And through it all, reviving afresh with every sign of nature's universal law of birth, was the consciousness that her life, her own self, was rising from the dead, was being newborn also. She had not far to look back to the time when all was dull and dead in her being. When the earthquake came, and the storm, and the fire, 
and after them the still small voice, breathing rebuke and hope and strength. Her whole world was now radiant with expectation. It was through her husband the change had come to her, but he was not the rock on which she built. For his sake she could go to hell, yea, cease to exist, but there was one whom she loved more than him, the one, one whose love was the self-willed cause of all love, who from the love had sent forth her husband and herself to love one another, whose heart was the nest of their birth, the cradle of their growth, the rest of their being, yea, more than her husband she loved him, her elder brother, by whom the father had done it all, the man who lived and died and rose again so many hundred years ago, in him the perfect one, she hoped for a perfect love to her husband, a perfect nature in herself. She knew how Faber would have mocked at such a love, the very existence of whose object she could not prove. How mocked at the notion that his life, even now, was influencing hers. She knew how he would say it was merely love and marriage that had wrought the change. But as she recognized them as forces altogether divine, she knew that not only was the Son of Man behind them, but that it was her obedience to him and her confidence in him that had wrought the red heart of the change in her. She knew that she would rather break with her husband altogether than to do one action contrary to the known mind and will of that man. Faber would call her faith a mighty, perhaps a lovely illusion. Her life was an active waiting for the revelation of its object in splendour before the universe. The world seemed to her a grand match of resurrections, out of the every sorrow springing the joy at its heart, without which it could not have been a sorrow, out of the troubles and evils and sufferings and cruelties that clouded its history, ever arising the human race the sons of God, redeemed in him who had been made subject to death, that he might conquer death for them and for his father. A succession of mighty facts whose meanings only God can evolve, only the obedient heart behold. On such a morning, so full of resurrection, Helen was only a little troubled not to be one of her husband's congregation. She would take her New Testament and spend the sunny day in the open air. In the evening he was coming and would preach in the little chapel. If only Juliet might hear him too, but she would not ask her to go. Juliet was better, for fatigue had compelled sleep. The morning had brought her little hope, however no sense of resurrection. A certain dead thing had begun to move in its coffin. She was utterly alone with it, and it made the world feel a tomb around her. Not all resurrections are the resurrection of life, though in the end they will be found, even to the lowest birth of the power of the enemy, to have contributed thereto. She did not get up to breakfast, Helen persuaded her to rest, and herself carried it to her, but she rose soon after, and declared herself quite well. The rector drove to Glaston, in his dog-cart, to read prayers. Helen went out into the park, with her New Testament, and George Herbert. Poor Juliet was left with Mrs. Bevis, who happily could not be duller than usual although it was Sunday. By the time the rector returned, bringing his curate with him, she was bored almost beyond endurance. 
she had not yet such a love of wisdom as to be able to bear with folly. The foolish and weak are the most easily disgusted with folly and weakness, which is not of their own sort, and are the last to make allowances for them. To spend also the evening with a softly smiled old woman, who would not go across the grass after such a rain the night before, was a thing not to be contemplated. Juliet borrowed a pair of galoshes, and insisted on going to the chapel. In vain the rector and his wife dissuaded her. Neither Helen nor her husband said a word. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 31 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Zach Hoyt. Paul Faber, Surgeon. By George MacDonald. Chapter 31. A Conscience. The chapel in the park at Nestle, having as yet received no colour, and having no organ or choir, was a cold, uninteresting little place. It was neat, but had small beauty and no history. Yet even already had begun to gather in the hearts of two or three of the congregation a feeling of quiet sacredness about it. Some soft airs of the spirit wind had been wandering through their souls as they sat there and listened. And a gentle awe, from old associations with lay worship, stole like a soft twilight over Juliet as she entered. Even the enteral dusk of an old reverence may help to form the fitting mood through which shall slide unhindered the still small voice that makes appeal to what of God is yet awake in the soul. There were present about a score of villagers, and the party from the house. Clad in no vestments of office, but holding in his hand the New Testament, which was always held either there or in his pocket, Wingfold rose to speak. He read, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Then at once he began to show them, in the simplest interpretation, that the hypocrite was one who pretended to be what he was not, who tried or consented to look other and better than he was. That a man, from unwillingness to look at the truth concerning himself, might be but half-consciously assenting to the false appearance, would, he said, no wise serve to save him from whatever of doom was involved in this utterance of our Lord concerning the crime. These words of explanation and caution premised, he began at the practical beginning, and spoke a few forceful things on the necessity of absolute truth as to fact in every communication between man and man, telling them that, so far as he could understand his words recorded, our Lord's objection to swearing lay chiefly in this, that it encouraged untruthfulness, tending to make a man's yea less than yea, his nay other than nay. He said that many people who told lies every day would be shocked when they discovered that they were liars, and that their lying must be discovered, for the Lord said so. Every untruthfulness was a passing hypocrisy, and if they would not come to be hypocrites out and out, they must begin to avoid it by speaking every man the truth to his neighbor. If they did not begin at once to speak the truth, they must grow worse and worse liars. The Lord called hypocrisy leaven, because of its irresistible, perhaps as well as its unseen, growth and spread. He called it the leaven of the Pharisees, because it was the all-pervading quality of their being, and from them was working moral dissolution in the nation, eating like a canker into it, by infecting with like hypocrisy all who looked up to them. Is it not a strange drift, this of men, said the curate, to hide what is under the veil of what is not, to seek refuge in lies, as if that which is not could be an armor of adamant? to run from the daylight for safety deeper into the cave? In the cave house the creatures of the night, the tigers and hyenas, the serpent and the old dragon of the dark. In the light are true men and women, and the clear-eyed angels. But the reason is only too plain. It is, alas, that they are themselves of the darkness and not of the light. They do not fear their own. They are more comfortable with the beasts of darkness than with the angels of light. They dread the peering of holy eyes into their hearts. They feel themselves naked and fear to be ashamed, therefore cast the garment of hypocrisy about them. They have that in them so strange to the light that they feel it must be hidden from the eye of day as a thing hideous, that is, a thing to be hidden. But the hypocrisy is worse than all that would hide. That they have to hide again as a more hideous thing still. God hides nothing. His very work from the beginning is revelation, 
a casting aside of veil after veil, a showing unto men of truth after truth, on and on, from fact to fact divine he advances, until at length in his son Jesus he unveils his very face. Then begins a fresh unveiling, for the very work of the Father is the work the Son himself has to do, to reveal. His life was the unveiling of himself, and the unveiling of the Son is still going on, and is that for the sake of which the world exists. When he is unveiled, that is, when we know the Son, we shall know the Father also. The whole of creation, its growth, its history, the gathering total of human existence, is an unveiling of the Father. He is the life, the eternal life, the only I see it, ah, believe me, I see it as I cannot say it. From month to month it grows upon me. The lovely home light, the one essence of peaceful being, is God himself. He loves light and not darkness, therefore shines, therefore reveals. True, there are infinite gulfs in him, into which our small vision cannot pierce, but they are gulfs of light, and the truths there are invisible only through excess of their own clarity. There is a darkness that comes of effulgence, and the most veiling of all veils is the light. That for which the eye exists is light, but through light no human eye can pierce. I find myself beyond my depth. I am ever beyond my depth. Afloat in an infinite sea, but the depth of the sea knows me, for the ocean of my being is God. What I would say is this, that the light is not blinding because God would hide, but because the truth is too glorious for our vision. The effulgence of himself God veiled that he might unveil it in his Son, Interuniversal spaces, eons, eternities, what word of vastness you can find or choose, take unfathomable darkness itself, if you will, to express the infinitude of God, that original splendor existing only to the consciousness of God himself. I say he hides it not, but is revealing it ever, forever, at all cost of labor, yea, of pain to himself. His whole creation is a sacrificing of himself to the being and well-being of his little ones, that, being wrought out at last into partakers of his divine nature, that nature may be revealed in them to their divinest bliss. He brings hidden things out of the light of his own being into the light of ours. But see how different we are, until we learn of him. See the tendency of man to conceal his treasures, to claim even truth as his own by discovery, to hide it and be proud of it, gloating over that which he thinks he has it in himself, instead of groaning after the infinite of God. We would be forever heaping together possessions, dragging things into the cave of our finitude, our individual self, not perceiving that the things which pass that dreariest of doors, whatever they may have been, are thenceforth but straws, small sticks, and dust of the floor. When a man would have a truth in thither as if it were of private interpretation, he drags in only the bag which the truth, remaining outside, has burst and left. Nowhere are such children of darkness born as in the caves of hypocrisy. Nowhere else can a man revel with such misshapen hybrids of religion and sin. But, as one day will be found, I believe, a strength of physical light before which even solid gold or blackest marble becomes transparent, so there is a spiritual light before which all veils of falsehood shall shrivel up and perish and cease to hide, so that, in the individual character, in the facts of being, in the densest of pharisaical hypocrisy, there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed nothing hid that shall not be known. If then, brother or sister, thou hast that which would be hidden, make haste and drag the thing from its covert into the presence of thy God, thy light, thy Saviour, that, if it be in itself good, it may be cleansed, if evil, it may be stung through and through with the burning arrows of truth, and perish in glad relief. For the one bliss of an evil thing is to perish and pass. The evil thing, and that alone, is the natural food of death. Nothing else will agree with the monster. If we have such foul things, I say, within the circumference of our known selves, we must confess the charnel fact to ourselves and to God, and if there be anyone else who has a claim to know it, to that one also must we confess, casting out the vile thing that we may be clean. Let us make haste to open the doors of our lips and the windows of our humility, to let out the demon of darkness and in the angels of light, so abjuring the evil. Be sure that concealment is utterly, absolutely hopeless. If we do not thus ourselves open our house, the day will come when a roaring blast of his wind, or the flame of his keen lightning, will destroy every defense of darkness, and set us shivering before the universe in our naked vileness, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Ah, well for man that he cannot hide. What vaults of uncleanness, what sinks of dreadful horrors, would not the souls of some of us grow? But for every one of them, as for the universe, comes the day of cleansing. Happy they who hasten it, who open wide the doors, take the broom in hand, and begin to sweep. The dust may rise in clouds, the offense may be great, the sweeper may pant and choke and weep, yea, grow faint and sick with self-disgust, but the end will be a clean house, 
and the light and wind of heaven shining and blowing clear and fresh and sweet through all its chambers. Better so than have a hurricane from God burst in doors and windows, and sweep from his temple with the besom of destruction everything that loveth and maketh a lie. Brothers, sisters, let us be clean. The light and the air around us are God's vast purifying furnace. Out into it let us cast all hypocrisy. Let us be open-hearted, and speak every man the truth to his neighbor. Amen. The faces of the little congregation had been staring all the time at the speakers, as the flowers of a little garden stare at the sun. Like a white lily that had begun to fade, that of Juliet had drawn the eyes of the curate, as the whitest spot always will. But it had drawn his heart also. Had her troubles already begun, poor girl? he thought. Had the sweet book of marriage already begun to give out its bitterness? It was not just so. Marriage was good to her still. Not yet, though, but a thing of this world, as she and her husband were agreed, had it begun to grow stale and wearisome. She was troubled. It was with no reaction against the opinions to which she had practically yielded, but not less had the serpent of truth bitten her, for it can bite through the gauze of whatever opinions or theories. Conscious persistent wrong may harden and thicken the gauze to a quilted armor, but even through that the sound of its teeth may wake up dawn worm, the conscience, and then is the baser nature between the fell incensed points of mighty opposites. It avails a man little to say he does not believe this or that, if the while he cannot rest because of some word spoken. True speech, as well as true scripture, is given by inspiration of God. It goes forth on the wind of the Spirit, with the ministry of fire. The sun will shine, and the wind will blow, the floods will beat, and the fire will burn, until the yielding soul, reborn into childhood, spreads forth its hands and rushes to the Father. It was dark, and Juliet took the offered arm of the rector and walked with him toward the house. Both were silent, for both had been touched. The rector was busy tumbling over the contents now of this, now of that old chest and cabinet in the lumber room of his memory, seeking for things to get rid of by holy confession ere the hour of proclamation should arrive. He was finding little get beyond boyish escapades, and faults and sins which he had abjured ages ago and almost forgotten. His great sin, of which he had already repented, and was studying more and more to repent, that of undertaking holy service for the sake of the loaves and the fishes, then, in natural sequence, only taking the loaves and the fishes, and doing no service in return, did not come under the name of hypocrisy, being indeed a crime patent to the universe, even when hidden from himself. When at length the heavy lids of his honest, sleepy-eyed nature arose, and he saw the truth of his condition, his dull, sturdy soul had gathered itself like an old wrestler to the struggle, and hardly knew what was required of it, or what it had to overthrow, till it stood panting over its adversary. Juliet also was occupied, with no such search as the rector's, hardly even with what could be called thought, but with something that must either soon cause the keenest thought, or at length the spiritual callosity. Somewhere in her was a motion, a something turned and twisted, ceased and began again, boring like an auger, or was it a creature that tried to sleep, but ever and anon started awake, and with fretful claws pulled at its nest in the fibers of her heart? The curate and his wife talked softly all the way back to the house. Do you really think, said Helen, that every fault one has ever committed will one day be trumpeted out to the universe? That were hardly worth the while of the universe, answered her husband. Such an age-long howling of evil stupidities would be enough to turn its brain with ennui and disgust. Nevertheless, the hypocrite will certainly know himself discovered and shamed, and unable any longer to hide himself from his neighbor. His past deeds also will be made plain to all who, for further ends of rectification, require to know them. Shame will then, I trust, be the first approach of his redemption. Juliet, for she was close behind them, heard his words and shuddered. "'You are feeling it cold, Mrs. Faber,' said the rector, and with the fatherly familiarity of an old man, drew her cloak better around her. "'It is not cold,' she faltered, "'but somehow the night air almost makes me shiver.' The rector pulled a muffler from his coat pocket and laid it like a scarf on her shoulders. "'How kind you are,' she murmured. "'I don't deserve it.' "'Who deserves anything?' said the rector. "'I less, I am sure, than any one I know. "'Only if you'll believe my curate, you have but to ask and have what you need.' "'I wasn't the first to say that, sir,' Wingfold struck in, turning his head over his shoulder. "'I know that, my boy,' answered Mr. Bevis, "'but you were the first to make me want to find it true. "'I say, Mrs. Faber, what if it should turn out after all "'that there was a grand treasure hid in your field and mine "'that we never got the good of because we didn't believe it was there and dig for it?' 
What if this scatterbrained curate of mine should be right when he talks so strangely about our living in the midst of calling voices, cleansing fires, baptizing dews, and won't hearken, won't be clean, won't give up our sleep and our dreams for the very bliss for which we cry out in them? The old man had stopped, taken off his hat, and turned toward her. He spoke with such a strange solemnity of voice that it could hardly have been believed his by those who knew him as a judge of horses, and not as a reader of prayers. The other pair had stopped also. I should call it very hard, returned Juliet, to come so near it and yet miss it. Especially to be driven so near it against one's will, and yet succeed in getting past without touching it, said the curate, with a flavor of asperity. His wife gently pinched his arm, and he was ashamed. When they reached home, Juliet went straight to bed, or at least to her room for the night. I say, Wingfold, remarked the rector, as they sat alone after supper, that sermon of yours was above your congregation. I am afraid you are right, sir. I am sorry, but if you had seen their faces as I did, perhaps you would have modified the conclusion. I am very glad I heard it, though, said the rector. They had more talk, and when Wingfold went upstairs, he found Helen asleep. Annoyed with himself for having spoken harshly to Mrs. Faber, and more than usually harassed by a sense of failure in his sermon, he threw himself into a chair, and sat brooding and praying till the light began to appear. Out of the reeds shaken all night in the wind, rose with the morning this bird. The smoke. Lord, I have laid my heart upon the altar, but cannot get the wood to burn. It hardly flares ere it begins to falter, and to the dark return. Old sap, or night fallen dew, has damped the fuel. In vain my breath would flame provoke. Yet see, at every poor attempt's renewal to thee ascends the smoke. Tis all I have, smoke, failure, foiled endeavor, coldness and doubt and palsied lack. Such as I have, I send thee, perfect giver, send thou thy lightning back. In the morning, as soon as breakfast was over, Helen's ponies were brought to the door. She and Juliet got into the carriage. Wingfold jumped up behind, and they returned to Glaston. Little was said on the way, and Juliet seemed strangely depressed. They left her at her own door. What did that look mean? said Wingfold to his wife, the moment they were round the corner of Mr. Drew's shop. You saw it, then? returned Helen. I did not think you had been so quick. I saw what I could not help taking for relief, said the curate when the maid told her that her husband was not at home. They said no more till they reached the rectory, where Helen followed her husband to his study. "'He can't have turned tyrant already,' she said, resuming the subject of Juliet's look. "'But she's afraid of him.' "'It did look like it,' rejoined her husband. "'Oh, Helen, what a hideous thing fear of her husband must be for a woman, who has to spend not her days only in his presence, but her nights by his side. I do wonder so many women dare to be married. They would need all to have clean consciences.' "'Or no end of faith in their husbands,' said Helen. "'If ever I come to be afraid of you, it will be because I have done something very wrong indeed.' "'Don't be too sure of that, Helen,' returned Wingfold. "'There are very decent husbands, as husbands go, who are yet unjust, exacting, selfish. "'The most devoted of wives are sometimes afraid of the men they get considered the very models of husbands. "'It is a brutal shame that woman should feel afraid, or even uneasy, instead of safe, beside her husband.' "'You are always on the side of the woman, Thomas,' said his wife. "'and I love you for it somehow. I can't tell why.' "'You made a mistake to begin with, my dear. "'You don't love me because I am on the side of the woman, "'but because I am on the side of the wronged. "'If the man happened to be the injured party, "'and I took the side of the woman, "'you would be down on me like an avalanche.' "'I dare say, but there is something more in it. "'I don't think I am altogether mistaken. "'You don't talk like most men. "'They have such an ugly way of asserting superiority "'and sneering at women. "'That you never do. "'And as a woman I am grateful for it. The same afternoon Dorothy Drake paid a visit to Mrs. Faber, and was hardly seated before the feeling that something was wrong arose in her. Plainly Juliet was suffering, from some cause she wished to conceal. Several times she seemed to turn faint, hurriedly fanned herself, and drew a deep breath. Once she rose hastily and went to the window, as if struggling with some oppression, and returned looking very pale. Dorothy was frightened. "'What is the matter, dear?' she said. "'Nothing,' answered Juliet, trying to smile. Perhaps I took a little cold last night, she added with a shiver. Have you told your husband? asked Dorothy. I haven't seen him since Saturday, she answered quietly, but a pallor almost deathly overspread her face. I hope he will soon be home, said Dorothy. Mind you tell him how you feel the instant he comes in. Juliet answered with a smile, but that smile Dorothy never forgot. It haunted her all the way home. When she entered her chamber, her eyes fell upon the petal of a monthly rose, 
which had dropped from the little tree in her window, and lay streaked and crumpled on the black earth of the flower-pot. By one of those queer mental vagaries in which the imagination and the logical faculty seem to combine to make sport of the reason, how is it that that smile has got here before me? she said to herself. She sat down and thought. Could it be that Juliet had, like herself, begun to find there could be no peace without the knowledge of an absolute peace? If it were so, and she would but let her know it, then, sisters at least in sorrow and search, they would together seek the father of their spirits. If haply they might find him, together they would cry to him, and often it might be he would hear them, and reveal himself. Her heart was sore all day, thinking of that sad face. Juliet, whether she knew it or not, was, like herself, in trouble because she had no god. The conclusion shows that Dorothy was far from hopeless. That she could believe the lack of a god was the cause unknown to herself of her friend's depression implies an assurance of the human need of a god, and hope that there might be one to be found. For herself, if she could but find him, she felt there would be nothing but bliss evermore. Dorothy, then, was more hopeful than she herself knew. I doubt if absolute hopelessness is ever born save at the word, Depart from me. Hope springs within us from God himself, and however down-beaten, however sick and nigh unto death, will evermore lift its head and rise again. She could say nothing to her father. She loved him, oh, how dearly, and trusted him, where she could trust him at all, oh, how perfectly, but she had no confidence in his understanding of herself. The main cause whence arose his insufficiency and her lack of trust was that all the faith in God was as yet scarcely more independent of thought-forms, word-shapes, dogma, and creed than that of the Catholic or Calvinist. How few are there whose faith is simple and mighty in the Father of Jesus Christ, waiting to believe all that he will reveal to them. How many of those who talk of faith as the one needful thing will accept as sufficient to the raising of the walls of partition between you and them your heartiest declaration that you believe in him with the whole might of your nature, lay your soul bare to the revelation of his spirit, and stir up your will to obey him? And then comes your temptation, to exclude, namely, from your love and sympathy the weak and boisterous brethren who, after the fashion possible to them, believe in your Lord, because they exclude you, and put as little confidence in your truth as in your insight. If you do know more of Christ than they, upon you lies the heavier obligation to be true to them, as was St. Paul to the Judaizing Christians, whom they so much resemble, who were his chief hindrance in the work his master had given him to do. In Christ we must forget Paul and Apollos and Cephas, Pope and Bishop and Pastor and Presbyter, Creed and Interpretation and Theory. Careless of their opinions, we must be careful of themselves, careful that we have salt in ourselves, and that the salt lose not its savor, that the old man, dead through Christ, shall not, vampire-like, creep from his grave and suck the blood of the saints, by whatever name they be called, or however little they may yet have entered into the freedom of the gospel that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. How was Dorothy to get nearer to Juliet, find out her trouble, and comfort her? Alas, she said to herself, what a thing is marriage in separating friends. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 32 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jeff Blanchard. Paul Faber, Surgeon, by George MacDonald. The Old House at Glaston. The same evening, Dorothy and her father walked to the old house. Already the place looked much changed. The very day the deeds were signed, Mr. Drake, who was not the man to postpone action a moment after the time, for it was come, had set men at work upon the substantial repairs. The house was originally so well built that these were not so heavy as might have been expected. And when completed, they made little show of change. The garden, however, looked quite another thing, for it had lifted itself up from the wilderness in which it was suffocated, reviving like a repellent soul reborn, under its owner's keen watch. Its ancient plan had been rigidly regarded, its ancient features carefully retained. The old bushes were well trimmed, but as yet nothing live except weeds, had been uprooted. The hedges and borders of yew and holly and box, tall and broad, looked very bare and broken and patchy, but now that the shears had, 
after so long a season of neglect, removed the gathered shade. The naked stems and branches would again send out the young shoots of the spring. A new birth would begin everywhere, and the old garden would dawn anew. For all his lack of sympathy with the older forms of religious economy in the country, a thing, alas, too easy to account for, the minister yet loved the past and felt its mystery. He said once in a sermon, and it gave offence to more than one of his deacons, for they scented in its germanism the love of the past, the desire of the future, and the enjoyment of the present. Make an eternity, in which time is absorbed, its lapse lapses, and man partakes of the immortality of his maker. In each present personal being, we have the whole past of our generation enclosed, to be redeveloped with endless difference in each individuality. Hence, perhaps, it comes that, every now and then, into our consciousness, float strange odours of feeling, strange tones as of bygone affections, strange glimmers as of forgotten truths, strange mental sensations of indescribable sort and texture. Friends, I should be a terror to myself. Did I not believe that whenever my dim consciousness may come to itself, God is there? Dorothy would have hastened the lighter repairs inside the house as well, so as to get into it as soon as possible. But her father very wisely argued that it would be a pity to get the house in good condition, and then, as soon as they went into it, and began to find how it could be altered, better to suit their tastes and necessities, have to destroy a great part of what had just been done. His plan, therefore, was to leave the house for the winter, now it was weather tight, and with the first of the summer partly occupy it as it was, find out its faults and capabilities, and have it gradually repaired and altered to their minds and requirements. There would in this way be plenty of time to talk about everything, even to the merest suggestion of fancy, and discover what they would really like. But ever since the place had been theirs, Dorothy had been in the habit of going almost daily to the house, with her book and her work, sitting now in this, now in that empty room, undisturbed by the noises of the workmen, chiefly outside. The foreman was a member of her father's church, a devout man, and she knew every one of his people. She had taken a strange fancy to those empty rooms. Perhaps she felt them like her own heart, waiting for something to come and fill them with life. Nor was there anything to prevent her, though the work was over for a time, from indulging herself in going there still, as often as she pleased. And she would remain there for hours, sometimes nearly the whole day. In her present condition of mind and heart, she desired and needed solitude. She was one of those who, when troubled, rushed from their fellows, and, urged by the human instinct after the divine, seek refuge in loneliness, the cave on Horeb, the top of Mount Sinai, the closet with shut door, any lonely place where, unseen, and dreading no eye, the heart may call aloud to the God hidden behind the veil of the things that do appear. How different Yet how fit to merge in a mutual sympathy with the thoughts of the two as they wandered about the place that evening. Dorothy was thinking her commonest thought, how happy she could be if only she knew there was a will central to the universe, willing all that came to her, good or seeming bad, a will whom she might love and thank for all things. He would be to her no god, whom she could thank only when he sent her what was pleasant. She must be able to thank him for everything, or she could thank him for nothing. Her father was saying to himself he could not have believed the lifting from his soul of such a gravestone of debt 
would have made so little difference to his happiness. He fancied honest Jones, the butcher, had more mere pleasure from the silver snuff-box he had given him than he had himself from his fortune. Relieved he certainly was, but the relief was not happiness. His debt had been the stone that blocked up the gate of paradise. The stone was rolled away, but the gate was not therefore open. He seemed for the first time beginning to understand what he had so often said, and in public too, and had thought he understood that God himself, and not any or all of his gifts, is the life of a man. He had got rid of the dread imagination that God had given him the money in anger, as he had given the Israelites the quails, nor did he find that the possession formed any barrier between him and God. His danger now seemed that of forgetting the love of the giver in his anxiety to spend the gift according to his will. You and I ought to be very happy, my love, he said, as now they walked home. He had often said so before, and Dorothy had held her peace, but now, with her eyes on the ground, she rejoined in a low, rather broken voice. Why, Papa? Because we are lifted above the anxiety that was crushing us into the very mud, he answered, with surprise at her question. It never troubled me so much as all that, she answered. It is a great relief to see you free from it, father, but otherwise I cannot say that it has made much difference to me. My dear Dorothy, said the minister, it is time we should understand each other. Your state of mind has for a long time troubled me. But while debt lay so heavy upon me, I could give my attention to nothing else. Why should there be anything but perfect confidence between a father and daughter, who belong to each other, alone in all the world? Tell me what it is that so plainly oppresses you. What prevents you from opening your heart to me? You cannot doubt my love. Never for one moment, father, she answered, almost eagerly, pressing to her heart the arm on which she leaned. I know I am safe with you because I am yours, and yet somehow I cannot get so close to you as I would. Something comes between us and prevents me. What is it, my child? I will do all and everything I can to remove it. You, dear father, I don't believe ever child had such a father. Oh, yes, my dear, many have had better fathers, but none better than I hope one day, by the grace of God, to be to you. I am a poor creature, Dorothy, but I love you as my own soul. You are the blessing of my days, and my thoughts brood over you in the night. It would be in utter content if I only saw you happy. If your face were acquainted with smiles, my heart would be acquainted with gladness. For a time neither said anything more. The silent tears were streaming from Dorothy's eyes. At length she spoke. I wonder if I could tell you what it is without hurting you, father, she said. I can hear anything from you, my child, he answered. Then I will try, but I do not think I shall ever quite know my father on earth, or be quite able to open my heart to him, until I have found my father in heaven. Ah, my child, is it so with you? Do you fear you have not yet given yourself to the Saviour? Give yourself now. His arms are ever open to receive you. That is hardly the point, father. Will you let me ask you any question, I please? Assuredly, my child. He always spoke, though quite unconsciously, with a little of the ex-cathedral tone. Then tell me, father, are you just as sure of God as you are of me standing here before you? She had stopped and turned, and stood looking him full in the face with wide, troubled eyes. Mr. Drake was silent. 
hateful is the professional, contemptible is the love of display. But in his case, they floated only as vapors in the air of a genuine soul. He was a true man, and as he could not say yes, neither would he hide his no in a multitude of words, at least to his own daughter. He was not so sure of God as he was of that daughter, with those eyes looking straight into his. Could it be that he never had believed in God at all? The thought went through him with a great pang. It was as if the moon grew dark above him, and the earth withered under his feet. He stood before his child like one whose hypocrisy had been proclaimed from the housetop. Are you vexed with me, father? said Dorothy sadly. No, my child, answered the minister, in a voice of unnatural composure. But you stand before me there like the very thought started out of my soul, alive and visible, to question its own origin. Ah, father, cried Dorothy, let us question our origin. The minister never even heard the words. That very doubt embodied there in my child has, I now know, been haunting me, dodging me behind, ever since I began to teach others, he said, as if talking in his sleep. Now it looks me in the face. Am I myself to be a castaway? Dorothy, I am not sure of God, not as I am sure of you, my darling. He stood silent. His ear expected a low-voiced, sorrowful reply. He started at the tone of gladness in which Dorothy cried. Then, father, there is henceforth no cloud between us, for we are in the same cloud together. It does not divide us. It only brings us closer to each other. Help me, father. I am trying hard to find God. At the same time, I confess I would rather not find him than find him such as I have sometimes heard you represent him. It may well be, returned her father, the ex-cathedral, the professional tone had vanished utterly for the time, and he spoke with the voice of an humble, true man. It may well be that I have done him wrong, for since now at my age I am compelled to allow that I am not sure of him, what more likely than that I may have been cherishing wrong ideas concerning him, and so not looking in the right direction for finding him? Where did you get your notations of God, Father? Those, I mean, that you took with you to the pulpit? A year ago, even, if he had been asked the same question, he would at once have answered, From the word of God. But now he hesitated and minutes passed before he began a reply, for he saw now that it was not from the Bible he had gathered them, whence soever they had come at first. He pondered and searched, and found that the real answer eluded him, hiding itself in a time beyond his earliest memory. It seemed plain, therefore, that the source whence first he began to draw those notations, right or wrong, must be the talk and behaviour of the house in which he was born, the words and carriage of his father and mother and their friends. Next source to that came the sermons he heard on Sundays, and the books given him to read. The Bible was one of those books, but from the first he read it through the notations with which his mind was already vaguely filled, and with the comments of the superiors around him. Then followed the books recommended at college, this author and that, and the lectures he had thereupon, the attributes of God and the plan of salvation, the spirit of commerce in the midst of which he had been bred, did not occur to him as one of those sources. But he had perceived enough. He opened his mouth and bravely answered her question as well as he could. Not giving the Bible as the source from which he had taken any one of the notions of God he had been in the habit of presenting. But mind, he added, 
I do not allow that therefore my ideas must be incorrect. If they be second-hand, they may yet be true. I do admit that where they have continued only second-hand, they can have been of little value to me. What you allow, then, father, said Dorothy, is that you have yourself taken none of your ideas direct from the fountain head? I am afraid I must confess it, my child, with this modification, that I have thought many of them over a good deal, and altered some of them not a little, to make them fit the moulds of truth in my mind. I am so glad, father, said Dorothy. I was positively certain, from what I knew of you, which is more than any one else in this world, I do believe that some of the things you said concerning God never could have risen in your own mind. They might be in the Bible for all that, said the minister, very anxious to be and speak the right thing. A man's heart is not the trusted for correct notions of God, nor yet for the correct interpretation of the Bible, I should think, said Dorothy. True, my child, answered her father with a sigh, except as it be already a godlike heart. The Lord says a bramble bush cannot bring forth grapes. The notions you gathered of God from other people must have come out of their hearts, Father. Out of somebody's heart? Just so, answered Dorothy. Go on, my child, said her father. Let me understand clearly your drift. I have heard Mr. Wingfold say, returned Dorothy, that however men may have been driven to form their ideas of God before Christ came, no man can, with thorough honesty, take the name of a Christian whose ideas of the father of men are gathered from any other field than the life, thought, words, deeds of the only son of that father. He says it is not from the Bible as a book, that we are to draw our ideas of God, but from the living men into whose presence that book brings us, who is alive now, and gives his spirit that they who read about him may understand what kind of being he is, and why he did as he did, and know him in some possible measure as he knows himself. I can only repeat the lesson like a child. I suspect, returned the minister, that I have been greatly astray. But after this, we will seek our father together in our brother Jesus Christ. It was the initiation of a daily lesson together in the New Testament, which, while it drew their hearts closer to each other, drew them with growing delight nearer and nearer to the idea of humanity. Jesus Christ, in whom shines the glory of its Father. A man may look another in the face for a hundred years and not know him. Men have looked Jesus Christ in the face and not known either him or his Father. It was needful that he should appear to begin the knowing of him. But speedily was his visible presence taken away that it might not become, as assuredly it would have become, a veil to hide from men the father of their spirits. Do you long for the assurance of some sensible sign? Do you ask why no intellectual proof is to be had? I tell you that such would but delay, perhaps altogether impair for you. That better, that best, that only vision, into which at last your world must blossom such a contact, namely, with the heart of God himself, such a perception of his being and his absolute oneness with you, the child of his thought, the individuality softly parted from his spirit, yet living still and only by his presence and love, as, by its own radiance, will sweep doubt away forever. Being then in the light and knowing it, the lack of intellectual proof concerning that which is too high for it, 
will trouble you no more than would your inability to silence a metaphysician who declared that you had no real existence. It is for the sake of such vision as God would give that you are denied such vision as you would have. The Father of our spirits is not content that we should know him as we know each other. There is a better, closer, nearer than any human way of knowing. And to that he is guiding us across all the swamps of our unteachableness, the seas of our faithlessness, the desert of our ignorance. It is so very hard that we should have to wait for that which we cannot yet receive? Shall we complain of the shadows cast upon our souls by the hand and the napkin polishing their mirrors to the receiving of the more excellent glory? Have patience, children of the Father. Pray always and do not faint. The mists and the storms and cold will pass. The sun and the sky are forevermore. There were no volcanoes and no typhoons, but for the warm heart of the air, the soft garment of the air, and the lordly sun over all. The most loving of you cannot imagine how one day the love of the Father will make you love even your own. Much truthful talk passed between father and daughter as they walked home. They were now nearer to each other than ever in their lives before. You don't mind me coming out here alone, Papa, said Dorothy, as, after a little chat with the gatekeeper, they left the park. I have of late found it so good to be alone. I think I am beginning to learn to think. Doing everything just as you please, my child, said her father. I can have no objection to what you see good. Only don't be so late as to make me anxious. I like coming early, said Dorothy. These lovely mornings make me feel as if the struggles of life were over, and only a quiet old age were left. The father looked anxiously at his daughter. Was she going to leave him? It smote him to the heart that he had done so little to make her life a blessed one. How hard no small portion of it had been! How worn and pale she looked! Why did she not show fresh and bright like other young women? Mrs. Faber, for instance. He had not guided her steps into the way of peace. At all events, he had not led her home to the house of wisdom and rest. Two good reasons why he had not himself yet found that home. Henceforth, for her sake as well as his own, he would besiege the heavenly grace with prayer. The opening of his heart in confessional response to his daughter proved one of those fresh starts in the spiritual life, of which a man needs so many as he climbs to the heavenly gates. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 33 of Paul Faber, Surgeon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron James Walker Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald Paul Faber's Dressing Room Faber did not reach home till a few minutes before the dinner hour. He rode into the stable yard, entered the house by the surgery, and went straight to his dressing room, for the roads were villainous, and Ruber's large feet had made a wonderful sight of his master, who respected his wife's carpet. At the same time he hoped, as it was so near dinner time, to find her in her chamber. She had, however, already made her toilet, and was waiting his return in the drawing room. Her heart made a false motion and stung her when she heard his steps pass the door and go upstairs, for generally he came to greet her the moment he entered the house. Had he seen anybody? 
Had he heard anything? It was ten dreadful minutes before he came down, but he entered cheerily, with the gathered warmth of two days of pent-up affection. She did her best to meet him as if nothing had happened, for indeed what had happened, except her going to church? If nothing had taken place since she saw him, since she knew him, why such perturbation? Was marriage a slavery of the very soul, in which a wife was bound to confess everything to her husband, even to her most secret thoughts and feelings? Or was a husband lord not only over the present and future of his wife, but over her past also? Was she bound to disclose everything that lay in that past? If Paul made no claim upon her beyond the grave, could he claim back upon the dead past before he knew her, a period over which she had now no more control than over that when she would be but a portion of the material all? But whatever might be Paul's theories of marriage or claims upon his wife, it was enough for her miserable unrest that she was what is called a living soul, with a history, and what has come to be called a conscience, a something that is, as most people regard it, which has the power and uses it of making uncomfortable. The existence of such questions, as I have indicated, reveals that already between her and him there showed space, separation, non-contact. Juliet was too bewildered with misery to tell whether it was a cleft of a hair's breadth or a gulf across which no cry could reach. This moment it seemed the one, the next the other. The knowledge which caused it had troubled her while he saw her love, had troubled her on to the very eve of her surrender. The deeper her love grew, the more fiercely she wrestled with the evil fact. A low moral development in the purest resolve of an honest nature afforded her many pleas, and at length she believed she had finally put it down. She had argued that, from the opinions themselves of Faber, the thing could not consistently fail to be as no thing to him. Even were she mistaken in this conclusion, it would be to wrong his large nature, his generous love, his unselfish regard, his tender pitifulness, to fail of putting her silent trust in him. Besides, had she not read in the newspapers the utterance of a certain worshipful judge on the bench that no man had anything to do with his wife's antinuptial history? The contract, then, was certainly not retrospective. What in her remained unsatisfied after all her arguments, reasons, and appeals to common sense and consequences? She strove to strangle and thought, hoped, she had succeeded. She willed her will, made up her mind, yielded to Paul's solicitations, and put the whole painful thing away from her. The step taken, the marriage over, nothing could any more affect either fact. Only, unfortunately for the satisfaction and repose she had desired and expected, her love to her husband had gone on growing after they were married. True, she sometimes fancied it otherwise, but while the petals of the rose were falling, its capsule was filling and notwithstanding the opposite tendency of the deoxygenated atmosphere in which their thoughts moved, she had begun already to long after an absolute union with him. But this growth of her love and aspiration after its perfection, although at first they covered what was gone by with a deepening mist of apparent oblivion, were all the time bringing it closer to her consciousness, out of the far into the near. And now suddenly that shape she knew of, lying in the bottom of the darkest pool of the stagnant past, had been stung into life by a wind of words that swept through Nestle Chapel, had stretched up a hideous neck and threatening head from the deep, and was staring at her with sodden eyes. Henceforth she knew that the hideous fact had its appointed place between her and her beautiful Paul, the demon of the gulfy cleft that parted them. The moment she spoke in reply to his greeting, her husband also felt something dividing them, but had no presentiment of its being anything of import. You are overtired, my love, he said, and taking her hand felt her pulse. It was feeble and frequent. What have they been doing to you, my darling? he asked. Those little demons of ponies running away again? No, she answered, scarce audibly. Something has gone wrong with you, he persisted. Have you caught cold? None of the old symptoms, I hope? None, Paul. There is nothing the matter, she answered, laying her head lightly, as if afraid of the liberty she took upon his shoulder. His arm went around her waist. What is it then, my wife? he said tenderly. Which would you rather have, Paul, 
have me die or do something wicked. Juliet, this will never do, he returned quietly but almost severely. You have been again giving the reins to a morbid imagination. Weakness and folly only can come of that. It is nothing better than hysteria. No, but tell me, dear Paul, she persisted pleadingly. Answer my question. Do, please. There is no such question to be answered, he returned. You are not going to die, and I am yet more certain you are not going to do anything wicked. Are you now? No, Paul. Indeed I am not. But— I have it, he exclaimed. You went to church at Nestle last night. Confound them all with their humbug. You have been letting their infernal nonsense get a hold of you again. It has quite upset you. That and going much too long without your dinner. What can be keeping it? He left her hurriedly and rang the bell. You must speak to the cook, my love. She is getting out of the good habits I had so much trouble to teach her. But no, no! You shall not be troubled with my servants. I will speak to her myself. After dinner, I will read you some of my favorite passages in Montaigne. No, you shall read to me. Your French is so much better than mine. Dinner was announced and nothing more was said. Paul ate well, Juliet scarcely at all, but she managed to hide from him the offense. They rose together and returned to the drawing room. The moment Faber shut the door, Juliet turned in the middle of the room, and as he came up to her said, in a voice much unlike her own, Paul, if I were to do anything very bad, as bad as could be, would you forgive me? Come, my love expostulated Faber, speaking more gently than before, for he had had his dinner. Surely you are not going to spoil our evening with any more such nonsense. Answer me, Paul, or I shall think you do not love me, she said, and the tone of her entreaty verged upon demand. Would you forgive me if I had done something very bad? Of course I should he answered with almost irritated haste. That is, if I could ever bring myself to allow anything you did was wrong. Only, you would witch me out of opinion and judgment and everything else with two words from your dear lips. Should I, Paul? She said, and lifting her face from his shoulder, she looked up in his from the depths of two dark fountains full of tears. Never does the soul so nearly identify itself with matter as when revealing itself through the eyes. Never does matter so nearly lose itself in spiritual absorption as when two eyes like Juliet's are possessed and glorified by the rush of the soul through their portals. Faber kissed eyes and lips and neck in a glow of delight. She was the vision of a most blessed dream, and she was his, all and altogether his. He never thought then how his own uncreed and the prayer book were of the same mind that death would one day part them. There is in that every high and simple feeling that stamps it with eternity. For my own part, I believe that, if life has not long before twinned any twain, death can do nothing to divide them. The nature of each and every pure feeling, even in the man who may sin away the very memory of it, is immortal. And who knows from under what a depth of ashes the love of the saving God may yet revive it. The next moment the doctor was summoned. When he returned, Juliet was in bed and pretended to be asleep. In the morning she appeared at the breakfast table so pale, so worn, so troubled, that her husband was quite anxious about her. All she would confess to was that she had not slept well and had a headache. Attributing her condition to a nervous attack, he gave her some medicine took her to the drawing-room and prescribed the new piano, which he had already found the best of all sedatives for her. She loathed the very thought of it, could no more have touched it than if the ivory keys had been white hot steel. She watched him from the window while he mounted his horse, but the moment the last red gleam of rubber vanished, she flung her arms above her head and with a stifled cry threw herself on a couch, stuffed her handkerchief into her mouth, and in a fierce dumb agony tore it to shreds with hands and teeth. Presently she rose, opened the door almost furtively, and stole softly down the stair, looking this way and that, like one intent on some evil deed. At the bottom she pushed a green baize-covered door, 
peeped into a passage, then crept on tiptoe toward the surgery. Arrived there, she darted to a spot she knew and stretched a trembling hand toward a bottle full of dark-colored liquid. As instantly she drew it back and stood listening with bated breath and terrified look, it was a footstep approaching the outer door of the surgery. She turned and fled from it, still noiseless, and never stopped till she was in her own room. There she shut and locked the door, fell on her knees by the bedside, and pressed her face into the coverlid. She had no thought of praying. She wanted to hide, only to hide. Neither was it from old habit she fell upon her knees, for she had never been given to kneeling. I cannot but think, nevertheless, that there was a dumb germ of prayer at the heart of the action, that falling upon her knees in that hiding of her face. The same moment something took place within her to which she could have given no name, which she could have represented in no words, a something which came she knew not whence, which she knew not what, and went she knew not whither, of which indeed she would never have become aware except for what followed, but which yet so wrought that she rose from her knees saying to herself, with clenched teeth and burning eyes, I will tell him. As if she had known the moment of her death near, she began mechanically to set everything in order in the room, and as she came to herself she was saying, Let him kill me. I wish he would. I am quite willing to die by his hand. He will be kind and do it gently. He knows so many ways. It was a terrible day. She did not go out of her room again. Her mood changed a hundred times. Resolved to confess alternated with wild mockery and laughter, but still returned. She would struggle to persuade herself that her whole condition was one of foolish exaggeration, of senseless excitement about nothing, the merest delirium of feminine fastidiousness, and the next instant would turn cold with horror at a fresh glimpse of the mere fact. What could the wretched matter be to him now, or to her? Who was the worse, or had ever been the worse but herself? And what did it amount to? What claim had anyone? What claim could even a god, if such a being there were? have upon the past which had gone from her, was no more in any possible sense within her reach than if it had never been. Was it not as if it had never been? Was the woman to be hurled, to hurl herself into misery for the fault of the girl? It was all nonsense, a trifle at worst, a disagreeable trifle, no doubt, but still a trifle. Only would to God she had died rather, even although then she would never have known Paul. Tut! She would never have thought of it again but for that horrid woman that lived over the draper's shop. All would have been well if she had but kept from thinking about it. Nobody would have been a hair the worse then. But poor Paul, to be married to such a woman as she! If she were to be so foolish as let him know, how would it strike Paul? What would he think of it? Ought she not to be sure of that before she committed herself, before she uttered the irrevocable words? Would he call it a trifle, or would he be ready to kill her? True, he had no right. He could have no right to know. But how horrible that there should be any thought of right between them. Still worse, anything whatever between them, that he had no right to know. Worst of all, that she did not belong to him so utterly that he must have a right to know everything about her. She would tell him all. She would. She would. She had no choice. She must. But she need not tell him now. She was not strong enough to utter the necessary words, but that made the thing very dreadful. If she could not speak the words, how bad it must really be. Impossible to tell her Paul. That was pure absurdity. Ah, but she could not. She would be certain to faint, or fall dead at his feet. That would be well. Yes, that would do. She would take a wine glass full of laudanum just before she told him. Then, if he was kind, she would confess the opium and he could save her if he pleased. If he was hard, she would say nothing and die at his feet. She had hoped to die in his arms, all that was left of eternity, but her life was his. He had saved it with his own. Oh, horror, that it should have been to disgrace him, and it should not last a moment longer than it was a pleasure to him. Worn out with thought and agony, she often fell asleep, only to start awake in fresh misery and go over and over the same torturing round Long before her husband appeared, she was in a burning fever. When he came, he put her at once to bed and tended her with a solicitude as anxious as it was gentle. He soothed her to sleep and then went and had some dinner. On his return, finding, as he had expected, that she still slept, 
he sat down by her bedside and watched. Her slumber was broken with now and then a deep sigh, now and then a moan. Alas, that we should do the things that make for moan. But at least I understand why we are left to do them. It is because we can. A dull fire was burning in her soul, and over it stood the cauldron of her history, and it bubbled in sighs and moans. Faber was ready enough to attribute everything human to a physical origin, but as he sat there pondering her condition, recalling her emotion and strange speech of the night before, and watching the state she was now in, an uneasiness began to gather, undefined, but other than concerned her health. Something must be wrong somewhere. He kept constantly assuring himself that at worst it could be but some mere mole heap, of which her love lily sensitive organization, under the influence of a foolish preachment, made a mountain. Still it was a huge disorder to come from a trifle. At the same time, who knew better than he upon what a merest trifle nervous excitement will fix the attention, or how to the mental eye such a speck will grow and grow until it absorb the universe? Only a certain other disquieting thought, having come once, would keep returning, that, thoroughly as he believed himself acquainted with her mind, he had very little knowledge of her history. He did not know a single friend of hers, had never met a person who knew anything of her family, or had even an acquaintance with her earlier than his own. The thing he most dreaded was that the shadow of some old affection had returned upon her soul, and that, in her excessive delicacy, she heaped blame upon herself that she had not absolutely forgotten it. He flung from him in scorn every slightest suggestion of blame. His Juliet, his glorious Juliet. Bah! But he must get her to say what the matter was. For her own sake, he must help her to reveal her trouble, whatever it might be. Else how was he to do his best to remove it? She should find he knew how to be generous. Thus thinking, he sat patient by her side, watching until the sun of her consciousness should rise and scatter the clouds of sleep. Hour after hour he sat, and still she slept, outwearied with the rack of emotion. Morning had begun to peer gray through the window curtains when she woke with a cry. She had been dreaming. In the little chapel in Nestle Park, she sat listening to the curate's denouncement of hypocrisy, when suddenly the scene changed. The pulpit had grown to a mighty cloud, upon which stood an archangel with a trumpet in his hand. He cried that the hour of the great doom had come for all who bore within them the knowledge of any evil thing neither bemoaned before God nor confessed to man. Then he lifted the great silver trumpet with a gleam to his lips, and every fiber of her flesh quivered in expectation of the tearing blast that was to follow, when instead, soft as a breath of spring from a bank of primroses, came the words, uttered in the gentlest of sorrowful voices, and the voice seemed that of her unbelieving Paul, I will arise and go to my father. It was no wonder, therefore, that she woke with a cry. It was one of indescribable emotion. When she saw his face bending over her in anxious love, she threw her arms round his neck, burst into a storm of weeping, and sobbed. Oh, Paul, husband, forgive me. I have sinned against you terribly, the worst sin a woman can commit. Oh, Paul, Paul, make me clean, or I am lost. Juliet, you are raving, he said, bewildered a little angry, and at her condition not a little alarmed. For the confession it was preposterous. They had not been many weeks married. Calm yourself, or you will give me a lunatic for a wife, he said. Then changing his tone, for his heart rebuked him, when he saw the ashy despair that spread over her face and eyes. Be still, my precious, he went on. All is well. You have been dreaming, and are not yet quite awake. It is the morphia you had last night. Don't look so frightened. It is only your husband. No one else is near you. With the tenderest smile, he sought to reassure her, and would have gently released himself from the agonized clasp of her arms about his neck, that he might get her something. But she tightened her hold. Don't leave me, Paul, she cried. I was dreaming, but I am wide awake now, and know only too well what I have done. Dreams are nothing. The will is not in them, he said. But the thought of his sweet wife even dreaming a thing to be repented of in such dismay tore his heart. For he was one of the many, not all of the purest, who cherish an ideal of woman which, although indeed poverty-stricken and crude, is to their minds of snowy favor, to their judgment of loftiest excellence. I trust in God that many a woman, despite the mud of doleful circumstance, yea, even the defilement that comes first from within, 
has risen to a radiance of essential innocence, ineffably beyond that whose form stood white in Faber's imagination. For I see and understand a little how God, giving righteousness, makes pure of sin, and that verily, by no theological quibble of imputation, by no play with words, by no shutting of the eyes, no oblivion, willful or irresistible, but by very fact of cleansing, so that the consciousness of the sinner becomes glistering as the raiment of the Lord on the mount of his transfiguration. I do not expect the Pharisee who calls the sinner evil names and drags her up to judgment to comprehend this. But woman, cry to thy father in heaven, for he can make thee white, even to the contentment of that womanhood which thou hast thyself outraged. Faber unconsciously prided himself on the severity of his requirements of woman, and saw his own image reflected in the polish of his ideal. And now a fear whose presence he would not acknowledge began to gnaw at his heart, a vague suggestion's horrid image, to which he would yield no space to flit about his brain. Would to God it were a dream, Paul, answered the stricken wife. You foolish child, returned the nigh-trembling husband. How can you expect me to believe? Married but yesterday, you have already got tired of me. Tired of you, Paul? I should desire no other eternal paradise than to lie thus under your eyes for ever. Then, for my sake, my darling wife, send away this extravagance, this folly, this absurd fancy that has got such a hold of you. It will turn to something serious if you do not resist it. There can be no truth in it, and I am certain that one with any strength of character can do much at least to prevent the deeper rooting of a fixed idea. But as he spoke thus to her, in his own soul he was as one fighting the demons off with a fan. Tell me what the mighty matter is, he went on, that I may swear to you I love you the more for the worst weakness you have to confess. Ah, oh, my love, returned Juliet, how like you are now to the Paul I have dreamed of so often. But you will not be able to forgive me. I have read somewhere that men never forgive, that their honor is before their wives with them. Paul, if you should not be able to forgive me, you must help me to die, and not be cruel to me. Juliet, I will not listen to any more such foolish words. Either tell me plainly what you mean, that I may convince you what a goose you are, or be quiet and go to sleep again. Can it be that after all it does not signify so much? She said aloud, but only to herself, meditating in the light of a little glow-worm of hope. Oh, if it could be so, and what is it really so much? I have not murdered anybody. I will tell you, Paul. She drew his head closer down, laid her lips to his ear, gave a great gasp, and whispered two or three words. He started up, sundering at once the bonds of her clasped hands, cast one brief stare at her, turned, walked, with a great quick stride to his dressing room, entered and closed the door. As if with one rush of a fell wind, they were ages, deserts, empty star spaces apart. She was outside the universe in the cold frenzy of infinite loneliness. The wolves of despair were howling in her, but Paul was in the next room. There was only the door between them. She sprung from her bed and ran to a closet. The next moment she appeared in her husband's dressing room. Paul sat sunk together in his chair, his head hanging forward, his teeth set, his whole shape in limb and feature, carrying the show of profound, of irrecoverable injury. He started to his feet when she entered. She did not once lift her eyes to his face, but sunk on her knees before him, hurriedly slipped her nightgown from her shoulders to her waist, and over her head, bent toward the floor, held up to him a riding whip. They were baleful stars that looked down on that naked world beneath them. To me, scarce anything is so utterly pathetic as the back. That of an animal even is full of sad suggestion. But the human back, it is the other, the dark side of the human moon. The blind side of the being, defenseless and exposed to everything. The ignorant side, turned toward the abyss of its unknown origin. The unfeatured side, eyeless and dumb and helpless the enduring animal of the marvelous commonwealth, to be given to the smiter and to bend beneath the burden, lovely in its patience and the tender forms of its strength. An evil word, resented by the lowest of our sisters, rushed to the man's lips, but died there in a strangled murmur. Paul, said Juliet in a voice 
from whose tone it seemed as if her soul had sunk away and was crying out of a hollow place of the earth. Take it! Take it! Strike me! He made no reply, stood utterly motionless. His teeth clenched so hard that he could not have spoken without grinding them. She waited as motionless, her face bowed to the floor, the whip held up over her head. Paul, she said again, you saved my life once, save my soul now, whip me and take me again. He answered with only a strange unnatural laugh through his teeth. Whip me and let me die then, she said. He spoke no word. She spoke again. Despair gave her both insight and utterance. Despair and great love, and the truth of God that underlies even despair. You pressed me to marry you, she said. What was I to do? How could I tell you? And I loved you so. I persuaded myself I was safe with you. You were so generous. You would protect me from everything, even my own past. In your name I sent it away, and would not think of it again. I said to myself you would not wish me to tell you the evil that had befallen me. I persuaded myself you loved me enough even for that. I held my peace trust in you. Oh, my husband, my Paul, my heart is crushed. The dreadful thing has come back. I thought it was gone from me, and now it will not leave me any more. I am a horror to myself. There is no one to punish and forgive me but you. Forgive me, my husband. You are the God to whom I pray. If you pardon me, I shall be content even with myself. I shall seek no other pardon. Your favor is all I care for. If you take me for clean, I am clean for all the world. You can make me clean. You only do it, Paul. Do it, husband. Make me clean that I may look women in the face. Do, Paul, take the whip and strike me. I long for my deserts at your hand. Do comfort me. I am waiting the sting of it, Paul, to know that you have forgiven me. If I should cry out, it will be for gladness. Oh, my husband! Here her voice rose to an agony of entreaty. I was but a girl, hardly more than a child in knowledge. I did not know what I was doing. He was much older than I was, and I trusted him. Oh, my God! I hardly know what I knew and what I did not know. It was only when it was too late that I woke and understood. I hate myself. I scorn myself. But am I to be wretched forever because of that one fault, Paul? Will you not be my savior and forgive me my sin? Oh, do not drive me mad. I am only clinging to my reason. Whip me and I shall be well. Take me again, Paul. I will not, if you like, even fancy myself your wife any more. I will be your slave. You shall do with me whatever you will. I will obey you to the very letter. Oh, beat me and let me go. She sunk prone on the floor and clasped and kissed his feet. He took the whip from her hand. Of course a man cannot strike a woman. He may tread her in the mire. He may clasp her and then scorn her. He may kiss her close and then dash her from him into a dung heap. But he must not strike her. That would be unmanly. Oh, grace itself is the rage of the pitiful Othello to the forbearance of many a self-contained, cold-blooded, self-careful slave that thinks himself a gentleman. Had not Faber been even the full of his own precious self, had he yielded to her prayer or to his own wrath, how many hours of agony would have been saved them both? What? Would you have had him really strike her? I would have had him do anything, rather than choose himself and reject his wife. Make of it what you will. Had he struck once, had he seen the purple streak rise in the snow, that instant his pride-frozen heart would have melted into a torrent of grief. He would have flung himself on the floor beside her, and in an agony of pity over her, in horror at his own sacrilege, would have clasped her to his bosom, and baptized her in the tears of remorse and repentance. From that moment they would have been married indeed. When she felt him take the whip, the poor lady's heart gave a great heave of hope. Then her flesh quivered with fear. She closed her teeth hard, to welcome the blow without a cry. Would he give her many stripes? then the last should be welcome as the first. Would it spoil her skin? What matter if it was his own hand that did it? A brief delay, long to her, then the hiss as it seemed of the coming blow. But instead of the pang she awaited, the sharp ring of breaking glass followed. He had thrown the whip through the window into the garden. The same moment he dragged his feet rudely from her embrace and left the room. The devil and the gentleman had conquered. He had spared her, not in love, but in scorn. 
she gave one great cry of utter loss and lay senseless. End of chapter 33This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 34 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron Walker. Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. The bottomless pool. She came to herself in the gray dawn. She was cold as ice, cold to the very heart, but she did not feel the cold. There was nothing in her to compare it against. Her very being was frozen. The man who had given her life had thrown her from him. He cared less for her than for the tortured dog. She was an outcast, defiled and miserable. Alas! Alas! This was what came of speaking the truth, of making confession. The cruel scripture had wrought its own fulfillment, made a mock of her, and ruined her husband's peace. She knew poor Paul would never be himself again. She had carried the snake so long harmless in her bosom only to let it at last creep from her lips into her husband's ear, sting the vital core of her universe, and blast it forever. How foolish she had been! What was left her to do? What would her husband have her to do? Oh, misery! He cared no more what she did or did not do. She was alone, utterly alone, but she need not live. Dimly, vaguely, the vapor of such thoughts as these passed through her despairing soul as she lifted herself from the floor and tottered back to her room. Yet even then, in the very midst of her freezing misery, there was, although she had not yet begun to recognize it, a nascent comfort in that she had spoken and confessed. She would not really have taken back her confession, and although the torture was greater, yet was it more endurable than that she had been suffering before. She had told him who had right to know, but alas, what a deception was that dream of the trumpet and the voice, a poor trick to entrap a helpless sinner. Slowly, with benumbed fingers and trembling hands, she dressed herself, that bed she would lie in no more, for she had wronged her husband. Whether before or after he was her husband mattered nothing. To have ever called him husband was the wrong. She had seemed that she was not, else he would never have loved or saw her. She had outraged his dignity, defiled him. He had cast her off, and she could not, would not blame him. Happily for her endurance of her misery, she did not turn upon her idol and cast him from his pedestal. She did not fix her gaze upon his failure instead of her own. She did not espy the contemptible in his conduct and revolt from her allegiance. But was such a man then altogether the ideal of a woman's soul? Was he a fit champion of humanity who would aid only within the limits of his pride? Who, when a despairing creature cried in soul agony for help, thought first and only of his own honor? The notion men call their honor is the shadow of righteousness, the shape that is where the light is not, the devil that dresses as nearly in angel fashion as he can, but is none the less for that a sneak and a coward. She put on her cloak and bonnet. The house was his, not hers. He and she had never been one. She must go and meet her fate. There was one power, at least, the key to the great door of liberty, which was the weakest as well as the strongest possessed. She could die. Ah, how welcome would death be now? Did he ever know or heed the right time to come without being sent for? Without being compelled? In the meantime, her only anxiety was to get out of the house, away from Paul, she would understand more precisely what she had to do. With the feeling of his angry presence, she could not think. Yet how she loved him! strong in his virtue and indignation. She had not yet begun to pity herself or to allow to her heart that he was hard upon her. She was leaving the room when a glitter on her hand caught her eye, the old diamond disc, which he had bought of her in her trouble and restored to her on her wedding day, was answering the herald of the sunrise. She drew it off. He must have it again. With it she drew off also her wedding ring. Together she laid them on the dressing table, turned again, and with noiseless foot and desert heart went through the house, opened the door, and stole into the street. A thin mist was waiting for her. A lean cat, gray as the mist, stood on the steps of the door opposite. No other living thing was to be seen. The air was chill. The autumn rains were at hand, for her heart was the only desolation. 
Already she knew where she was going. In the street she turned to the left. Shortly before, she had gone with Dorothy for the first time to see the old house, and there had had rather a narrow escape. Walking down the garden, they came to the pond or small lake so well known to the children of Glaston as bottomless. Two stone steps led from the end of the principal walk down to the water, which was, at the time, nearly level with the top of the second. On the upper step, Juliet was standing, not without fear, gazing into the gulf, which was yet far deeper than she imagined, when, without the smallest pre-indication, the lower step suddenly sank. Juliet sprung back to the walk, but turned instantly to look again. She saw the stone sinking, and her eyes opened wider and wider as it swelled and thinned to a great, dull, wavering mass, grew dimmer and dimmer, then melted away and vanished utterly. With stricken look and fright-filled eyes, she turned to Dorothy, who was a little behind her, and said, How will you be able to sleep at night? I should be always fancying myself sliding down into it through the darkness. To this place of terror she was now on the road. When consciousness returned to her, she lay on the floor of her husband's dressing room. It brought with it first the awful pool and the sinking stone. She seemed to stand watching it sink, lazily settling with a swing this way and a sway that, into the bosom of the earth, down and down, still down. Nor did the vision leave her as she came more to herself. Even when her mental eyes were at length quite open to the far more frightful verities of her condition, half of her consciousness was still watching the ever-sinking stone, until at last she seemed to understand that it was showing her a door out of her misery, one easy to open. She went the same way into the park that Dorothy had then taken her, through a little door of privilege which she had shown her how to open, and not by the lodge. The light was growing fast, but the sun was not yet up. With feeble steps but feverish haste she hurried over the grass. Her feet were wet through her thin shoes. Her dress was fringed with dew. But there was no need for taking care of herself now. She felt herself already beyond the reach of sickness. The still pond would soon wash off the dew. Suddenly, with a tremor of waking hope, came the thought that, when she was gone from his sight, the heart of her husband would perhaps turn again toward her a little. For would he not then be avenged? Would not his justice be satisfied? She had been well drilled in the theological lie that punishment is the satisfaction of justice. Oh, now I thank you, Paul she said as she hastened along. You taught me the darkness and made me brave to seek its refuge. Think of me sometimes, Paul. I will come back to you if I can. But no, there is no coming back, no greeting more, no shadows even to mingle their loves, for in dream there is but one that dreams. I shall be the one that does not dream. There is nothing where I am going, not even the darkness, nothing but nothing. Ah, what I were in it now. Let me make haste. All will be one for all will be none when I am there. Make you haste, too, and come into the darkness, Paul. It is soothing and soft and cool. It will wash away the sin of the girl and leave you a nothing. While she was hurrying toward the awful pool, her husband sat in his study, sunk in a cold fury of conscious disgrace, not because of his cruelty, not because he had cast a woman into hell, but because his honor, his self-satisfaction in his own fate, was thrown to the worms. Did he fail thus in consequence of having rejected the common belief? No, something far above the common belief it must be, that would have enabled him to act otherwise. But had he known the man of the gospel, he could not have left her. He would have taken her to his sorrowful bosom, wept for her, forgotten himself in pitiful grief over the spot upon her whiteness. He would have washed her clean with love and husband power. He would have welcomed his shame as his hold of her burden, whereby to lift it, with all its misery and loss, from her heart forever. Had Faber done so as he was, he would have come close up to the gate of the kingdom of heaven, for he would have been like-minded with him who sought not his own. His honor, forsooth, pride is a mighty honor. His pride was great indeed, but it was not grand. Nothing reflected, nothing whose object is self, has in it the poorest element of grandeur. Ourselves are ours, that we may lay them on the altar of love, lying there, bound and bleeding and burning if need be. They are grand indeed, for they are in their noble place and rejoicing in their fate. But this man was miserable, because the possessor of a priceless jewel he had found it was not such as would pass for flawless in the judgment of men, judges themselves unjust, whose very hearts were full of bribes. He sat there an injured husband, a wronged, woman-cheated, mocked man, he in whose eyes even smutch on her face would have lowered a woman. 
who would not have listened to an angel with a broken wing feather. Let me not be supposed to make a little of Juliet's loss. What that amounted to, let Juliet feel. Let any woman say who loves a man, and would be what that man thinks her. But I read, and I think I understand, the words of the perfect purity. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. End of chapter 34This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 35 of Paul Faber Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Carol Sutton. Paul Faber, Surgeon, by George MacDonald, a heart. If people were both observant and memorious, they would cease, I fancy, to be astonished at coincidences. Rightly regarded, the universe is but one coincidence. Only where will has to be developed, there is need for human play, and room for that must be provided in its spaces. The works of God being from the beginning, and all his beginnings invisible, either from greatness, or smallness, or nearness, or remoteness, numberless coincidences may pass in every man's history before he becomes capable of knowing either the need or the good of them or even of noting them the same morning there was another awake and up early when juliet was about halfway across the park hurrying to the water dorothy was opening the door of the empty house seeking solitude that she might find the one dweller therein she went straight to one of the upper rooms looking out upon the garden and kneeling prayed to her unknown god as she kneeled the first rays of the sunrise visited her face that face was in itself such an embodied prayer that had any one seen it he might when the beams fell upon it have imagined he saw prayer and answer me it was another sunrise dorothy was looking for but she started and smiled when the warm rays touched her they too came from the home of answers as the daisy mimics the sun so is the central fire of our system but a flower that blossoms in the eternal effulgence of the unapproachable light the god to whom we pray is nearer to us than the very prayer itself ere it leaves the heart hence his answers may well come to us through the channel of our own thoughts but the world too being itself one of his thoughts he may also well make the least likely of his creatures an angel of his own will to us even the blind if god be with him that is if he knows he is blind and does not think he sees may become a leader of the blind up to the narrow gate it is the blind who says i see that leads his fellow into the ditch the window near which dorothy kneeled and toward which in the instinct for light she had turned her face looked straight down the garden at the foot of which the greater part of the circumference of the pond was visible but dorothy busy with her prayers or rather with the weight of hunger and thirst from which like a burst of lightning skyward from the overcharged earth a prayer would now and then break and rush heavenward saw nothing of the outer world between her and the sister soul in mortal agony hung the curtains of her eyelids but there were no shutters to her ears and in at their portals all of a sudden darted a great and bitter cry as from a heart in the gripe of a fierce terror she had been so absorbed and it so startled and shook her that she never could feel certain whether the cry she heard was of this world or not half asleep one hears such a cry and cannot tell whether it has entered his consciousness by the ear or through some hidden channel of the soul assured that waking ears heard nothing he remains it may be in equal doubt whether it came from the other side of life or was a mere cry of a dream before dorothy was aware of a movement of her will she was on her feet and staring from the window 
Something was lying on the grass beyond the garden wall close to the pond. It looked like a woman. She darted from the house, out of the garden, and down the other side of the wall. When she came nearer, she saw it was indeed a woman, evidently insensible. She was bareheaded. Her bonnet was floating in the pond. The wind had blown it almost to the middle of it. Her face was turned toward the water. One hand was in it. The bank overhung the pond, and with a single movement more, she would probably have been beyond help from Dorothy. She caught her by the arm and dragged her from the brink before ever she looked in her face. Then, to her amazement, she saw it was Juliet. She opened her eyes, and it was as if a lost soul looked out of them upon Dorothy, being to whom the world was nothing. So occupied was it with some torment, which alone measured its existence far away, although it hung attached to the world by a single hook of brain and nerve. Juliet, my darling, said Dorothy, her voice trembling with the love which only souls that no trouble can feel for the troubled. Come with me, I will take care of you. At the sound of her voice, Juliet shuddered. Then a better light came into her eyes, and feebly she endeavored to get up. With Dorothy's help, she succeeded, but stood as if ready to sink again to the earth. She drew her cloak about her, turned and stared at the water, turned again and stared at Dorothy at last threw herself into her arms and sobbed and wailed for a few moments dorothy held her in a close embrace then she sought to lead her to the house and juliet yielded at once she took her into one of the lower rooms and got her some water it was all she could get for her and made her sit down on the window seat it seemed a measureless time before she made the least attempt to speak and again and again when she began to try she failed she opened her mouth but no sounds would come at length interrupted with choking gasps low cries of despair and long intervals of sobbing she said something like this i was going to drown myself when i came inside the water i fell down in a half kind of faint all the time i lay i felt as if someone was dragging me nearer and nearer to the pool then something came and drew me back and it was you dorothy but you ought to have left me i am a wretch there is no room for me in this world any more she stopped a moment then fixing light eyes on dorothy said oh dorothy dear there are awful things in the world as awful as any you ever read in a book i know that dear but oh i am sorry if any of them have come your way tell me what is the matter i will help you if i can i dare not i dare not i should go raving mad if i said a word about it then don't tell me my dear come with me upstairs there is a warmer room there full of sunshine you are nearly dead with cold i came here this morning juliet to be alone and pray to god and see what he has sent me you dear come upstairs while you are quite wet you will get your death of cold then it would be all right i would rather not kill myself if i could die without but it must be somehow we'll talk about it afterward come now with dorothy's arm around her waist juliet climbed trembling to the warmer room on a rickety wooden chair dorothy made her sit in the sunshine while she went and gathered chips and shavings and bits of wood left by the workmen with these she soon kindled a fire in the rusty grate then she took off juliet's shoes and stockings and put her own upon her she made no resistance only her eyes followed dorothy's bare feet going to and fro as if she felt something was wrong and had not strength to inquire into it but dorothy's heart rebuked her for its own lightness it had not been so light for many a day it seemed as if god was letting her know that he was there she spread her cloak on the sunny spot of the floor made juliet lie down upon it put a bundle of shavings under her head covered her with her own cloak which she had dried at the fire and was leaving the room where are you going dorothy cried juliet seeming all at once to wake up i am going to fetch your husband dear answered dorothy she gave a great cry rose to her knees and clasped dorothy round hers no 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 she screamed you shall not if you do i swear i will run straight to the pond 
Notwithstanding the loudness of her voice and look, there was an evident determination in both. I will do nothing you don't like, dear, said Dorothy. I thought that was the best thing I could do for you. No, 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 anything but that. Then of course I won't, but I must go and get you something to eat. I could not swallow a mouthful. It would choke me, and where would be the good of it when life is over? Don't talk like that, dear. Life can't be over till it's taken from us. Ah, you would see it just as I do if you do all. Tell me all, then. Where is the use when there is no help? No help, echoed Dorothy. The words she had so often uttered in her own heart, coming from the lips of another, carried in them an incredible contradiction. Could God make or the world breed the irreparable? Juliet, she went on after a little pause. I have often said the same myself, but you, interrupted Juliet, you who always profess to believe, Dorothy's ear could not distinguish whether the tone was of indignation or of bitterness. You never heard me, Juliet, she answered, profess anything. If my surroundings did so for me, I could not help that. I never dared say I believed anything, but I hope, and perhaps, she went on with a smile, seeing hope is own sister to faith, she may bring me to know her too some day. Paul says, Dorothy had been brought up a dissenter and never said saint this one or that any more than the christians of the new testament at the sound of the name juliet burst into tears the first she said for the word paul like the head of the javelin torn from the wound brought the whole foam after it she cast herself down again and lay and wept dorothy kneeled beside her and laid a hand on her shoulder it was the only way she could reach her at all you see she said at last so the weeping went on and on there is nothing will do any good but your husband no no he has cast me from him for ever she cried in a strange well that rose to a shriek the wretch exclaimed dorothy clenching a fist whose little bones looked fierce through the whitened skin no returned juliet suddenly calmed in a voice almost severe it is i who am the wretch to give you a moment in which to blame him he has done nothing but what is right i don't believe it i deserved it i am sure you did not i would believe a thousand things against him before i would believe one against you my poor white queen cried dorothy kissing her hand she snatched it away and covered her face with both hands i should only need to tell you one thing to convince you she sobbed from behind them then tell it me that i may not be unjust to him i cannot i won't take your word against yourself returned dorothy determinedly you will have to tell me or leave me to think the worst of him she was moved by no vulgar curiosity how is one to help without knowing tell me my dear she went on after a little tell me all about it and in the name of the god in whom i hope to believe i promise to give myself to your service thus adjured juliet found herself compelled but with heart tearing groans and sobs with what intervals of dumbness in which the truth seemed unutterable for despair and shame followed the what hurrying of a wild confession as if she would cast it from her the sad tale found its way into dorothy's aching heart i will not attempt to describe it is enough that at last it was told and that it had entered at the wide open eternal doors of sympathy if juliet had lost a husband she had gained a friend and that was something indeed no little thing for in her kind the friend was more complete than the husband she was truer more entire and friendship nearly perfect when a final burst of tears had ended the story of loss and despair a silence fell oh those men those men said dorothy in a low voice of bitterness as if she knew them and their ways well though never had a kiss of man save her father lighted on her cheek my poor darling she said after another pause and he cast you from him i suppose a woman's heart she went on after a third pause can never make up for the loss of a man's but here is mine for you to go into the very middle of and lie down there julia had as she told her story risen to her knees 
Dorothy was on her too, and as she spoke, she opened wide her arms and clasped the despised wife to her bosom. None but the arms of her husband, Juliet believed, could make her alive with forgiveness. Yet she felt a strange comfort in that embrace. It wrought upon her a far-off whisper of the words, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And no wonder, there was the bosom of one of the Lord's clean ones for her to rest upon. It was her first lesson in the mighty truth that sin of all things is mortal and purity alone can live for evermore end of chapter thirty five read by carol sutton knox pennsylvania march ninth two thousand twenty two this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks Chapter 36 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Vogel, Paul Faber, Surgeon, by George MacDonald. Two More Minds. Nothing makes a man strong like a call upon him for help, a fact which points at a unity more delicate and close and profound than heart has yet perceived. It is but a modern instance how a mother, if she be but a hen, becomes bold as a tigress for her periled offspring. A stranger will fight for the stranger who puts his trust in him, the most foolish of men will search his musty brain to find wise saws for his boy. An anxious man, going to his friend to borrow, may return having lent him instead. The man who has found nothing yet in the world save food for the hard, sharp, clear intellect will yet cast an eye around the universe to see if perchance there may not be a god somewhere for the hungering heart of his friend. The poor but lovely, the doubting yet living faith of Dorothy arose, stretched out its crippled wings and began to arrange and straighten their disordered feathers. It is a fair sight. Any creature, be it but a fly, dressing its wings. Dorothy's were feeble, ruffled, their pen feathers bent and a little crushed. But Juliet's were full of mud, paralyzed with disuse and grievously singed in the smoldering fire of her secret. A butterfly that has burned its wings is not very unlike a caterpillar again. Look here, Juliet, said Dorothy. There must be some way out of it, or there is no saving God in the universe. Now, don't begin to say there isn't, because, you see, it is your only chance. It would be a pity to make a fool of yourself by being overwise, to lose everything by taking it for granted there is no God. If, after all, there should be one, it would be the saddest thing to perish for want of him. I won't say I am as miserable as you, for I haven't a husband to trample on my heart but I am miserable enough and want dreadfully to be saved. I don't call this life worth living. Nothing is right. Nothing goes well. There is no harmony in me. I don't call it life at all. I want music and light in me. I want a God to save me out of this wretchedness. I want health. I thought you were never ill, Dorothy murmured Juliet listlessly. "'Is it possible you do not know what I mean?' returned Dorothy. "'Do you never feel wretched and sick in your very soul, disgusted with yourself, and longing to be lifted up out of yourself into a region of higher conditions altogether?' The kind of thing Juliet had been learning to attribute to the state of her health had partly learned— it is hard to learn anything false thoroughly, for it cannot so be learned. 
It is true that it is often, perhaps it is generally in troubled health, that such thoughts come first. But in nature there are facts of color that the cloudy day reveals. So sure am I that many things which illness has led me to see are true, that I would endlessly rather never be well than lose sight of them. So would any madman say of his fixed idea, I will keep my madness then, for therein most do I desire the noble, and to desire what I desire, if it be but to desire, is better than to have all you offer us in the name of truth. Through such desire and the hope of its attainment, all greatest things have been wrought in the earth. I too have my unbelief as well as you. I cannot believe that a lie on the belief of which has depended our highest development. You may say you have a higher to bring in, but that higher you have become capable of by the precedent lie. Yet you vaunt truth. You would sink us low indeed, making out falsehood our best nourishment, at some period of our history at least. If, however, what I call true and high, you call false and low, my assertion that you have never seen that of which I so speak will not help. Then there is nothing left us but to part. Each go his own road and wait the end, which, according to my expectation, will show the truth. According to yours, being nothing will show nothing. I cannot help thinking if we could only get up there, Dorothy went on. I mean, into a life of which I can at least dream. If I could but get my head and heart into the kingdom of heaven, I should find that everything else would come right. I believe it is God himself I want. Nothing will do but himself in me. Mr. Wingfold says that we find things all wrong about us, that they keep going against our will and our liking, just to drive things right inside us, or at least to drive us where we can get them put right, and that as soon as their work is done, the waves will lie down at our feet, or, if not, we shall at least walk over their crests. It sounds very nice and would comfort anybody that wasn't in trouble, said Juliet. But you wouldn't care one bit for it all any more than I do if you had pain and love like mine pulling at your heart. I have seen a mother make sad faces enough over the baby at her breast, said Dorothy. Love and pain seem so strangely one in this world. The wonder is how they will ever get parted. What God must feel like with this world hanging on to him with all its pains and cries. It's his own fault, said Juliet bitterly. Why did he make us? Or why did he not make us good? I'm sure I don't know where was the use of making me. Perhaps not much yet, replied Dorothy. But then he hasn't made you. He hasn't done with you yet. He is making you now, and you don't like it. No, I don't. If you call this making, why does he do it? He could have avoided all this trouble by leaving us alone. I put something like the same question once to Mr. Wingfold, said Dorothy, and he told me it was impossible to show anyone the truths of the kingdom of heaven. He must learn them for himself. I can do little more, he said, than give you my testimony that it seems to me all right. If God has not made you good, he has made you with the feeling that you ought to be good, and at least a half conviction that to him you have to go for help to become good. When you are good, then you will know why he did not make you good at first, and will be perfectly satisfied with the reason, because you will find it good and just, and right, so good that it was altogether beyond the understanding of one who is not good. I don't think, he said, you will ever get a thoroughly satisfactory answer to any question till you go to himself for it. 
and then it may take years to make you fit to receive, that is, to understand the answer. Oh, Juliet, sometimes I have felt in my heart as if I am afraid to say it, even to you. I shan't be shocked at anything. I am long past that, sighed Juliet. It is not of you I am afraid, said Dorothy. It is a kind of awe of the universe, I feel. But God is the universe. His is the only ear that will hear me, and he knows my thoughts already, Juliet. I feel sometimes as if I must be good for God's sake, as if I was sorry for him, because he has such a troublesome nursery of children that will not or cannot understand him and will not do what he tells them. And he, all the time, doing the very best for them he can. It may be all very true, or great nonsense, Dorothy dear. I don't care a bit about it. All I care for is, I don't know what I care for. I don't care for anything anymore. There's nothing left to care for. I love my husband with a heart like to break. Oh, how I wish it would. He hates and despises me, and I dare not wish that he wouldn't. If he were to forgive me quite, I should yet feel that he ought to despise me, and that would be all the same as if he did, and there is no help. Oh, how horrid I look to him. I can't bear it. I fancied it was all gone, but there it is, and there it must be forever. I don't care about a god. If there were a God, what would he be to me without my Paul? I think, Juliet, you will yet come to say, what would my Paul be to me without my God? I suspect we have no more idea than that lonely fly on the window there what it would be to have a God. I don't care. I would rather go to hell with my Paul than go to heaven without him, moaned Juliet. But what if God should be the only where to find your Paul, said Dorothy? What if the gulf that parts you is just the gulf of a God not believed in, a universe which neither of you can cross to meet the other, just because you do not believe it is there at all? Juliet made no answer. Dorothy could not tell whether from feeling or from indifference. The fact was, the words conveyed no more meaning to Juliet than they will to some of my readers. Why do I write them, then? Because there are some who will understand them at once, and others who will grow to understand them. Dorothy was astonished to find herself saying them. The demands of her new office of comforter gave shape to many half-formed thoughts, substance to many shadowy perceptions, something like music to not a few dim feelings moving within her. But what she said hardly seemed her own at all. Had it not been for Wingfold's help, Dorothy might not have learned these things in this world. But had it not been for Juliet, they would have taken years more to blossom in her being and so become her own. Her faint hope seemed now to break forth suddenly into power. Whether or not she was saying such things as were within the scope of Juliet's apprehension was a matter of comparatively little moment. As she lay there in misery, rocking herself from side to side on the floor, she would have taken hold of nothing. But love is the first comforter, and where love and truth speak, the love will be felt where the truth is never perceived. Love indeed is the highest in all truth, and the pressure of a hand, a kiss, the caress of a child will do more to save sometimes than the wisest argument, even rightly understood. Love alone is wisdom. Love alone is power, and where love seems to fail, it is where self has stepped between and dulled the potency of its rays. 
Dorothy thought of another line of expostulation. Juliet, she said, suppose you were to drown yourself and your husband were to repent. That is the only hope left me. You see yourself, I have no choice. You have no pity, it seems. For what then would become of him? What if he should come to himself in bitter sorrow, in wild longing for your forgiveness, but you had taken your forgiveness with you, for he had no hope of ever finding it? Do you want to punish him? To make him as miserable as yourself? To add immeasurably to the wrong you have done him? by going where no word, no message, no letter can pass, no cry can cross. No, Juliet, death can set nothing right. But if there be a God, then nothing can go wrong, but he can set it right, and set it right better than it was before. He could not make it better than it was. What? Is that your ideal of love? A love that fails in the first trial? If he could not better that, then indeed he were no God worth the name. Why then did he make us such? Make such a world as is always going wrong. Mr. Wingfold says, It is always going right or the same time it is going wrong. I grant he would have had no right to make a world that might go further wrong than he could set right at his own cost. But if at his own cost he turn its sills into goods, its ugliness into favor, ah, if it should be so, Juliet, it may be so. I do not know. I have not found him yet. Help me to find him. Let us seek him together. If you find him, you cannot lose your husband. If love is lord of the world, love must yet be lord in his heart. It will wake, if not sooner, yet when the bitterness has worn itself out. As Mr. Wingfold says, all evil must, because its heart is death and not life. I don't care a straw for life. If I could but find my husband, I would gladly die forever in his arms. It is not true that the soul longs for immortality. I don't. I long only for love, for forgiveness, for my husband. But would you die so long as there was the poorest chance of regaining your place in his heart? No. Give me the feeblest chance of that and I will live. I could live forever on the mere hope of it. I can't give you any hope, but I have hope of it in my own heart. Juliet rose on her elbow. But I am disgraced, she said, almost indignantly. It would be disgrace to him to take me again. I remember one of the officer's wives. No, no, he hates and despises me. Besides, I could never look one of his friends in the face again. Everybody will say I ran away with someone or that he sent me away because I was wicked. You all had a prejudice against me from the very first. Yes, in a way, confessed Dorothy. It always seemed as if we did not know you and could not get at you, as if you avoided us, with your heart, I mean, as if you had resolved we should not know you, as if you had something you were afraid we should discover. Ah, there it was, you see, cried Juliet. And now the hidden thing is revealed. That was it. I never could get rid of the secret that was gnawing at my life. Even when I was hardly aware of it, it was there. Oh, if I had only been ugly, then Paul would never have thought of me. She threw herself down again and buried her face. Hide me. Hide me, she went on lifting to Dorothy her hands, clasped in an agony, while her face continued turned from her. Let me stay here. Let me die in peace. Nobody would ever think I was here. That is just what has been coming and going in my mind, answered Dorothy. It is a strange old place, 
You might be here for months and nobody know. Oh, wouldn't you mind it? I shouldn't live long. I couldn't, you know. I will be your very sister, if you will let me, replied Dorothy. Only then you must do what I tell you, and begin at once by promising not to leave the house till I come back to you. As she spoke, she arose. But someone will come, said Juliet, half rising, as if she would run after her. No one will. But if anyone should come here, I will show you a place where nobody would find you. She helped her to rise and led her from the room to a door in a rather dark passage. This she opened and, striking a light, showed an ordinary closet with pegs for hanging garments upon. The sides of it were paneled, and in one of them, not readily distinguishable, was another door. It opened into a room lighted only by a little window high up in a wall, through whose dusty cobweb panes crept a modicum of second-hand light from a stair. There, said Dorothy, if you should hear any sound before I come back, run in here. See what a bolt there is to the door. Mind you, shut both. You can close that shutter over the window, too, if you like. Only nobody can look in at it without getting a ladder, and there isn't one about the place. I don't believe anyone knows of this room but myself. Juliet was too miserable to be frightened at the look of it, which was wretched enough. She promised not to leave the house, and Dorothy went. Many times before she returned had Juliet fled from the sounds of imagined approach and taken refuge in the musty dusk of the room withdrawn. When at last Dorothy came, she found her in it trembling. She came bringing a basket with everything needful for breakfast. She had not told her father anything. He was too simple, she said to herself, to keep a secret with comfort, and she would risk anything rather than discovery, while yet she did not clearly know what ought to be done. Her version of the excellent French proverb, Dans les deux abstiens toi, was, when you are not sure, wait. Which goes a little further, inasmuch as it indicates expectation and may imply faith. With difficulty she prevailed upon her to take some tea and a little bread and butter, feeding her like a child, and trying to comfort her with hope. Juliet sat on the floor, leaning against the wall, the very picture of despair, white like alabaster rather than marble, with a bluish whiteness. Her look was of one utterly lost. We'll let the fire out now, said Dorothy, for the sun is shining in warm, and there had better be no smoke. The wood is rather scarce, too. I will get you some more, and here are matches. You can light it again when you please. She then made her a bed on the floor with a quantity of wood shavings and some shawls she had brought, and when she had lain down upon it, kneeled beside her, and covering her face with her hands, tried to pray. But it seemed as if all the misery of humanity was laid upon her, and God would not speak. Not a sound would come from her throat, till she burst into tears and sobs. It struck a strange chord in the soul of the wife to hear the maiden weeping over her, but it was no private trouble. It was the great need common to all men that opened the fountain of her tears. It was hunger after the light that slays the darkness, after a comfort to confront every woe, a life to lift above death, an antidote to all wrong. It was one of the groanings of the spirit that cannot be uttered in words articulate or even formed into thoughts defined. But Juliet was filled only with the thought of herself and her husband, and the tears of her friend but bedewed the leaves of her bitterness did not reach the dry roots of her misery. Dorothy's spirit revived when she found herself once more alone in the park on her way home the second time. 
She must be of better courage, she said to herself, struggling in the slew of despond. She had come upon one worse mired than she, for whose sake she must search yet more vigorously after the hidden stepping stones, the peaks whose bases are the center of the world. God help me, she said ever and anon as she went. And every time she said it, she quickened her pace and ran. It was just breakfast time when she reached the house. Her father was coming down the stair. Would you mind, father, she said as they sat, if I were to make a room at the old house a little comfortable? I mind nothing you please to do, Dorothy, he answered. But you must not become a recluse. In your search for God, you must not forsake your neighbor. If only I could find my neighbor, she returned with a rather sad smile. I shall never be able even to look for him, I think, till I have found one nearer first. You have surely found your neighbor when you have found his wounds, and your hand is on the oil flask, said her father, who knew her indefatigable in her ministrations. I don't feel it so, she answered, when I am doing things for people. My arms seemed to be miles long. As soon as her father left the table, she got her basket again, filled it from the larder and storeroom, laid a book or two on the top, and telling Elizabeth she was going to the old house for the rest of the day, set out on her third journey thither. To her delight, she found Juliet fast asleep. She sat down rather tired and began to reflect. Her great fear was that Juliet would fall ill. And then what was to be done? How was she to take the responsibility of nursing her? But she remembered how the Lord had said she was to take no thought for the morrow. And therewith she began to understand the word. She saw that one cannot do anything in tomorrow, and that all care which cannot be put into the work of today is taken out of it. One thing seemed clear, that so long as it was Juliet's desire to remain concealed from her husband, she had no right to act against that desire. Whether Juliet was right or wrong, a sense of security was for the present absolutely necessary to quiet her mind. It seemed, therefore, the first thing she had to do was to make that concealed room habitable for her. It was dreadful to think of her being there alone at night, but her trouble was too great to leave much room for fear. And anyhow, there was no choice. So while Juliet slept, she set about cleaning it, and hard work she found it. Great also was the labor afterward, when piece by piece at night, or in the early morning, she carried thither everything necessary to make a boat in it clean and warm and soft. The labor of love is its own reward. But Dorothy received much more, for in the fresh impulse and freedom born of this service, she soon found not only that she thought better and more clearly on the points that troubled her, but that thus spending herself, she grew more able to believe there must be one whose glory is perfect ministration. Also, her anxious concentration of thought upon the usurping thoughts of others, with its tendency to diseased action and the logical powers, was thereby checked, much to her relief. She was not finding an atom of what is called proof. But when the longing heart finds itself able to hope that the perfect is the fact, that the truth is alive, that the lovely is rooted in eternal purpose, it can go on without such proof as belongs to a lower stratum of things and cannot be had in these. When we rise into the mountaineer, we require no other testimony than that of our lungs that we are in a healthful atmosphere. We do not find it necessary to submit it to a quantitative analysis. We are content that we breathe with joy, that we grow in strength, become lighter-hearted and better-tempered. Truth is a very different thing from fact. 
It is the loving contact of the soul with spiritual fact, vital and potent. It does its work in the soul independently of all faculty or qualification there for setting it forth or defending it. Truth in the inward parts is a power, not an opinion. It were as poor a matter as any held by those who deny it, if it had not its vitality in itself, if it depended upon any buttressing of other and lower material. How should it be otherwise? If God be so near as the very idea of him necessitates, what other availing proof of his existence can there be than such awareness as must come of the developing relation between him and us. The most satisfying of intellectual proofs, if such were to be had, would be of no value. God would be no nearer to us for them all. They would bring about no blossoming of the mighty fact. While he was in our very souls, there would yet lie between him and us a gulf of misery, of no knowledge. Peace is for those who do the truth, not for those who opine it. The true man, troubled by intellectual doubt, is so troubled unto further health and growth. Let him be alive and hopeful, above all obedient, and he will be able to wait for the deeper content which must follow with completer insight. Men may say such a man but deceives himself that there is nothing of the kind he pleases himself with imagining. But this is at least worth reflecting upon, that while the man who aspires fears he may be deceiving himself, it is the man who does not aspire who asserts that he is. One day the former may be sure, and the latter may cease to deny and begin to doubt. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 37 of Paul Faber, Surgeon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Vogel, Paul Faber, Surgeon, by George MacDonald. The Doctor's Study Paul Faber's condition as he sat through the rest of that night in his study was about as near absolute misery as a man's could well be in this life, I imagine. The woman he had been watching through the first part of it as his essential bliss he had left in a swoon, lying naked on the floor, and would not and did not go near her again. How could he? Had he not been duped, sold, married to? That way, madness lay. His pride was bitterly wounded. Would it had been mortally, but pride seems in some natures to thrive upon wounds as in others does love. Faber's pride grew and grew as he sat and brooded, or rather was brooded upon. He, Paul Faber, who knew his own worth, his truth, his love, his devotion, he, with his grand ideas of woman and purity and unity, conscious of deserving a woman's best regards, he, whose love to speak truly his unworded, undefined impression of himself. Any woman might be proud to call hers. He, to be thus deceived, to have taken to his bosom one who had before taken another to hers, and thought it yet good enough for him, it would not bear thinking. Indignation and bitterest sense of wrong almost crazed him, Forevermore he must be a hypocrite, going about with the knowledge of that concerning himself which he would not have known by others. 
This was how the woman whom he had brought back from death with the life of his own heart had served him. Years ago, she had sacrificed her bloom to some sneaking wretch who flattered a god with prayers, then enticed and bewitched and married him. In all this thinking, there was no thought but for himself, not one for the woman whose agony had been patent even to his wrath-blinded eyes. And what is the wretchedness of our condition more evident than in this? that the sense of wrong always makes us unjust. It is a most humbling thought. God help us. He forgot how she had avoided him, resisted him, refused to confess the love which his goodness, his importunities, his besieging love had compelled in her heart. It was true. She ought either to have refused him absolutely and left him, or confessed and left the matter with him. But he ought to have remembered for another, if ever he had known it for himself, the hardness of some duties. And what duty could be more torturing to a delicate-minded woman than either of those to leave the man she loved in passionate pain, sore wounded with a sense of undeserved cruelty, or to give him the strength to send her from him, by confessing to his face what she could not recall in the solitude of her own chamber, but the agony would break out wet on her forehead. We do our brother, our sister, grievous wrong every time that in our selfish justice we forget the excuse that mitigates the blame. That God never does, for it would be to disregard the truth. As he will never admit a false excuse, so will he never neglect a true one. It may be he makes excuses which the sinner dare not think of, while the most specious of false ones shrivel into ashes before him. A man is bound to think of all just excuse for his offender, for less than the righteousness of God will not serve his turn. I would not have my reader set favor down as heartless. His life showed the contrary. But his pride was roused to such furious self-assertion that his heart lay beaten down under the sweep of its cyclone. Its turn was only delayed. The heart is always there and rage is not. The heart is a constant, even when most intermittent, force. It can bide its time. Nor indeed did it now lie quite still, for the thought of that white self-offered sacrifice let him rave as he would against the stage trickery of the scene, haunted him so that once and again he had to rouse an evil will to restrain him from rushing to clasp her to his bosom. Then there was the question, why now had she told him all, if indeed she had made a clean breast of it? Was it from love to him, or reviving honesty in herself? From neither, he said. Superstition alone was at the root of it. She had been to church, and the preaching of that honest, idiotic, enthusiast wingfold had terrified her. Alas, what refuge in her terror had she found with her husband? Before morning he had made up his mind as to the course he would pursue. He would not publish his own shame, but neither would he leave the smallest doubt in her mind as to what he thought of her, or what he felt toward her. All should be utterly changed between them. He would behave to her with extreme, with marked politeness. He would pay her every attention woman could claim, but her friend, her husband, he would be no more. His thoughts of vengeance took many turns, some of them childish. He would always call her Mrs. Faber. Never, except they had friends, would he sit in the same room with her. To avoid scandal, he would dine with her, if he could not help being at home. But when he rose from the table, it would be to go to his study. 
If he happened at any time to be in the room with her when she rose to retire, he would light her candle, carry it upstairs for her, open the door, make her a polite bow, and leave her. Never once would he cross the threshold of her bedroom. She should have plenty of money. The purse of an adventuress was a greedy one, but he would do his best to fill it, nor once reproach her with extravagance, of which fault, let me remark, she had never yet shown a sign. He would refuse her nothing she asked of him, except it were in any way himself. As soon as his old aunt died, he would get her a brougham, but never would he sit in it by her side. Such, he thought, would be the vengeance of a gentleman. Thus he fumed and raved and trifled in an agony of selfish suffering, a proud, injured man. And all the time, the object of his vengeful indignation was lying insensible on the spot where she had prayed to him, her loving heart motionless within a bosom of ice. In the morning he went to his dressing room, had his bath, and went down to breakfast, half desiring his wife's appearance that he might begin his course of vindictive torture. He could not eat, and was just rising to go out when the door opened, and the parlor-maid, who served also as Juliet's attendant, appeared. "'I can't find Mrs. Nowhere, sir,' she said. Faber understood at once that she had left him, and a terror neither vague nor ill-founded possessed itself of him. He sprung from his seat and darted up the stair to her room. Little more than a glance was necessary to assure him that she had gone deliberately intending it should be forever. The diamond ring lay on her dressing table, spending itself in flashing back the single ray of the sun that seemed to have stolen between the curtains to find it. Her wedding ring lay beside it, and the sparkle of the diamonds stung his heart like a demoniacal laughter over it. The more horrible that it was so silent, and so lovely. It was but three days since, in his wife's presence, he had been justifying suicide with every argument he could bring to bear. It was true he had insisted on a proper regard to circumstances, and especially on giving due consideration to the question whether the act would hurt others more than it would relieve the person contemplating it. But after the way he had treated her, there could be no doubt how Juliet, if she thought of it at all, was compelled to answer it. He rushed to the stable, saddled Ruber, and galloped wildly away. At the end of the street he remembered that he had not a single idea to guide him. She was lying dead somewhere, but whether to turn east or west or north or south to find her, he had not the slightest notion. His condition was horrible. For a moment or two, he was ready to blow his brains out. That, if the Orthodox were right, was his only chance for overtaking her. What a laughingstock he would then be to them all. The strangest, wildest, maddest thoughts came and went of themselves, and when at last he found himself seated on Ruber in the middle of the street, an hour seemed to have passed. It was but a few moments, and the thought that roused him was, could she have betaken herself to her old lodging at Owlkirk? It was not likely. It was possible. He would ride and see. They will say I murdered her, he said to himself as he rode. So little did he expect ever to see her again. I don't care. They may prove it if they can, and hang me. I shall make no defense. It will be but a fit end to the farce of life. He laughed aloud, struck his spurs in Ruber's flanks, and rode wildly. He was desperate. He knew neither what he felt nor what he desired. 
If he had found her alive, he would, I do not doubt, have behaved to her cruelly. His life had fallen in a heap about him. He was ruined, and she had done it. He said, he thought, he believed. He was not aware how much of his misery was occasioned by a shrinking dread of the judgments of people he despised. Had he known it, he would have been yet more miserable, for he would have scorned himself for it. There is so much in us that is beyond our reach. Before arriving at Alkirk, he made up his mind, if she were not there, he would ride to the town of Bruhill, not in the hope of any news of her, but because there dwelt the only professional friend he had in the neighborhood, one who sympathized with his view of things and would not close his heart against him because he did not believe that this horrid, ugly, disjointed thing of a world had been made by a god of love. Generally, he had been in the habit of dwelling upon the loveliness of its developments and the beauty of the gradual adaptation of life to circumstance. But now it was plainer to him than ever that if made at all, it was made by an evil being. For, he said, and said truly, a conscious being without a heart must be an evil being. This was the righteous judgment of a man who could by one tender, consoling word have made the sun rise upon a glorious world of conscious womanhood, but would not say that word, and left that world lying in the tortured chaos of a slow disintegration. This conscious being with the heart, this Paul Faber, who saw that a god of love was the only god supposable, set his own pride so far above love that his one idea was to satisfy the justice of his outraged dignity by the torture of the sinner. Even while all the time dimly aware of rebuke in his soul. If she should have destroyed herself, he said once and again as he rode, was it more than a just sacrifice to his wronged honor? As such, he would accept it. If she had, it was best, best for her and best for him. What so much did it matter? She was very lovely, true, but what was the quintessence of dust to him? Where either was there any great loss? He and she would soon be wrapped up in the primal darkness, the mother and grave of all things together. No, not together. Not even in the dark of nothingness could they two any more lie together. Hot tears forced their way into his eyes whence they rolled down, the lava of the soul scorching his cheeks. He struck his spurs into Ruber fiercely and rode madly on. At length he neared the outskirts of Bruhill. He had ridden at a fearful pace across country, leaving all to his horse, who had carried him wisely as well as bravely. But Ruber, although he had years of good work left in him, was not in his first strength, and was getting exhausted with his wild mourning. For all the way, his master, apparently unconscious of everything else, had been immediately aware of the slightest slackening of muscle under him the least faltering of the onward pace. And in the temper of the savage, which wakes the moment the man of civilization is hard put to it, the moment he flagged still drove the cruel spurs into his flanks when the grand, unresenting creature would rush forward at straining speed. Not, I venture to think, so much in obedience to the pain is in obedience to the will of his master, fresh recognized through the pain. Close to the high road, where they were now approaching it through the fields, a rail fence had just been put up, enclosing a piece of ground which the owner wished to let for building. That the fact might be known, 
He was about to erect a post with a great board announcing it. For this post, a man had dug the hole and then gone to his dinner. The enclosure lay between Faber and the road. In the direct line he was taking. On went Ruber blindly, more blindly than his master knew, for with the prolonged running he had partially lost his sight, so that he was close to the fence before he saw it. But he rose boldly and cleared it, to light, alas, on the other side with a foreleg in the hole. Down he came with a terrible crash, pitched his master into the road upon his head, and lay groaning with a broken leg. Faber neither spoke nor moved, but lay as he fell. A poor woman ran to his assistance, and, finding she could do nothing for him, hurried to the town for help. His friend, who was the first surgeon in the place, flew to the spot and had him carried to his house. It was a severe case of concussion of the brain. Poor old Ruber was speedily helped to a world better than this for horses, I trust. Meantime, Glaston was in commotion. The servants had spread the frightful news that their mistress had vanished, and their master ridden off like a madman. But he won't find her alive, poor lady, I don't think, was the general close of their communication, accompanied by a would-be wise and really sympathetic shake of the head. In this conclusion, most agreed, for there was a general impression of something strange about her, partly occasioned by the mysterious way in which Mrs. Puckridge had spoken concerning her illness and the marvelous thing the doctor had done to save her life. People now supposed that she had gone suddenly mad, or rather that the latent madness so plain to read in those splendid eyes of hers had been suddenly developed, and that under its influence she had rushed away and probably drowned herself. Nor were there wanting among the discontented women of Glaston some who regarded the event vaguely to their own consciousness, I gladly admit, as almost a judgment upon Faber for marrying a woman of whom nobody knew anything. Hundreds went out to look for the body down the river. Many hurried to an old quarry half full of water on the road to Bruhill and peered horse-stricken over the edge, but said nothing. The boys of Glaston were mainly of a mind that the pond at the old house was of all places the most likely to attract a suicide, for with the fascination of its horrors they were themselves acquainted. Thither, therefore, they sped, and soon... Glaston received its expected second shock in the tidings that a lady's bonnet had been found floating in the frightful pool. While in the wet mass the boys brought back with them, some of her acquaintance recognized with certainty a bonnet they had seen Mrs. Faber wear. There was no room left for doubt. The body of the poor lady was lying at the bottom of the pool, a multitude rushed at once to the spot, although they knew it was impossible to drag the pool, so deep was it, and for its depth so small. Neither would she ever come to the surface, they said, for the pikes and eels would soon leave nothing but the skeleton. So Glaston took the whole matter for ended and began to settle down again to its own affairs, condoling greatly with the poor gentleman such a favorite, who so young and after such a brief experience of marriage had lost in such a sad way a wife so handsome, so amiable, so clever. But some said a doctor ought to have known better than marry such a person, however handsome, and they hoped it would be a lesson to him. On the whole, so sorry for him was Glaston, that if the doctor could have gone about it invisible, he would have found he had more friends and fewer enemies than he had supposed. For the first two or three days, no one was surprised that he did not make his appearance. They thought he was upon some false trail. 
But when four days had elapsed and no news was heard of him, for his friend knew nothing of what had happened, had written to Mrs. Faber, and the letter lay unopened. Some began to hint that he must have had a hand in his wife's disappearance, and to breathe a presentiment that he would never more be seen in Glaston. On the morning of the fifth day, however, his accident was known, and that he was lying insensible at the house of his friend, Dr. May, whereupon, although here and there might be heard the expression of a pretty strong conviction as to the character of the visitation, the sympathy both felt and uttered was larger than before. The other medical men immediately divided his practice amongst them to keep it together against his possible return, though few believed he would ever again look on scenes darkened by the memory of bliss so suddenly blasted. For weeks his recovery was doubtful, during which time, even if they had dared, it would have been useless to attempt acquainting him with what all believed the certainty of his loss. But when at length he woke to a memory of the past and began to desire information, his friend was compelled to answer his questions. He closed his lips, bowed his head on his breast, gave a great sigh, and held his peace. Everyone saw that he was terribly stricken. End of chapter 37。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 38 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Vogel, Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. The Mind of Juliet. There was one, however, who I must confess was not a little relieved at the news of what had befallen Faber, for although far from desiring his death, which indeed would have ruined some of her warmest hopes for Juliet, Dorothy greatly dreaded meeting him. She was a poor dissembler, hated even the shadow of a lie, and here was a fact which, if truth could conceal it, must not be known. Her dread had been that the first time she saw Faber it would be beyond her power to look innocent, that her knowledge would be legible in her face, and much she hoped their first encounter might be in the presence of Helen or some other ignorant friend, behind whose innocent front she might shelter her conscious secrecy. To truth, such a silence must feel like a culpable deception. And I do not think such a painful position can ever arise except from wrong somewhere. Dorothy could not tell a lie. She could not try to tell one, and if she had tried, she would have been instantly discovered through the enmity of her very being to the lie she told. From her lips, it would have been as transparent as the truth. It is no wonder, therefore, that she felt relieved when first she heard of the durance in which favor was lying. But she felt equal to the withholding from Juliet of the knowledge of her husband's condition for the present. She judged that seeing she had saved her friend's life, she had some right to think and choose for the preservation of that life. Meantime, she must beware of security and cultivate caution and so successful was she that weeks passed and not a single doubt associated Dorothy with knowledge where others desired to know. Not even her father had a suspicion in the direction of the fact. She knew he would one day approve both of what she did and of her silence concerning it. To tell him, thoroughly as he was to be trusted, would be to increase the risk. 
And besides, she had no right to reveal a woman's secret to a man. It was a great satisfaction, however, notwithstanding her dread of meeting him, to hear that Faber had at length returned to Glaston. For if he had gone away, how could they have ever known what to do? For one thing, if he were beyond their knowledge, he might any day, in full confidence, go and marry again. Her father not unfrequently accompanied her to the old house, but Juliet and she had arranged such signals and settled such understandings that the simple man saw nothing, heard nothing, for felt nothing. Now and then a little pang would quaver through Dorothy's bosom when she caught sight of him peering down into the terrible dusk of the pool or heard him utter some sympathetic hope for the future of poor Faber. But she comforted herself with the thought of how glad he would be when she was able to tell him all, and how he would laugh over the story of their precautions against himself. Her chief anxiety was for Juliet's health, even more for the sake of avoiding discovery than for its own. When the nights were warm, she would sometimes take her out in the park, and every day, one time or another, would make her walk in the garden while she kept watch on the top of the steep slope. Her father would sometimes remark to a friend how Dorothy's love of solitude seemed to grow upon her, but the remark suggested nothing, and slowly Juliet was being forgotten at Glaston. It seemed to Dorothy strange that she did not fall ill. For the first few days she was restless and miserable as a human being could be. She had but one change of mood. Either she would talk feverishly or sit in the gloomiest silence, now and then varied with a fit of abandoned weeping. Every time Dorothy came from Glaston she would overwhelm her with questions which at first Dorothy could easily meet, for she spoke absolute fact when she said she knew nothing concerning her husband. When at length the cause of his absence was understood, she told her he was with his friend, Dr. May, at Bruehill. Knowing the universal belief that she had committed suicide, nothing could seem more natural. But when, day after day, she heard the same thing for weeks, she began to fear he would never be able to resume his practice, at least at Glaston, and whip bitterly at the thought of the evil she had brought upon him who had given her life and love to boot. For her heart was a genuine one and dwelt far more on the wrong her too eager love had done him than on the hardness with which he had resented it. Nay, she admired him for the fierceness of his resentment, witnessing in her eyes to the purity of the man whom his neighbors regarded as wicked. After the first day, she paid even less heed to anything of a religious kind with which Dorothy, in the strength of her own desire after a perfect stay, sought to rouse or console her. When Dorothy ventured on such ground, which grew more and more seldom, she would sit listless, heedless, with a faraway look. Sometimes, when Dorothy fancied she had been listening a little, her next words would show that her thoughts had been only with her husband. When the subsiding of the deluge of her agony allowed words to carry meaning to her, any hint at supernal consolation made her angry and she rejected everything Dorothy said, almost with indignation. To seem to accept such comfort, she would have regarded as traitorous to her husband. Not the devotion of a friend, who gave up to her all of her life she could call her own, sufficed to make her listen, even with a poor patience. So absorbed was she in her trouble, that she had no feeling of what poor Dorothy had done for her. How can I blame her, poor lady? If existence was not a thing to be enjoyed, as for her it certainly was not at present, how was she 
to be thankful for what seemed its preservation. There was much latent love to Dorothy in her heart. I may go further and say there was much latent love to God in her heart. Only the latter was very latent as yet. When her heart was a little freer from grief and the agony of loss, she would love Dorothy. But God must wait with his own patience, wait long for the child of his love to learn that her very sorrow came of his dearest affection. Who wants such affection as that, says the unloving? No one, I answer, but everyone who comes to know it glorifies it as being the only love that ever could satisfy his being. Dorothy, who had within her the chill of her own doubt, soon yielded to Juliet's coldness and ceased to say anything that could be called religious. She saw that it was not time to speak. She must content herself with being. Nor had it ever been anything very definite she could say. She had seldom gone beyond the expression of her own hope and the desire that her friend would look up. She could say that the, all the men she knew, from books or in life, of the most delicate honesty, the most genuine repentance, the most rigid self-denial, the loftiest aspiration, were Christian men. But she could neither say her knowledge of history or of life was large, nor that of the men she knew who professed to believe the greater part were honest, are much ashamed, or rigid against themselves, are lofty toward God. She saw that her part was not instruction, but ministration, and that in obedience to Jesus in whom she hoped to believe. What matter that poor Juliet denied him? If God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, he would be pleased with the cup of cold water given to one that was not a disciple. Dorothy dared not say she was a disciple herself. She dared only say that right gladly would she become one, if she could. If only the lovely, the good, the tender, the pure, the grand, the adorable, were also the absolutely true. True not in the human idea only, but in absolute fact, in divine existence. If the story of Jesus was true, then joy to the universe, for all was well. She waited and hoped and prayed and ministered. There is a great power in quiet, for God is in it. Not seldom he seems to lay his hand on one of his children as a mother lays hers on the restless one in the crib to still him. Then the child sleeps, but the man begins to live up from the lower depths of his nature. So the winter comes to still the plant whose life had been rushing to blossom and fruit. When the hand of God is laid upon a man, vain moan and struggle and complaint, it may be indignant outcry follows. But when outwearied at last he yields, if it be in dull submission to the inexorable and is still, then the God at the heart of him, the God that is there or the man could not be, begins to grow. This point Juliet had not yet reached, and her trouble went on. She saw no light, no possible outlet. Her cries, her longings, her agonies could not reach even the ears, could never reach the heart of the man who had cast her off. He believed her dead, might go and marry another, and what would be left her then? Nothing but the death from which she now restrained herself. Lest, as Dorothy had taught her, she should deny him the fruits of a softening heart and returning love. 
The moment she heard that he sought another, she would seek death and assuredly find him. One letter she would write to leave behind her and then go. He should see and understand that the woman he despised, for the fault of the girl, was yet capable of the noblest act of a wife. She would die that he might live, that it might be well with her husband. Having entertained, comprehended, and settled this idea in her mind, she became quieter. After this, Dorothy might have spoken without stirring up so angry an opposition, but it was quite as well she did not know it and did not speak. I have said that Dorothy wondered she did not fall ill. There was a hope in Juliet's mind of which she had not spoken, but upon which, though vaguely, she built further hope, and which may have had part in her physical endurance. The sight of his baby might move the heart of her husband to pardon her. But the time even with the preoccupation of misery, grew very dreary. She had never had any resources in herself except her music. And even if here she had any opportunity of drawing upon that, what is music but a mockery to a breaking heart? Was music ever born of torture or misery? It is only when the cloud of sorrow is sinking in the sun rays that the song-larks awake and ascend. A glory of some sort must fringe the skirts of any sadness. The light of the sorrowing soul itself must be shed upon it, and the cloud must be far enough removed to show the reflected light before it will yield any of the stuff of which songs are made. And this light that gathers in song, what is it but hope behind the sorrow? hope so little recognized as such that it is often called despair. It is reviving and not decay that sings even the saddest of songs. Juliet had had little consciousness of her own being as an object of reflection. Joy and sorrow came and went. She never brooded. Never until now had she known any very deep love. Even that she bore her father had not ripened into the grand love of the woman-child. She forgot quickly. She hoped easily. She had had some courage and naturally much activity. She faced necessity by instinct and took almost no thought for the morrow. But this after the fashion of the birds, not after the fashion required of those who can consider the birds. It is one thing to take no thought for want of thought, and another to take no thought from sufficing thought, whose flower is confidence. The one way is the lovely way of God in the birds, the other his lovelier way in his men and women. She had in her the making of a noble woman, only that is true of every woman, and it was no truer of her than of every other woman that without religion she could never be in any worthy sense a woman at all. I know how narrow and absurd this will sound to many of my readers, but such simply do not know what religion means and think I do not know what a woman means. Hitherto her past had always turned to a dream as it glided away from her, but now, in the pauses of her prime agony, the tide rose from the infinite sea to which her river ran, and all her past was borne back upon her. Even to her far-gone childish quarrels with her silly mother, and the neglect and disobedience she had too often been guilty of toward her father. And the center of her memories was the hot coal of that one secret, Around that they all burned and hissed. Now for the first time her past was, and she cowered and fled from it, a slave to her own history, to her own deeds, to her own concealment. 
Alas, like many another terror-stricken child, to whom the infinite bosom of tenderness and love stretches out arms of shelter and healing and life, she turned to the bosom of death and imagined there a shelter of oblivious darkness. For life is a thing so deep, so high, so pure, so far above the reach of common thought, that although shadowed out in all the harmonic glories of color and speech and song and scent and motion and shine, yea, even of eyes and loving hands to common minds, and the more merely intellectual the commoner are they, it seems but a phantasm. To unchildlike minds, the region of love and worship to which lead the climbing stairs of duty is but a nephilicacagia. They acknowledge the stairs, however, thank God, and if they will but climb, a hand will be held out to them. Now to pray to a God the very thought of whose possible existence might seem enough to turn the coal of a dead life into a diamond of eternal radiance is with many such enough to stamp a man a fool. It will surprise me nothing in the new world to hear such men, finding they are not dead after all, begin at once to argue that they were quite right in refusing to act upon any bare possibility, forgetting that the questioning of possibilities has been the source of all scientific knowledge. They may say that to them there seemed no possibility, upon which will come the question, whence arose their incapacity for seeing it. In the meantime, that the same condition which constitutes the bliss of a child should also be the essential bliss of a man is incomprehensible to him in whom the child is dead or so fast asleep that nothing but a trumpet of care can awake him. That the rules of the nursery, I mean the nursery where the true mother is the present genius, not the hell at the top of a London house. That the rules of a nursery over which broods a wise mother with outspread wings of tenderness should be the laws also of cosmic order, of a world's well-being, of national greatness, and of all personal dignity, may well be an old wife's fable to the man who dabbles at saving the world by science, education, hygiene, and other economics. There is a knowledge that will do it, but of that he knows so little that he will not allow it to be a knowledge at all. Into what would he save the world? His paradise would prove a ten times more miserable condition than that out of which he thought to rescue it. But anything that gives objectivity to trouble, that lifts the cloud so far that, if but for a moment, it shows itself a cloud instead of being felt an enveloping, penetrating, palsying mist, setting it where the mind can in its turn prey upon it, can play with it, paint it, may come to sing of it, is a great help toward what health may yet be possible for the troubled soul. With a woman's instinct, Dorothy borrowed from the curate a volume of a certain more attractive edition of Shakespeare than she herself possessed, and left it in Juliet's way, so arranged that it should open to the tragedy of Othello. She thought that if she could be drawn into sympathy with suffering like, but different and apart from her own, it would take her a little out of herself and might lighten the pressure of her load. Now Juliet had never read a play of Shakespeare in her life and knew Othello only after the vulgar interpretation as the type that is of jealousy. But when in a pause of the vague reverie of feeling which she called thought, a touch of ennui supervening upon suffering. She began to read the play. The condition of her own heart afforded her the insight necessary for decrying 
more truly the Othello of Shakespeare's mind. She wept for Desdemona's innocence and hard fate, but she pitied more the far harder fate of Othello, and found the death of both a consolation for the trouble their troubles had stirred up in her. The curate was in the habit of scribbling on his books, and at the end of the play, which left a large blank on the page, had written a few verses. As she sat dreaming over the tragedy, Juliet almost unconsciously took them in. They were these. In the hot hello jealousy shines Othello. Love in despair, an angel in flames. While pure Desdemona waits him alone, a ghost in the air, white with his blames. Becoming suddenly aware of their import, she burst out weeping afresh, but with a very different weeping. Ah, if it might be so. Soon then had the repentant Othello, rushing after his wife, explained all and received easiest pardon. He had but killed her. Her Paul would not even do that for her. He did not love her enough for that. If she had but thrown herself indeed into the lake, then perhaps, who could tell, she might now be nearer to him than she should ever be in this world. All the time, Dorothy was much and vainly exercised as to what might become possible for the bringing of them together again. But it was not as if any misunderstanding had arisen between them. Such a difficulty might at any moment be removed by an explanation. The thing that divided them was the original misunderstanding, which lies deep and black as the pit between every soul and the soul next it, where self and not God is the final thought. The gulf is forever crossed by bright shoots of everlastingness, the lightnings of involuntary affection, but nothing less than the willed love of an infinite devotion will serve to close it. Any moment it might be lighted up from beneath and the horrible distance between them be laid bare. Into this gulf it was that with the absolute gift of himself, the Lord, doing like his father, cast himself and by such devotion alone can his disciples become fellow workers with him, help slay the evil self in the world, and rouse the holy self to like sacrifice, that the true, the eternal life of men may arise jubilant and crowned. Then is the old man of claims and rights and disputes and fears, reborn and child, whose are all things, and who claims and fears nothing. In ignorance of Faber's mood, whether he mourned over his harshness or justified himself in resentment, Dorothy could but wait, and turned herself again to think what could be done for the consolation of her friend. Could she, knowing her prayer might be one which God would not grant, urge her to pray? For herself, she knew, if there was a God, what she desired must be in accordance with his will. But if Juliet cried to him to give her back her husband, and he did not, would not the silent refusal, the deaf ear of heaven, send back the cry and settle despair upon her spirit? With her own fear, Dorothy feared for her friend. She had not yet come to see that in whatever trouble a man may find himself, the natural thing being to make his request known, his brother may heartily tell him to pray. Why, what can a man do but pray? He is here, helpless, and his origin, the breather of his soul, his God, may be somewhere. And what else should he pray about but the thing that troubles him? Not surely the thing that does not trouble him. What is the trouble there for but to make him cry? 
It is the pull of God at his being. Let a man only pray. Prayer is the sound to which not merely is the ear of the Father open, but for which that ear is listening. Let him pray for the thing he thinks he needs. For what else, I repeat, can he pray? Let a man cry for that in whose lost life is growing black. The heart of the Father is open. Only let the man know that even for his prayer, the Father will not give him a stone. But let the man pray and let God see to it how to answer him. If in his childishness and ignorance he should ask for a serpent, he will not give him a serpent. But it may yet be the Father will find some way of giving him his heart's desire. God only knows how rich God is in the power of gift. See what he has done to make himself able to give his own heart's desire. The giving of his son was as the knife with which he would divide himself among his children. He knows, he only, the heart, the needs, the deep desires, the hungry eternity of each of them all. Therefore, let every man ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and see at least what will come of it. But he will speak like one of the foolish if he say thus, Let God hear me and give me my desire and I will trust in him. That would be to tempt the Lord as God. If a father gives his children their will instead of his, they may well turn on him again and say, Was it then the part of the father to give me a scorpion? Because not knowing what it was, I asked for it. I besought him for a fancy joy, and lo, it is a sorrow forevermore. But it may be that sometimes God indeed does so, and to such a possible complaint has this reply in himself, I gave thee what thou wouldst, because not otherwise could I teach the stiff-necked his folly. Hadst thou been patient, I would have made the thing a joy ere I gave it thee. I would have changed the scorpion into a golden beetle, set with rubies and sapphires. Have thou patience now. One thing is clear, that poor Juliet, like most women and more men, would never have begun to learn anything worth learning if she had not been brought into genuine, downright trouble. Indeed, I am not sure, but some of those who seem so good as to require no trouble are just those who have already been most severely tried. End of chapter 38「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.」Chapter 39 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. Chapter 39 Another Mind. But while the two ladies were free of all suspicion of danger, and indeed were quite safe, they were not alone in the knowledge of their secret. There was one who, for some time, had been on the track of it, and had long ago traced it with certainty to its covert. Indeed, he had all but seen into it from the first. But although to his intimate friends, known as a great, and indeed wonderful talker, he was generally regarded as a somewhat silent man, and in truth, possessed to perfection the gift of holding his tongue. Except that his outward insignificance was so great as to pass the extreme, he was not one to attract attention, but those who knew Wingfold well heard him speak of Mr. Polworth, the gatekeeper, oftener than of any other, and from what she heard him say, Dorothy had come to have a great reverence for the man, although she knew him very little. 
In returning from Nestle with Juliet by her side, Helen had taken the road through Osterfield Park. When they reached Polworth's gate, she had, as a matter of course, pulled up that they might have a talk with the keeper. He had, on the few occasions on which he caught a passing glimpse of Miss Meredith, been struck with a something in her that to him seemed to take from her beauty, that look of strangeness, namely, which every one felt, and which I imagined to have come of her consciousness of her secret, holding her back from blending with the human wave. And now, therefore, while the carriage stood, he glanced often at her countenance. From long observation, much silence, and gentle pondering, from constant illness and frequent recurrence of great suffering, from loving acceptance of the same, and hence an overflowing sympathy with every form of humanity, even that more dimly revealed in the lower animals, and especially suffering humanity, from deep acquaintance with the motions of his own spirit, and the fullest conviction that one man is as another, from the entire confidence of all who knew him, and the results of his efforts to help them, above all, from persistently dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, and thus entering into the hidden things of life from the center, whence the issues of them diverged, from all these had been developed in him, through wisest use, an insight into the natures of men, a power of reading the countenance, an apprehension of what was moving in the mind, a contact, almost for the moment a junction with the goings-on of their spirits, which at times revealed to him not only character, and prevailing purpose or drift of nature, but even the main points of a past moral history. Sometimes, indeed, he would recoil with terror from what seemed the threatened dawn in him of a mysterious power, probably latent in every soul, of reading the future of a person brought within certain points of spiritual range. What startled him, however, may have been simply an involuntary conclusion, instantaneously drawn, from the plain convergence of all the forces in and upon the individual toward a point of final deliverance or of near catastrophe. When the mortal instruments are steadily working for evil, the only hope of deliverance lies in catastrophe. When Polworth had thus an opportunity of reading Juliet's countenance, it was not wearing its usual expression. The ferment set at work in her mind by the curate's sermon had intensified the strangeness of it, even to something almost of definement, and it so arrested him that, after the ponies had darted away like birds, he stood for a whole minute in the spot and posture in which they had left him. "'I never saw Polworth look distraught before,' said the curate, and was about to ask Juliet whether she had not been bewitching him, when the far-away, miserable look of her checked him, and he dropped back into his seat in silence. But Polworth had had no sudden insight into Juliet's condition, all he had seen was that she was strangely troubled, and that with no single feeling, that there was an undecided contest in her spirit, that something was required of her which she had not yet resolved to yield. Almost the moment she vanished from his sight, it dawned upon him that she had a secret. As one knows by the signs of the heavens that the matter of a storm is in them, and must break out, so Polworth had read in Juliet's sky the inward throes of a pent convulsion. He knew something of the doctor, for he had met him again and again where he himself was trying to serve, but they had never had conversation together. Faber had not an idea of what was in the creature who represented to him one of nature's failures at man-making, while Polworth, from what he heard and saw of the doctor, knew him better than he knew himself and although the moment when he could serve him had not begun to appear, looked for such a moment to come. There was so much good in the man that his heart longed to give him something worth having. How Faber would have laughed at the notion! But Polworth felt confident that one day the friendly doctor would be led out of the miserable desert where he cropped thistles and sage and fancied himself a hero. And now in the drawn look of his wife's face, in the broken lights of her eye, in the absorption and the start, he thought he perceived the quarter whence unwelcome deliverance might be on its way, and resolved to keep attention awake for what might appear. In his inmost being he knew that the mission of man is to help his neighbors, but inasmuch as he was ready to help, he recoiled from meddling. To meddle is to destroy the holy chance. 
Meddlesomeness is the very opposite of helpfulness, for it consists in forcing yourself into another self, instead of opening yourself as a refuge to the other. They are opposite extremes, and, like all extremes, touch. It is not correct that extremes meet, they lean back to back. To Polworth, the human self was a shrine to be approached with reverence, even when he bore deliverance in his hand. Anywhere, everywhere, in the seventh heaven or the seventh hell, he could worship God with the outstretched arms of love, the bended knees of joyous adoration. But in helping his fellow, he not only worshipped, but served God, ministered, that is, to the wants of God, doing it unto him in the least of his. He knew that, as the father unresting works for the weal of men, so every son following the master son must work also. Through weakness and suffering he had learned it, but he never doubted that his work as much as his bread would be given him, never rushed out wildly snatching at something to do for God, never helped a lazy man to break stones, never preached to foxes. It was what the father gave him to do that he cared to do, and that only. It was the man next him that he helped, the neighbor in need of the help he had. He did not trouble himself greatly about the happiness of men, but when the time and the opportunity arrived in which to aid the struggling birth of the eternal bliss, the whole strength of his being responded to the call. And now, having felt a thread vibrate like a sacred spider, he sat in the center of his web of love, and waited, and watched. In proportion as the love is pure, and only in proportion to that, can such be a pure and real calling. The least speck of self will defile it. A little more may ruin its most hopeful effort. Two days after, he heard from some of the boys hurrying to the pond that Mrs. Faber was missing. He followed them, and from a spot beyond the house, looking down upon the lake, watched their proceedings. He saw them find her bonnet, a result which left him room to doubt. Almost the next moment, a wavering film of blue smoke rising from the old house caught his eye. It did not surprise him, for he knew Dorothy Drake was in the habit of going there, knew also by her face for what she went. Accustomed to seek solitude himself, he knew the relations of it. Very little had passed between them. Sometimes two persons are like two drops running alongside of each other down a window-pane. One marvels how it is they can so long escape running together. Persons fit to be bosom friends will meet and part for years, and never say much beyond good morning and good night. But he bethought him that he had not before known her light of fire, and the day certainly was not a cold one. Again, how was it that, with the cries of the boys in her ears, searching for a sight of the body in her very garden, she had never come from the house, or even looked from a window? Then it came to his mind what a place for concealment the old house was. He knew every corner of it, and thus he arrived at what was almost the conviction that Mrs. Faber was there. When a day or two had passed, he was satisfied that, for some reason or other, she was there for refuge. The reason must be a good one, else Dorothy would not be aiding, and it must, of course, have to do with her husband. He next noted how, for some time, Dorothy never went through his gate, although he saw reason to believe she went to the old house every day. After a while, however, she went through it every day. They always exchanged a few words as she passed, and he saw plainly enough that she carried a secret. By and by he began to see the hover of words unuttered about her mouth. She wished to speak something, but could not quite make up her mind to it. He would sometimes meet her look with the corresponding look of, Well, what is it? But thereupon she would invariably seem to change her mind, would bid him good morning, and pass on. End of chapter 39 This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 40 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Or Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. A Desolation. When Faber at length returned to Glaston, his friends were shocked at his appearance. Either the hand of the Lord, or the hand of crushing chance, had been very heavy upon him. A pale, haggard, worn, enfeebled man, with an eye of suffering, and a look that shrunk from question, he repaired to his desolate house. In the regard of his fellow townsmen, he was as Job appeared to the eyes of his friends, and some of them, who knew no more of religion than the sound of its name, pitied him, that he had not the comfort of it. All Glaston was tender to him. He walked feebly, seldom showed the ghost of a smile, and then only from kindness, never from pleasure. His face was now almost as white as that of his lost Juliet. His brother doctors behaved with brotherly truth. They had attended to all his patients, poor as well as rich, and now insisted that he should resume his labours gradually, while they fulfilled his lack. So at first he visited only his patients in the town, for he was unable to ride, and his grand old horse, Ruba, in whom he trusted, and whom he would have ventured sooner to mount than Niger, was gone. For weeks he looked like a man of fifty, and although by degrees the restorative influences of work began to tell upon him, he never recovered the look of his years. Nobody tried to comfort him. Few dared, for very reverence, speak to the man who carried in him such an awful sorrow. Who would be so heartless as to counsel him to forget it? And what other counsel was there for one who refused like him? Who could have brought himself to say to him, There is loveliness yet left, and within thy reach, take the good, etc., forget the nothing that has been, in the something that may yet, for a while, avoid being nothing too, comfort thy heart with a fresh love, the time will come to forget both in the everlasting tomb of the ancient darkness. Few men would consent to be comforted in accordance with their professed theories of life, and more than most would Faber, at this period of his suffering, have scorned such truth for comfort. As it was, men gave him a squeeze of the hand, and women a tearful look, but from their sympathy he derived no faintest pleasure, for he knew he deserved nothing that came from heart of tenderness, not that he had begun to condemn himself for his hardness to the woman who, whatever her fault, yet honoured him by confessing it, or to bemoan her hard fate to whom a man had not been a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest of life, a shadow shelter from the scorching of her own sin. As he recovered from the double shock, and, his strength slowly returning, his work increased, bringing him again into the run of common life, his sense of desolation increased. As his head ached less, his heart ached the more, nor did the help he ministered to his fellows any longer return in comfort to himself. Hitherto his regard of annihilation had been as of something so distant that its approach was relatively by degrees infinitesimal. But as the days went on, he began to derive a grey consolation from the thought that he must at length cease to exist. He would not hasten the end, he would be brave and see the play out. Only it was all so dull. If a woman looked kindly at him, if for a moment it gave him pleasure, the next it was an arrow in his heart. What a white splendour was vanished from his life! Where were those great liquid orbs of radiating darkness? Where was that smile with its flash of whiteness? that form so lithe, yet so stately, so perfect in modulation? Where were those hands and feet that spoke without words, and took their own way with his heart? Those arms! 
his being shook to its centre. One word of tenderness and forgiveness, and all would have been his own still. But on what terms? Of dishonour and falsehood, he said, and grew hard again. He was sorry for Juliet, but she and not he was to blame. She had ruined his life as well as lost her own, and his was the harder case, for he had to live on, and she had taken with her all the good the earth had for him. She had been the sole object of his worship. He had acknowledged no other divinity. She was the loveliness of all things, but she had dropped from her pedestal, and gone down in the sea that flows, waveless and windless, and silent around the worlds. Alas for life! But he would bear on till its winter came. The years would be as tedious as hell, but nothing that ends can be other than brief. Not willingly even yet would he fail of what work was his. The world was bad enough. He would not leave it worse than he had found it. He would work life out that he might die in peace. Fame truly there was none for him, but his work would not be lost. The wretched race of men would suffer a little the less that he had lived. Poor comfort, if more of health but ministered to the potency of such anguish as now borrowed in him like a mole of fire. There had been a time when, in the young pathos of things, he would shut his eyes that the sunset might not wound him so sore. Now, as he rode homeward into the fronting sunset, he felt nothing, cared for nothing, only ached with a dull aching through body and soul. He was still kind to his fellows, but the glow of the kindness had vanished, and truest thanks hardly waked the slightest thrill. He very seldom saw Wingfold now, and less than ever was inclined towards his doctrine. For had it not been through him, this misery had come upon him. Had he not, with the confidence of all the sciences, uttered the merest dreams as eternal truths? How could poor Juliet help supposing he knew the things he asserted, and taking them for facts? The human heart was the one unreasonable thing, sighing ever after that which is not. Sprung from nothing, it yet desired a creator, at least some hearts did so, his did not, he knew better. There was, of course, no reason in this. Was the thing not a fact which she had confessed? Was he not a worshipper of fact? Did he not even dignify it with the name of truth? And could he wish his wife had kept the miserable fact to herself, leaving him to his fool's paradise of ignorance? Why then should he feel resentment against the man whose teaching had only compelled her to confess it? But the thing was out of the realm of science and its logic. Sometimes he grew fierce, and determined to face every possible agony, endure all, and dominate his misery. But ever and anon it returned with its own disabling sickness, bringing the sense of the unendurable. Of his own motion he saw nobody except in his practice. He studied hard, even to weariness and faintness, contrived strange experiments, and caught, he believed, curious peeps into the house of life. Upon them he founded theories as wild as they were daring, and hobnobbed with death and corruption. But life is at the will of the Maker, and misery cannot kill it. By degrees a little composure returned, and the old keen look began to revive. But there were wrinkles on the forehead that had hitherto been smooth as ivory. Furrows, the dry watercourses of sorrow, appeared on his cheeks, and a few silvery threads glinted in his hair. His step was heavy, and his voice had lost its ring, the cheer was out of it. He no more obtruded his opinions, for, 
as I have said, he shrunk from all interchange, but he held to them as firmly as ever. He was not to be driven from the truth by suffering, but there was a certain strange movement in his spirit of which he took no note, a feeling of resentment as if against a god that yet did not exist, for making upon him the experiment whether he might not by oppression be driven to believe in him. When Dorothy knew of his return, and his ways began to show that he intended living just as before his marriage, the time seemed come for telling Juliet of the accident and his recovery from the effects of it. She went into violent hysterics, and the moment she could speak blamed Dorothy bitterly for not having told her before. "'It is all your lying religion,' she said. "'Your behaviour, Juliet,' answered Dorothy, putting on the matron and speaking with authority, "'shows plainly how right I was. You were not to be trusted, and I knew it. Had I told you, you would have rushed to him and been anything but welcome. He would not even have known you, and you would have been too on the doctor's hands. You would have made everything public, and when your husband came to himself, would probably have been the death of him after all. He may have begun to think more kindly of me by that time, said Juliet, humbled a little. We must not act on mayhaves, answered Dorothy. You say he looks wretched now, suggested Juliet. And well he may, after concussion of the brain, not to mention what preceded it, said Dorothy. She had come to see that Juliet required very plain speaking. She had so long practised the art of deceiving herself that she was skilful at it. Indeed, but for the fault she had committed, she would all her life long have been given to petting and pitying, justifying and approving of herself. One cannot help sometimes feeling that the only chance for certain persons is to commit some fault sufficient to shame them out of the self-satisfaction in which they burrow. A fault, if only it be great and plain enough to exceed their powers of self-justification, may then be of God's mercy, not indeed an angel of light to draw them, but verily a goblin of darkness to terrify them out of themselves. For the powers of darkness are his servants also, though incapable of knowing it. He who is first and last can, even of those that love the lie, make slaves of the truth. And they who will not be sons shall be slaves. Let them rant and wear crowns as they please in the slaves' quarters. You must not expect him to get over such a shock all at once, said Dorothy. It may be, she continued, that you were wrong in running away from him. I do not pretend to judge between you, but perhaps, after the injury you had done him, you ought to have left it with him to say what you were to do next. By taking it in your own hands, you may have only added to the wrong. And who helped me? returned Juliet in a tone of deep reproach. Helped you to run from him, Juliet? Really, as if you were in the habit of behaving to your husband as you do to me. She checked herself, and resumed calmly. You forget the facts of the case, my dear. So, far from helping you to run from him, I stopped you from running so far that neither could he find you, nor you return to him again. But now we must make the best of it by waiting. We must find out whether he wants you again, or your absence is a relief to him. If I had been a man, I should have been just as wild as he. She had seen in Juliet some signs that self-abhorrence was wanting, and self-pity reviving, and she would connive at no unreality in her treatment of herself. She was one thing when bowed to the earth in misery and shame, and quite another if thinking herself hardly used on all sides. 
it was a strange position for a young woman to be in that of watcher over the marriage relations of two persons to neither of whom she could be a friend otherwise than ab extra ere long she began almost to despair day after day she heard or saw that faber continued sunk in himself and how things were going there she could not tell was he thinking about the wife he had lost or brooding over the wrong she had done him there was the question and who was to answer it at the same time she was all but certain that things being as they were any reconciliation that might be effected would owe itself merely to the raising as it were of the dead and the root of bitterness would soon trouble them afresh if but one of them had begun the task of self-conquest there would be hope for both but of such a change there was in juliet as yet no sign dorothy then understood her position it was wonderful with what clearness but solitary necessity is a hot sun to ripen what was she to do to what quarter could she to any quarter look for help naturally she thought first of mr wingfold but she did not feel at all sure that he would consent to receive a communication upon any other understanding than that he was to act in the matter as he might see best and would it be right to acquaint him with the secret of another when possibly he might feel bound to reveal it besides if he had kept it hid the result might be blame to him and blame she reasoned although a small matter in regard to one like herself might in respect of a man in the curate's position involve serious consequences while she thus reflected it came into her mind with what enthusiasm she had heard him speak of mr polworth attributing to him the beginnings of all enlightenment he had himself ever received without this testimony she would not have once thought of him indeed she had been more than a little doubtful of him for she had never felt attracted to him and from her knowledge of the unhealthy religious atmosphere of the chapel had got unreasonably suspicious of cant she had not had experience enough to distinguish with any certainty the speech that comes from the head and that which comes out of the fullness of the heart a man must talk out of that which is in him his well must give out the water of its own spring but what seems a well may be only a cistern and the water by no means living water what she had once or twice heard him say had rather repelled than drawn her but dorothy had faith and mr wingfold had spoken might she tell him ought she not to seek his help would he keep the secret could he help if he would was he indeed as wise as they said in the meantime little as she thought it polworth had been awaiting a communication from her but when he found that the question whose presence was so visible in her whole bearing neither died nor bore fruit he began to think whether he might not help her to speak the next time therefore that he opened the gate to her he held in his hand a little bud he had just broken from a monthly rose it was a hard little button upon which the green leaves of its calyx clung as if choking it what is the matter with this bud do you think miss drake he asked that you have plucked it she answered sharply throwing a suspicious glance in his face no that cannot be it he answered with a quiet smile of intelligence it has been just as you see it for the last three days i only plucked it at the moment i saw you coming then the frost has caught it the frost has caught it he answered but i am not quite sure whether the cause of its death was not rather its own life than the frost i don't see what you mean by that mr polworth said dorothy doubtfully and with a feeling of discomfort 
I admit it sounds paradoxical, returned the little man. What I mean is that the struggle of the life in it to unfold itself, rather than anything else, was the cause of its death. But the frost was the cause of its not being able to unfold itself, said Dorothy. That I admit, said Polworth, and perhaps a weaker life in the flower would have yielded sooner. I may have carried too far an analogy I was seeking to establish between it and the human art, in which repression is so much more dangerous than mere oppression. Many a heart has withered like my poor little bud, because it did not know its friend when it saw him. Dorothy was frightened. He knew something, or did he only suspect? Perhaps he was merely guessing at her religious troubles, wanting to help her. She must answer carefully. I have no doubt you are right, Mr. Polworth, she said, but there are some things it is not wise, and other things it would not be right to speak about. Quite true, he answered. I did not think it wise to say anything sooner, but now I venture to ask how the poor lady does. What lady? returned Dorothy, dreadfully startled, and turning white. Mrs. Faber, answered Polworth, with the utmost calmness. Is she not still at the old house? Is it known, then? faltered Dorothy. To nobody but myself, as far as I'm aware, replied the gatekeeper. And how long have you known it? From the very day of her disappearance, I may say. Why didn't you let me know sooner? said Dorothy, feeling aggrieved, as she would have found it hard to show wherein lay the injury. For more reasons than one, answered Polworth, but one will be enough. You did not trust me. It was well, therefore, to let you understand I could keep a secret. I let you know now only because I see you are troubled about her. I fear you have not got her to take any comfort, poor lady. Dorothy stood silent, gazing down with big, frightened eyes at the strange creature who looked steadfastly up at her, from under what seemed a huge hat, for his head was as large as that of a tall man. He seemed to be reading her very thoughts. I can trust you, Miss Drake, he resumed. If I did not, I should have at once acquainted the authorities with my suspicions, for, you will observe, you are hiding from a community a fact which it is a right to know. But I have faith enough in you to believe that you are only waiting a fit time, and have good reasons for what you do. If I can give you any help, I am at your service. He took off his big hat, and turned away into the house. Dorothy stood fixed for a moment or two longer, then walked slowly away, with her eyes on the ground. Before she reached the old house, she had made up her mind to tell Polworth as much as she could without betraying Juliet's secret, and to ask him to talk to her, for which she would contrive an opportunity. For some time she had been growing more anxious every day. No sign of change showed in any quarter. No way opened through the difficulties that surrounded them, while these were greatly added to by the likelihood appearing that another life was on its way into them. What was to be done? How was she in her ignorance so to guard the hopeless wife that motherhood might do something to console her? She had two lives upon her hands, and did indeed want counsel. The man who knew their secret already, the minor prophet she had heard the curate call him, might at least help her to the next step she must take. Juliet's mental condition was not at all encouraging. She was often ailing and peevish, behaving as if she owed Dorothy grudge instead of gratitude, and indeed, to herself, Dorothy would remark that if nothing more came out of it than seemed likely now, 
Juliet would be under no very ponderous obligation to her. She found it more and more difficult to interest her in anything. After Othello, she did not read another play. Nothing pleased her but to talk about her husband. If Dorothy had seen him, Juliet had endless questions to put to her about him, and when she had answered as many of them as she could, she would put them all over again afresh. On one occasion, when Dorothy could not say she believed he was, when she saw him thinking about his wife, Juliet went into hysterics. She was growing so unmanageable that if Dorothy had not partially opened her mind to Polworth, she must at last have been compelled to give her up. The charge was wearing her out. Her strength was giving way, and her temper growing so irritable that she was ashamed of herself, and all without any good to Juliet. Twice she hinted at letting her husband know where she was, but Juliet, although on both occasions she had a moment before been talking as if Dorothy alone prevented her from returning to him, fell on her knees in wild distress and entreated her to bear with her. The smallest approach of the idea toward actuality, the recollection rushed scorching back of how she had implored him, how she had humbled herself, soul and body, before him, how he had turned from her with loathing, would not put forth a hand to lift her from destruction and to restore her to peace, had left her naked on the floor, nor once returned to ask the spotted princess how she fares, and she shrunk with agony from any real thought of again supplicating his mercy. Presently another difficulty began to show in the near distance. Mr. Drake, having made up his mind as to the alterations he would have effected, had begun to think there was no occasion to put off till the spring, and talked of commencing work in the house at no distant day. Dorothy, therefore, proposed to Juliet that, as it was impossible to conceal her there much longer, she should go to some distant part of the country, where she would contrive to follow her. But the thought of moving further from her husband, whose nearness, though she dared not seek him, seemed her only safety, was frightful to Juliet. The wasting anxiety she caused Dorothy did not occur to her. Sorrow is not selfish, but many persons are in sorrow entirely selfish. It makes them so important in their own eyes that they seem to have a claim upon all that people can do for them. To the extent, therefore, of what she might herself have known without Juliet's confession, Dorothy, driven to her wit's end, resolved to open the matter to the gatekeeper, and accordingly, one evening on her way home, called at the lodge and told Polworth where and in what condition she had found Mrs. Faber, and what she had done with her, that she did not think it the part of a friend to advise her to return to her husband at present, that she would not herself hear of returning, that she had no comfort, and her life was a burden to her, and that she could not possibly keep her concealed much longer, and did not know what next to do. Polworth answered only that he must make the acquaintance of Mrs. Faber. If that could be effected, he believed he should be able to help them out of their difficulties. Between them, therefore, they must arrange a plan for his meeting her. End of chapter 40「the old garden. The next morning, Juliet, walking listlessly up and down the garden, 
turned the corner of a yew hedge and came suddenly upon a figure that might well have appeared one of the kobolds of german legend he was digging slowly but steadily crooning a strange song so low that until she saw him she did not hear him she started back in dismay the kobold neither raised his head nor showed other sign than the ceasing of his song that he was aware of her presence slowly and steadily he went on with his work he was trenching the ground deep still throwing the earth from the bottom to the top juliet concluding he was deaf and the ceasing of his song accidental turned softly and would have retreated but polworth so far from being deaf heard better than most people his senses indeed had been sharpened by his infirmities all but those of taste and smell which were fitful now dull and now exquisitely keen at the first movement breaking the stillness into which consternation had cast her he spoke can you guess what i'm doing mrs faber he said throwing up a spadeful and a glance together like a man who could spare no time from his work juliet's heart got in the way and she could not answer him she felt much as a ghost wandering through a house might feel if suddenly addressed by the name she had borne in the old days while yet she was clothed in the garments of the flesh could it be that this man led such a retired life that although living so near glaston and seeing so many at his gate he had yet never heard that she had passed from the ken of the living or could it be that dorothy had betrayed her she stood quaking the situation was strange before her was a man who did not seem to know that what he knew concerning her was a secret from all the world besides and with that she had a sudden insight into the consequence of the fact of her existence coming to her husband's knowledge would it not add to his contempt and scorn to know that she was not even dead would he not at once conclude that she had been contriving to work on his feelings that she had been speculating on his repentance counting upon and awaiting such a return of his old fondness as would make him forget all her faults and prepare him to receive her again with delight but she must answer the creature ill could she afford to offend him but what was she to say she had utterly forgotten what he had said to her she stood staring at him unable to speak it was but for a few moments but they were long as minutes and as she gazed it seemed as if the strange being in the trench had dug his way up from the lower parts of the earth bringing her secret with him and come to ask her questions what an earthy yet unearthly look he had almost for the moment she believed the ancient rumours of other races than those of mankind that shared the earth with them but led such differently conditioned lives that in the course of ages only a scanty few of the unblending natures crossed each other's path to stand a stare in mutual astonishment polworth went on digging nor once looked up after a little while he resumed in the most natural way speaking as if he had known her well mr drake and i were talking some weeks ago about a certain curious little old-fashioned flower in my garden at the back of the lodge he asked me if i could spare him a root of it i told him i could spare him anything he would like to have but that i would gladly give him every flower in my garden roots and all if he would but let me dig three yards square in his garden at the old house and have all that came up of itself for a year he paused again juliet neither spoke nor moved he dug rather feebly for a gnome with panting asthmatic breath 
Perhaps you are not aware, ma'am, he began again, and ceasing his labour, stood up, leaning on the spade, which was nearly as high as himself. That many of the seeds which fall upon the ground do not grow, yet, strange to tell, retain the power of growth. I suspect myself, but have not had the opportunity of testing the conjecture that such fall in their pots or shells, and that before these are sufficiently decayed to allow the sun and moisture and air to reach them, they have got covered up in the soil too deep for those same influences. They say fishes a long time bedded in ice will come to life again. I cannot tell about that, but it is well enough known that if you dig deep in any old garden such as this, ancient, perhaps forgotten flowers will appear. The fashion has changed. They have been neglected or uprooted, but all the time their life is hid below, and the older they are, the nearer, perhaps, to their primary idea. By this time she was far more composed, though not yet had she made up her mind what to say, or how to treat the dilemma in which she found herself. After a brief pause, therefore, he resumed again. I don't fancy, he said with a low asthmatic laugh, that we shall have many forgotten weeds come up. They all, I suspect, keep pretty well in the sun. But just think how the fierce digging of the crisis to which the great husbandman every now and then leads a nation brings back to the surface its old forgotten flowers. What virtues, for instance, the revolution brought to light as even yet in the nature of the corrupted nobility of France. What a peculiar goblin it is, thought Juliet, beginning to forget herself a little in watching and listening to the strange creature. She had often seen him before, but had always turned from him with a kind of sympathetic shame. Of course, the poor creature could not bear to be looked at. He must know himself improper. I have sometimes wondered, Polworth yet again resumed, whether the troubles without end that some people seem born to, I do not mean those they bring upon themselves, may not be as subsoil ploughs, tearing deep into the family mould, that the seeds of the lost virtues of their race may in them be once more brought within reach of sun and air and dew, it would be a pleasant, hopeful thought, if one might hold it, would it not, ma'am? It would indeed, answered Juliet with a sigh, which rose from an undefined feeling that, if some hidden virtue would come up in her, it would be very welcome. How many people would like to be good, if only they might be good without taking trouble about it? They do not like goodness, well enough to hunger and thirst after it, or to sell all that they have that they may buy it. They will not batter at the gate of the kingdom of heaven, but they look with pleasure on this or that aerial castle of righteousness, and think it would be rather nice to live in it. They do not know that it is goodness all the time their very being is pining after, and that they are starving their nature of its necessary food. Then Polworth's idea turned itself round in Juliet's mind, and grew clearer, but assumed a reference to weeds only, and not flowers. She thought how that fault of hers had, like the seed of a poison plant, been buried for years, unknown to one alive, and forgotten almost by herself, so diligently forgotten indeed, that it seemed to have gradually slipped away over the horizon of her existence. And now, here it was at the surface again, in all its horror and old reality. Not that, merely, for already it had blossomed and borne its rightful fruit of dismay, an evil pod filled with a sickening juice and swarming with grey flies. But she must speak, and if possible, prevent the odd creature from going and publishing in Glaston 
that he had seen Mrs. Faber, and she was at the old house. How did you know I was here? she asked abruptly. How do you know that I knew, ma'am? returned Polworth, in a tone which took from the words all appearance of rudeness. You are not in the least surprised to see me, she answered. A man, returned the dwarf, who keeps his eyes open may almost cease to be surprised at anything. In my time I have seen so much that is wonderful. In fact, everything seems to me so wonderful that I hardly expect to be surprised any more. He said this, desiring to provoke conversation. But Juliet took the answer for an evasive one, and it strengthened her suspicion of Dorothy. She was getting tired of her. Then there was only one thing left. The minor prophet had betaken himself again to his work, delving deeper and throwing slow spadeful after spadeful to the surface. "'Miss Drake told you I was here,' said Juliet. "'No, indeed, Mrs. Faber, no one told me,' answered Polworth. "'I learned it for myself. I could hardly help finding it out.' "'Then, then, does everybody know it?' she faltered, her heart sinking within her at the thought. "'Indeed, ma'am, so far as I know, not a single person is aware you are alive, except Miss Trake and myself.' I have not even told my niece who lives with me, and who can keep a secret as well as myself. Juliet breathed a great sigh of relief. Will you tell me why you have kept it so secret? she asked. Because it was your secret, ma'am, not mine. But you were under no obligation to keep my secret. How do you justify such a frightful statement as that, ma'am? Why? What could it matter to you? Everything. I do not understand. You have no interest in me. You could have no inducement. On the contrary, I had the strongest inducement. I saw that an opportunity might come of serving you. But that is just the unintelligible thing to me. There is no reason why you should wish to serve me, said Juliet thinking to get at the bottom of some design. There you mistake, ma'am. I am under the most absolute and imperative obligation to serve you, the greatest under which any being can find himself. What a ridiculous, crooked little monster, said Juliet to herself, but she began the same moment to think whether she might not turn the creature's devotion to good account she might at all events ensure his silence. Would you be kind enough to explain yourself? she said, now also interested in the continuance of the conversation. I would at once, replied Polworth, had I sufficient ground for hoping you would understand my explanation. I do not know that I am particularly stupid, she returned, with a wan smile. I aver to the contrary said Polworth, yet I cannot help greatly doubting whether you will understand what I am now going to tell you, for I will tell you, on the chance I have no secrets, that is, of my own, I am one of those, Mrs. Faber, he went on, after a moment's pause, but his voice neither became more solemn in tone, nor did he cease his digging, although it got slower. Who? against the non-evidence of their senses, believe there is a master of men, the one master, a right perfect man, who demands of them and lets them know in themselves the rectitude of the demand that they also be right and true men, that is, true brothers to their brothers and sisters of mankind. It is recorded too, and I believe it, that this master said that any service rendered to one of his people was rendered to himself. Therefore, for the love of his will, even if I had no sympathy with you, Mrs. Faber, I should feel bound to help you, 
as you cannot believe me interested in yourself, I must tell you that to betray your secret for the satisfaction of a love of gossip would be a sin against my highest joy, against my own hope, against the heart of God, from which your being and mine draws the life of its every moment. Juliet's heart seemed to turn sick at the thought of such a creature claiming brotherhood with her. That it gave ground for such a claim seemed for the moment an irresistible argument against the existence of a god. In her countenance, Polworth read at once that he had blundered, and a sad, noble, humble smile irradiated his. It had its effect on Juliet. She would be generous and forgive his presumption. She knew dwarfs were always conceited, that wise nature had provided them with high thoughts wherewith to add the missing cubit to their stature. What repulsive things Christianity taught! Her very flesh recoiled from the poor ape. "'I trust you are satisfied, ma'am,' the cobbled added, after a moment's vain expectation of a word from Juliet, "'that your secret is safe with me.' "'I am,' answered Juliet, with a condescending motion of her stately neck, saying to herself in feeling, if not in conscious thought, "'After all, he is hardly human. I may accept his devotion as I would that of a dog.' The moment she had thus far yielded, she began to long to speak of her husband. Perhaps he can tell her something of him. At least he could talk about him. She would have been eager to look upon his reflection, had it been possible, in the mind of a dog that loved him. She would turn the conversation in a direction that might find him. "'But I do not see,' she went on, "'how you, Mr. Polworth, I think that is your name, how you can, consistently, with your principles, excuse me, ma'am, I cannot even by silence seem to admit that you know anything whatever of my principles. Oh, she returned, with a smile of generous confession, I was brought up to believe as you do. That but satisfies me that, for the present, you are incapable of knowing anything of my principles. I do not wonder at your thinking so, she returned, with the condescension of superior education, as she supposed, and yet with the first motion of an unconscious respect for the odd little monster. He, with wheezing chest, went on throwing up the deep, damp, fresh earth, to him smelling of marvellous things. Ruth would have ached all over to see him working so hard. Still— Juliet went on, supposing your judgment of me correct, that only makes it the stranger you should imagine that in serving such a one you are pleasing him you call your master. He says, Whosoever denies him before men, he will deny before the angels of God. What my Lord says he will do, he will do, as he meant it when he said it. What he tells me to do, I try to understand and do. Now he has told me, of all things, not to say that good comes of evil. He condemned that in the Pharisees as the greatest of crimes. When, therefore, I see a man like your husband, helping his neighbours, near and far, being kind, indeed loving, and good-hearted to all men. Here a great sigh, checked and broken into many little ones, came in a tremulous chain from the bosom of the wife. I am bound to say that man is not scattering his master abroad. He is indeed opposing him in words. He speaks against the son of man, but that the son of man himself says shall be forgiven him. If I mistake in this to my own master, I stand or fall. How can he be his master? if he does not acknowledge him. Because the very tongue with which he denies him is yet his. I am the master of the flowers that will now grow by my labour, though not one of them will know me. How much more must he be the master of the men he has called into being, though they do not acknowledge him? 
if the story of the gospel be a true one, as with my heart and soul and all that is in me I believe it is, then Jesus of Nazareth is Lord and Master of Mr. Faber, and for him not to acknowledge it is to fall from the summit of his being. To deny one's master is to be a slave. You are very polite, said Mrs. Faber, and turned away. She recalled her imaginary danger, however, and turning again said, But though I differ from you in opinion, Mr. Polworth, I quite recognise you as no common man, and put you upon your honour with regard to my secret. Had you entrusted me with your secret, ma'am, the phrase would have had more significance. But, obeying my master, I do not require to think of my own honour. Those who do not acknowledge their master cannot afford to forget it. But if they do not learn to obey him, they will find by the time they have got through what they call life, they have left themselves little honour to boast of. He has guessed my real secret, thought poor Juliet, and turning away in confusion, without a word of farewell, went straight into the house. But before Dorothy, who had been on the watch at the top of the slope, came in, she had begun to hope that the words of the forward, disagreeable, conceited dwarf had in them nothing beyond a general remark. When Dorothy entered, she instantly accused her of treachery. Dorothy, repressing her indignation, begged she would go with her to Polworth, but when they reached the spot, the gnome had vanished. He had been digging only for the sake of the flowers buried in Juliet, and had gone home to lie down. His bodily strength was exhausted, but will and faith and purpose never forsook the soul cramped up in that distorted frame. When greatly suffering, he would yet suffer with his will, not merely resigning himself to the will of God, but desiring the suffering that God willed. When the wearied soul could no longer keep the summit of the task, when not strength merely, but the consciousness of faith and duty failed him, he would cast faith and strength and duty all his being into the gulf of the Father's will and simply suffer, no longer trying to feel anything, waiting only until the life should send him light. Dorothy turned to Juliet. You might have asked Mr. Polworth, Juliet, whether I had betrayed you, she said. Now I think of it, he did say you had not told him. But how was I to take the word of a creature like that? Juliet, said Dorothy, very angry, I begin to doubt if you were worth taking the trouble for. She turned from her and walked toward the house. Juliet rushed after her and caught her in her arms. Forgive me, Dorothy, she cried. I'm not in my right senses. I do believe. What is to be done? Now this man knows it. Things are no worse than they were said Dorothy, as quickly appeased as angered. On the contrary, I believe we have the only one to help us who is able to do it. Why, what am I to do with you when my father sends the carpenters and bricklayers to the house? They will be into every corner. He talks of commencing next week, and I am at my wit's end. Oh, don't forsake me, Dorothy, after all you have done for me cried Juliet. If you turn me out, there never was creature in the world so forlorn as I shall be, absolutely helpless, Dorothy. I will do all I can for you, my poor Juliet, but if Mr. Polworth do not think of some way, I don't know what will become of us. You don't know what you are guilty of in despising him. Mr. Wingfold speaks of him as far the first man in Glaston. Certainly Mr. Wingfold, Mr. Drew, and some others of the best men in the place did think him, of those they knew, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Glaston was altogether of a different opinion. 
which was the right opinion must be left to the measuring rod that shall finally be applied to the statues of men. The history of the kingdom of heaven, need I say, I mean a very different thing from what is called church history, is the only history that will ever be able to show itself a history that can ever come to be thoroughly written or to be read with a clear understanding, for it alone will prove able to explain itself, while in doing so it will explain all other attempted histories as well. Many of those who will then be found first in the eternal record may have been of little regard in the eyes of even their religious contemporaries, may have been absolutely unknown to generations that came after, and were yet the men of life and potency, working as light, as salt, as leaven in the world, when the real worth of things is, over all, the measure of their estimation, then is the kingdom of God and his Christ. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 42 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. The Pottery. It had been a very dry autumn, and the periodical rains had been long delayed so that the minister had been able to do much for the houses he had bought, called the pottery. There had been but just rain enough to reveal the advantage of the wall he had built to compel the water to keep the wider street. Thoroughly dry and healthy, it was impossible to make them, at least in the time, but it is one thing to have the water all about the place you stand on, and another to be up to the knees in it. Not at that point only, however, but at every spot where the water could enter freely, he had done what he could provisionally for the defence of his poor colony. For, alas, how much among the well-to-do, in town or city, are the poor like colonists only? And he had great hopes of the result. Stone and brick and cement he had used freely, and one or two of the people about began to have a glimmering idea of the use of money after a gospel fashion, that is, for thorough work where and because it was needed. The curate was full of admiration and sympathy, but the whole thing gave great dissatisfaction to others, not a few, for, as the currents of inundation would be somewhat altered in direction and increased in force by his obstructions, it became necessary for several others also to add to the defences of their property. And this, of course, was felt to be a grievance. Their personal inconveniences were like the shilling that hides the moon, and, in the resentment they occasioned, blinded their hearts to the seriousness of the evils from which their merely temporary annoyance was the deliverance of their neighbours. A fancy of prescriptive right in their own comforts outweighed all the long and heavy sufferings of the others. Why should not their neighbours continue miserable when they had been miserable all their lives hitherto? Those who, on the contrary, had been comfortable all their lives and liked it so much ought to continue comfortable even at their expense. Why not let it alone? Or, if people would be so unreasonable as to want to be comfortable too, when nobody cared a straw about them, let them make themselves comfortable, without annoying those superior beings who had been comfortable all the time. Persons who, consciously or unconsciously, reason thus, would do well to read, with a little attention, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, wherein, it seems recognised that a man's having been used to a thing may be just the reason, not for the continuance, but for the alteration of his condition. 
in the present case, the person who most found himself aggrieved was the dishonest butcher. A piece of brick wall, which the minister had built in contact with the wall of his yard, would indubitably cause such a rise in the water at the descent into the area of his cellar that, in order to its protection in a moderate flood, in a great one the cellar was always filled, the addition to its defence of two or three more rows of bricks would be required, carrying a correspondent diminution of air and light. It is one of the punishments overtaking those who wrong their neighbours that not only do they feel more keenly than others any injury done to themselves, but they take many things for injuries that do not belong to the category. It was but a matter of a few shillings at the most, but the man who did not scruple to charge the less careful of his customers for undelivered ounces, gathering to pounds and pounds of meat, resented bitterly the necessity of the outlay. He knew, or ought to have known, that he had but to acquaint the minister with the fact to have the thing set right at once. But the minister had found him out, and he therefore much preferred the possession of his grievance to its removal. To his friends he regretted that a minister of the gospel should be so corrupted by the mammon of unrighteousness as to use it against members of his own church. That, he said, was not the way to make friends with it. But, on the pretense of a Christian spirit, he avoided showing Mr. Drake any sign of his resentment. For the face of his neighbours shames a man whose heart condemns him, but shames him not. He restricted himself to grumbling, and brooded to counterplot the mischiefs of the minister. What right had he to injure him for the sake of the poor? Was it not written in the Bible, Thou shalt not favour the poor man in his cause? Was it not written also, For every man shall bear his own burden? That was common sense. He did his share in supporting the poor that were church members, but was he to suffer for improvements on Drake's property for the sake of a pack of roughs? Let him be charitable at his own cost, etc., etc. Self is prolific in argument. It suited Mr. Drake well, notwithstanding his church republican theories, against which, in the abstract, I could ill object, seeing the whole current of Bible teaching is toward the God-inspired ideal commonwealth. It suited a man like Mr. Drake well, I say, to be an autocrat, and was a most happy thing for his tenants, for certainly no other system of government than a wise autocracy will serve in regard to the dwellings of the poor. And already, I repeat, he had effected not a little. Several new cottages had been built, and one incorrigible old one pulled down. But it had dawned upon him that, however desirable it may be on a dry hillside, on such a foundation as this a cottage was the worst form of human dwelling that could be built. For when the whole soil was in time of rain like a full sponge, every room upon it was little better than a hollow in a cloud, and the right thing must be to reduce contact with the soil as much as possible. One high house, therefore, with many stories and stone feet to stand upon, must be the proper kind of building for such a situation. He must lift the first house from the water, and set as many more houses as convenient upon it. He had therefore already so far prepared for the building of such a house as should lift a good many families far above all deluge. That is, he had dug the foundation, and deep, to get at the more solid ground. In this he had been precipitate, as not unfrequently in his life, for when he was yet meditating whether he should not lay the foundation altogether solid of the unporous stone of the neighbourhood, the rains began, and there was the great hole to stand all the winter full of water in the middle of the cottages. The weather cleared again, but after a St. Martin's summer unusually prolonged, 
the rain came down in terrible earnest. Day after day, the clouds condensed, grew water, and poured like a squeezed sponge. A wet November indeed it was, wet overhead, wet underfoot, wet all round, and the rivers rose rapidly. When the Lithy rose beyond a certain point, it overflowed into a hollow, hardly a valley, and thereby a portion of it descended almost straight to Glaston. Hence it came that, in a flood, the town was invaded both by the rise of the river from below and by this current from above on its way to rejoin the main body of it, and the streets were soon turned into canals. The currents of the slowly swelling river and of its temporary branch then met in Pine Street and formed not a very rapid but a heavy run at ebb tide. For Glaston, though at some distance from the mouth of the river, measuring by its course, was not far from the sea, which was visible across the green flats, a silvery line on the horizon. Landward, beyond the flats, high ground rose on all sides, and hence it was that the floods came down so deep upon Glaston. On a certain Saturday, it rained all the morning heavily, but toward the afternoon cleared a little, so that many hoped the climax had been reached, while the more experienced looked for worse. After sunset the clouds gathered thicker than before, and the rain of the day was as nothing to the torrent descending with a steady clash all night. When the slow, dull morning came, Glaston stood in the middle of a brown lake, into which water was rushing from the sky in straight, continuous lines. The prospect was discomposing. Some, too confident in the apparent change, had omitted needful precautions. In most parts none were now possible, and in many more none would have been of use. Most cellars were full, and the water was rising on the ground floors. It was a very different affair from a flood in a mountainous country, but serious enough, though without immediate danger to life. Many a person that morning stepped out of bed up to the knee in muddy water. With the first of the dawn, the curate stood peering from the window of his dressing room through the water that coursed down the pane to discover the state of the country, for the window looked inland from the skirt of the town. All was grey mist, brown water, and sheeting rain. The only things clear were that not a soul would be at church that morning, and that, though he could do nothing to divide them the bread needful for their souls, he might do something for some of their bodies. It was a happy thing it was Sunday, for having laid in their stock of bread the day before, people were not so dependent on the baker's half whose ovens must now be full of water. But most of the kitchens must be flooded, he reasoned, the firewood soaking and the coal in some cellars inaccessible. The very lucifer matches in many houses would be as useless as the tinderbox of a shipwrecked sailor. And if the rain were to cease at once, the water would yet keep rising for many hours. He turned from the window took his bath in homeopathic preparation, and then went to wake his wife. She was one of those blessed women who always open their eyes smiling. She owed very little of her power of sympathy to personal suffering. The perfection of her health might have made one who was too anxious for her spiritual growth even a little regretful. Her husband, therefore, had seldom to think of sparing her when anything had to be done. She could lose a night's sleep without the smallest injury, and stand fatigue better than most men, and in the requirements of the present necessity there would be mingled a large element of adventure, almost of frolic, full of delight to a vigorous organisation. "'What a good time of it the angels of wind and flame must have,' said the curate to himself as he went to wake her. 
what a delight to be embodied as a wind or a flame or a rushing sea. Come, Helen, my help. Glaston wants you, he said softly in her ear. She started up. What is it, Thomas? she said, holding her eyes wider open than was needful to show him she was capable. Nothing to frighten you, darling, he answered, but plenty to be done. The river is out, and the people are all asleep. Most of them will have to wait for their breakfast, I fear. We shall have no prayers this morning. But plenty of divine service, rejoined Helen, with a smile for what her aunt called one of his whims, as she got up and seized some of her garments. Take time for your bath, dear, said her husband. There will be time for that afterward, she replied. What shall I do first? Wake the servants and tell them to light the kitchen fire and make all the tea and coffee they can, but tell them to make it good. We shall get more of everything as soon as it is light. I'll go and bring the boat. I had it drawn up and moored in the ruins, ready to float yesterday. I wish I hadn't put on my shirt, though. I shall have to swim for it, I fear. I shall have one aired before you come back, said Helen. Aired? returned her husband. You had better say watered. In five minutes neither of us will have a dry stitch on. I'll take it off again and be content with my blue jersey. He hurried out into the rain. Happily there was no wind. Helen waked the servants. Before they appeared she had the fire lighted and as many utensils as it would accommodate set upon it with water. When Wingfold returned, he found her in the midst of her household, busily preparing every kind of eatable and drinkable they could lay hands upon. He had brought his boat to the churchyard and moored it between two headstones. They would have their breakfast first, for there was no saying when they might get any lunch, and food is work. Besides, there was little to be gained by rising people out of their good sleep. There was no danger yet. It is a great comfort, said the curate, as he drank his coffee, to see how Drake goes in heart and soul for his tenants. He is pompous, a little, and something of a fine gentleman. But what is that besides his great truth? That work of his is the simplest act of Christianity, of a public kind I have ever seen. But is there not a great change on him since he had his money? said Helen. He seems to me so much humbler in his carriage and simpler in his manners than before. It is quite true, replied her husband. It is mortifying to think, he went on after a little pause, how many of our clergy, from mere beggarly pride, holding their rank superior, as better accredited servants of the carpenter of Nazareth, I suppose, would look down on that man as a hedge parson. The world they caught looked down upon themselves from a yet greater height once, and may come to do so again. Perhaps the sooner the better, for then they will know which to choose. Now they serve mammon, and think they serve God. It is not quite so bad as that, surely, said Helen. If it is not worldly pride, what is it? I do not think it is spiritual pride. Few get on far enough to be much in danger of that worst of all vices. It must then be church pride, and that is the worst form of worldly pride, for it is a carrying into the kingdom of heaven of the habits and judgments of the kingdom of Satan. I am wrong. Such things cannot be imported into the kingdom of heaven. They can only be imported into the church, which is bad enough. Helen, the churchman's pride is a thing to turn a saint sick with disgust. So utterly is it at discord with the lovely human harmony he imagines himself the minister of. He is the Pharisee, it may be the good Pharisee, of the kingdom of heaven. But if the proud churchman be in the kingdom at all, it must be as one of the least in it. I don't believe one in ten who is guilty of this pride is aware of the sin of it. 
Only the other evening I heard a worthy canon say, it may have been more in joke than appeared, that he would have all dissenters burned. Now the canon would not hang one of them, but he does look down on them, all with contempt. Such miserable paltry weaknesses and wickednesses, for in a servant of the kingdom the feeling which suggests such a speech is wicked. Ah, the moth-holes in the garments of the church, the teredo in its piles, the dry rot in its floors, the scaling and crumbling of its buttresses. They do more to ruin what such men call the church, even in outward respects, than any of the rude attacks of those whom they thus despise. He who, in the name of Christ, pushes his neighbour from him is a schismatic, and that of the worst and only dangerous type. But we had better be going. It is no use telling you to take your waterproof. You'd only be giving it to the first poor woman we picked up. I may as well have the good of it till then, said Helen, and ran to fetch it, while the curate went to bring his boat to the house. When he opened the door, there was no longer a spot of earth or of sky to be seen, only water and the grey sponge filling the upper air, through which coursed multitudinous perpendicular runnels of water. Clad in a pair of old trousers and a jersey, he went wading, and where the ground dipped, swimming, to the western gate of the churchyard. In a few minutes he was at the kitchen window, holding the boat in a long painter, for the water, although quite up to the rectory walls, was not yet deep enough there to float the boat with anybody in it. The servants handed him out the great cans they used at school teas, full of hot coffee and baskets of bread, and he placed them in the boat, covering them with a tarpaulin. Then Helen appeared at the door in her waterproof, with a great fur cloak to throw over him, she said, when she took the oars, for she meant to have her share of the fun. It was so seldom there was any going on on a Sunday. How she would have shocked her aunt, and better women than she. Today, said the curate, we shall praise God with the mirth of the good old hundredth psalm, and not with the fear of the more modern version. As he spoke, he bent to his oars, and through a narrow lane the boat soon shot into Pine Street, now a wide canal banked with houses dreary and dead, save where, from an upper window, peeped out here and there a sleepy, dismayed countenance. In silence, except for the sounds of the oars and the dull rush of water everywhere, they slipped along. "'This is fun,' said Helen, where she sat and steered. "'Very quiet fun as yet,' answered the curate. "'But it will get faster by and by.' As often as he saw anyone at a window, he called out that tea and coffee would be wanted for many a poor creature's breakfast, but here they were all big houses, and he rode swiftly past them, for his business lay not where there were servants and well-stocked larders, but well there were mothers and children and old people, and little but water besides. Nor had they left Pine Street by many houses, before they came where help was right welcome. Down the first turning, a miserable cottage stood three feet deep in the water. Out jumped the curate with the painter in his hand and opened the door. On the bed, over the edge of which the water was lapping, sat a sickly young woman in her nightdress, holding her baby to her bosom. She stared for a moment with big eyes, then looked down and said nothing, but a rose tinge mounted from her heart to her pale cheek. "'Good morning, Martha,' said the curate cheerily. "'Rather damp, ain't it? Where's your husband?' "'Away looking for work, sir,' answered Martha, in a hopeless tone. "'Then he won't miss you. Come along. Give me the baby.' "'We can't come like this, sir. We ain't got no clothes on. "'Take them with you. You can't put them on. They're all wet.' Mrs. Wingfold is in the boat. 
she'll see to everything you want. The door's hardly wide enough to let the boat through, or I'd pull it close up to the bed for you to get in. She hesitated. Come along, he repeated. I won't look at you. Or, wait, I'll take the baby and come back for you. Then you won't get so wet. He took the baby from her arms and turned to the door. It ain't you as I mind, sir, said Martha, getting into the water at once and following him. No more'n my own people, but all the town'll be at the windows by this time. Never mind, we'll see to you, he returned. In half a minute more, with the help of the window sill, she was in the boat, the fur cloak wrapped about her and the baby, drinking the first cup of the hot coffee. We must take her home at once, said the curate. You said we should have fun, said Helen, the tears rushing into her eyes. She had left the tiller, and while the mother drank her coffee, was patting the baby under the cloak. But she had to betake herself to the tiller again, for the curate was not rowing straight. When they reached the rectory, the servants might all have been grandmothers from the way they received the woman and her child. Give them a warm bath together, said Helen, as quickly as possible. And stay. Let me out, Thomas. I must go and get Martha some clothes. I shan't be a minute. The next time they returned, Wingfold, looking into the kitchen, could hardly believe the sweet face he saw by the fire. So refined in its comforted sadness could be that of Martha. He thought whether the fine linen, clean and white, may not help the righteousness even of the saints a little. Their next take was a boatload of children and an old grandmother. Most of the houses had a higher story, and they took only those who had no refuge. Many more, however, drank of their coffee and ate of their bread. The whole of the morning they spent thus, calling on their passages, wherever they thought they could get help or find accommodation. By noon, a score of boats were out rendering similar assistance. The water was higher than it had been for many years, and was still rising. Faber had laid hands upon an old tub of a salmon cobble, and was the first out after the curate. But there was no fun in the poor doctor's boat. Once the curate's and his met in the middle of Pine Street, both as full of people as they could carry. Wingfold and Helen greeted Faber frankly and kindly. He returned their greeting with a solemn courtesy, rowing heavily past. By lunchtime, Helen had her house almost full, and did not want to go again, there was so much to be done. But her husband persuaded her to give him one hour more. The servants were doing so well, he said. She yielded. He rowed her to the church, taking up the sexton and his boy on their way. There the crypts and vaults were full of water. Old wood carvings and bits of ancient coffins were floating about in them, but the floor of the church was above the water. He landed Helen dry in the porch, and led her to the organ loft. Now, the organ was one of great power, seldom, indeed, large as the church was, did they venture its full force. He requested her to pull out every stop, and send the voice of the church, in full blast, into every corner of Glaston. He would come back for her in half an hour, and take her home. He desired the sexton to leave all the doors open, and remember that the instrument would want every breath of wind he and his boy could raise. He had just laid hold of his oars, when out of the porch rushed a roar of harmony that seemed to seize his boat and blow it away upon its mission like a feather. For in the delight of the music the curate never felt the arms that urged it swiftly along. After him it came pursuing and wafted him mightily on. Over the brown waters it went rolling, a grand billow of innumerable, involving and involved waves. He thought of the Spirit of God that moved on the face of the primeval waters, and out of a chaos wrought a cosmos. Wood, 
he said to himself, that ever from the church door went forth such a spirit of harmony and healing of peace and life. But the church's foes are they of her own household, who with the axes and hammers of pride and exclusiveness and vulgar priestliness break the carved work of her numberless chapels, yea, build doorless screens from floor to roof, dividing nave and choir and chancel and transepts and aisles into sections numberless, and with evil dust they raise, darken for ages the windows of her clerestory. The curate was thinking of no party, but of individual spirit. Of the priestliness I have encountered, I cannot determine whether the worse belonged to the Church of England or a certain body of dissenters. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 43 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. The Gate Lodge. Mr. Beavis had his horses put to, then taken away again, and an old hunter saddled. But halfway from home, he came to a burst bridge and had to return, much to the relief of his wife, who, when she had him in the house again, could enjoy the rain. She said, It was so cosy and comfortable to feel you could not go out or anybody call. I presume she therein seemed to take a bond of fate and doubly assure the everyday dullness of her existence. Well, she was a good creature, and doubtless a corner would be found for her up above, where a little more work would probably be required of her. Polworth and his niece Ruth rose late, for neither had slept well. When they had breakfasted, they read together from the Bible. First the uncle read the passage he had last got light upon, he was always getting light upon passages, and then the niece the passage she had last been gladdened by, after which they sat and chatted a long time by the kitchen fire. "'I am afraid your asthma was bad last night, uncle dear,' said Ruth. "'I heard your breathing every time I woke.' "'It was rather,' answered the little man. But I took my revenge and had a good crow over it. I know what you mean, uncle. Do let me hear the crow. He rose and, slowly climbing the stair to his chamber, returned with a half sheet of paper in his hand, resumed his seat, and read the following lines, which he had written in pencil when the light came Satan, avaunt! Nay, Take thine hour, thou canst not darnt, thou hast no power. Be welcome to thy nest, though it be in my breast. Burrow a main, dig like a mole, fill every vein with half burned coal, puff the keen dust about, and all to choke me out. Fill music's ways with creaking cries that no loud praise may climb the skies, and on my labouring chest lay mountains of unrest. My slumber steep in dreams of haste that only sleep, no rest I taste, with stiflings, rhymes of rote, and fingers on the throat. Satan, thy might I do defy. Live core of night, I patient lie. A wind comes up the grey, will blow thee clean away. Christ's angel, death, all radiant white, with one cold breath will scare thee quite, and give my lungs an air as fresh as answered prayer. So, Satan, do thy worst with me, until the true shall set me free, 
and end what he began by making me a man. It is not much of poetry, Ruth, he said, raising his eyes from the paper. No song of thrush or blackbird. I am ashamed that I called it a cockcrow, for that is one of the finest things in the world, a clarion defiance to darkness and sin, far too good a name for my poor jingle, except, indeed, you call it a cockin china cockcrow from out a very wheezy chest. My strength is made perfect in weakness, said Ruth, solemnly, heedless of the deprecation. To her the verses were as full of meaning as if she had made them herself. I think I like the older reading better, that is, without the my, said Polworth. Strength is made perfect in weakness. Somehow I cannot explain the feeling to hear a grand aphorism spoken in widest application as a fact of more than humanity, of all creation, from the mouth of the human God, the living wisdom, seems to bring me close to the very heart of the universe. Strength, strength itself all over, is made perfect in weakness. A law of being, you see, Ruth, not a law of Christian growth only, but a law of growth, even all the growth leading up to the Christian, which growth is the highest kind of creation. The master's own strength was thus perfected, and so must be that of his brothers and sisters. Ah, what a strength must be his! How patient in endurance! How gentle in exercise! How mighty in devotion! How fine in its issues! perfected by such suffering. Ah, my child, you suffer sorely sometimes, I know it well, but shall we not let patience have her perfect work, that we may, one day, Ruth, one day, my child, be perfect and entire, wanting nothing? Led by the climax of his tone, Ruth slipped from her stool on her knees. Polworth kneeled beside her and said, O Father of life, we praise thee that one day thou wilt take thy poor crooked creatures and give them bodies like Christ's, perfect as is, and full of thy light. Help us to grow faster, as fast as thou canst help us to grow. Help us to keep our eyes on the opening of thy hand that we may know the manner when it comes. O Lord, we rejoice that we are thy making, though thy handiwork is not very clear in our outer man as yet. We bless thee that we feel thy hand making us. What if it be in pain? Evermore we hear the voice of the potter above the hum and grind of his wheel. Father, thou only knowest how we love thee. Fashion the clay to thy beautiful will. To the eyes of men we are vessels of dishonour, but we know thou dost not despise us, for thou hast made us, and thou dwellest in us. Thou hast made us love thee, and hope in thee, and in thy love we will be brave and endure, all in good time. O Lord, amen. While they thus prayed, kneeling on the stone floor of the little kitchen, dark under the universal canopy of cloud. The rain went on clashing and murmuring all around, rushing from the eaves, and exploding with sharp hisses in the fire. And in the mingled noise they had neither heard a low tap several times repeated, nor the soft opening of the door that followed. When they rose from their knees it was therefore with astonishment they saw a woman standing motionless in the doorway, without cloak or bonnet, her dank garments clinging to her form and dripping with rain. When Juliet woke that morning, she cared little that the sky was dull and the earth dark. A selfish sorrow, a selfish love even, makes us stupid, and Juliet had been growing more and more stupid. Many people, it seems to me, through sorrow, endured perforce, and without a gracious submission, 
slowly sink in the scale of existence. Such are some of those middle-aged women who might be the very strength of social well-being, but have no aspiration, and hope only downward, after rich husbands for their daughters, it may be, a new bonnet or an old coronet. The devil knows what. Bad as the weather had been the day before, Dorothy had yet contrived to visit her and see that she was provided with every necessity, and Juliet never doubted she would come that day also. She thought of Dorothy's ministrations, as we so often do of God's, as of things that come of themselves, for which there is no occasion to be thankful. When she had finished the other little housework required for her comfort, a labour in which she found some little respite from the gnawings of memory and the blankness of anticipation. She ended by making up a good fire, though without a thought of Dorothy's being wet when she arrived, and sitting down by the window, stared out at the pools, spreading wider and wider on the gravel walks beneath her. She sat till she grew chilly, then rose and dropped into an easy chair by the fire, and fell asleep. She slept a long time, and woke in a terror, seeming to have waked herself with a cry. The fire was out, and the hearth cold. She shivered and drew her shawl about her. Then suddenly she remembered the frightful dream she had had. She dreamed that she had just fled from her husband and gained the park, when, the moment she entered it, something seized her from behind and bore her swiftly as in the arms of a man, only she seemed to hear the rush of wings behind her, the way she had been going. She struggled in terror, but in vain. The power bore her swiftly on, and she knew whither. Her very being recoiled from the horrible depth of the motionless pool, in which, as she now seemed to know, lived one of the loathsome creatures of the semi-chaotic era of the world, which had survived its kind as well as its coevals, and was ages older than the human race. The pool appeared, but not as she had known it, for it boiled and heaved, bubbled and rose. From its lowest depths it was moved to meet and receive her. Coil upon coil it lifted itself into the air, towering like a waterspout, then stretched out a long, writhing, shivering neck to take her from the invisible arms that bore her to her doom. The neck shot out a head, and the head shot out the tongue of a water snake. She shrieked and woke, bathed in terror. With the memory of the dream, not a little of its horror returned. She rose to shake it off, and went to the window. What did she see there? The fearsome pool had entered the garden, had come halfway to the house, and was plainly rising every moment. More or less, the pool had haunted her ever since she came. She had seldom dared go nearer it than halfway down the garden, but for the dulling influence of her misery it would have been an unendurable horror to her. Now it was coming to fetch her, as she had seen it in her warning dream. Her brain reeled. For a moment she gazed, paralysed with horror, then turned from the window, and with almost the conviction that the fiend of her vision was pursuing her, fled from the house and across the park, through the sheets of rain, to the gate lodge, nor stopped until, all unaware of having once thought of him in her terror, she stood at the door of Polworth's cottage. Ruth was darting toward her with outstretched hands when her uncle stopped her. "'Ruth, my child!' he said, run and light a fire in the parlour. I will welcome our visitor. She turned instantly and left the room. Then Polworth went up to Juliet, who stood trembling, unable to utter word, and said with perfect old-fashioned courtesy, You are heartily welcome, ma'am. I sent Ruth away that I might first assure you that you are as safe with her as with me. Sit here a moment, ma'am. You are so wet, I dare not place you nearer to the fire. Ruth! She came instantly. Ruth, 
he repeated. This lady is Mrs. Faber. She has come to visit us for a while. Nobody must know of it. You need not be at all uneasy, Mrs. Faber. Not a soul will come near us today, but I will lock the door to secure time if anyone should. You will get Mrs. Faber's room ready at once, Ruth. I will come and help you. But a spoonful of brandy and hot water first, please. Let me move your chair, little ma'am, out of the draught. Juliet, in silence, did everything she was told, received the prescribed antidote from Ruth, and was left alone in the kitchen. But the moment she was freed from one dread, she was seized by another. Suspicion took the place of terror, and as soon as she heard the toiling of the goblins up the creaking staircase, she crept to the foot of it after them, and with no more compunction than a princess in a fairy tale, set herself to listen. It was not difficult, for the little enclosed staircase carried every word to the bottom of it. I thought she wasn't dead, she heard Ruth exclaim joyfully, and the words and tone set her wondering. I saw you did not seem greatly astonished at the sight of her, but what made you think such an unlikely thing? rejoined her uncle. I saw you did not believe she was dead. That was enough for me. You are a witch, Ruth. I never said a word, one way or the other. Which showed that you were thinking, and made me think. You had something in your mind, which you did not choose to tell me yet. Ah, child, rejoined her uncle in a solemn tone, how difficult it is to hide anything. I don't think God wants anything hidden. The light is his region, his kingdom, his palace home. It can only be evil, outside or in, that makes us turn from the fullest light of the universe. Truly, one must be born again to enter into the kingdom. Juliet heard every word, heard and was bewildered. The place in which she had sought refuge was plainly little better than a cobbled cave, yet merely from listening to the talk of the cobbolds, without half understanding it, she had begun already to feel a sense of safety stealing over her, such as she had never been for an instant aware of in the old house, even with Dorothy beside her. They went on talking, and she went on listening. They were so much her inferiors, there could be no impropriety in doing so. The poor lady, she heard the man-goblin say, has had some difference with her husband, but whether she wants to hide from him, or from the whole world, or from both, she only can tell. Our business is to take care of her, and do for her what God may lay to our hand. What she desires to hide is sacred to us. We have no secrets of our own, Ruth, and have the more room for those of other people who are unhappy enough to have any. Let God reveal what he pleases. There are many who have no right to know what they most desire to know. She needs nursing, poor thing. We will pray to God for her. But how shall we make her comfortable in such a poor little house? returned Ruth. It is the dearest place in the world to me, but how will she feel in it? We will keep her warm and clean, answered her uncle, and that is all an angel would require. An angel, yes, answered Ruth, for angels don't eat, or at least, if they do, for I doubt if you will grant that they don't, I am certain that they are not so hard to please as some people down here. The poor dear lady is delicate. You know she has always been, and I am not much of a cook. You are a very good cook, my dear. Perhaps you do not know a great many dishes, but you are a dainty cook of those you do know. Few people can have more need than we to be careful what they eat. We have got such a pair of troublesome, cranky little bodies, and if you can suit them, I feel sure you will be able to suit any invalid that is not fastidious by nature rather than necessity. I will do my best, 
said Ruth cheerfully, comforted by her uncle's confidence. The worst is that, for her own sake, I must not get a girl to help me. The lady will help you with her own room, said Polworth. I have a shrewd notion that it is only the fine ladies, those that are so little of ladies that they make so much of being ladies, who mind doing things with their own hands. Now, you must go and make her some tea while she gets in bed. She's sure to like tea best. Juliet retreated noiselessly, and when the woman gnome entered the kitchen, there sat the disconsolate lady where she had left her, still like the outcast princess of a fairy tale. She had walked in at the door, and they had immediately begun to arrange for her stay, and the strangest thing to Juliet was that she hardly felt it strange. It was only as if she had come her day sooner than she was expected, which indeed was very much the case, for Polworth had been looking forward to the possibility, and latterly to the likelihood of her becoming their guest. "'Your room is ready now,' said Ruth, approaching her timidly, and looking up at her with her woman's childlike face on the body of a child. "'Will you come?' Juliet rose and followed her to the garret room with the dormer window in which Ruth slept. "'Will you please get into bed as fast as you can?' she said, "'and when you knock on the floor I will come and take away your clothes and get them dried. Please to wrap this new blanket round you, lest the cold sheet should give you a chill. They are well aired, though. I will bring you a hot bottle and some tea. Dinner will be ready soon.' So saying, she left the chamber softly, the creak of the door as she closed it, and the white curtains of the bed and window reminded Juliet of a certain room she once occupied at the house of an old nurse, where she had been happier than ever since in all her life, until her brief bliss with Faber. She burst into tears, and, weeping, undressed and got into bed. There the dryness and the warmth and the sense of safety soothed her speedily, and with the comfort crept in the happy thought that here she lay on the very edge of the high road to Glaston, and that nothing could be more probable than she would soon see her husband ride past. With that one hope she could sit at a window watching for centuries. "'Oh, Paul, Paul, my Paul!' she moaned. "'If I could but be made clean again for you, I would willingly be burned at the stake.' if the fire would only make me clean for the chance of seeing you again in the other world. But as the comfort into her brain, so the peace of her new surroundings stole into her heart. The fancy grew upon her that she was in a fairy tale, in which she must take everything as it came, for she could not alter the text. Fear vanished, neither staring eyes nor creeping pool could find her in the guardianship of the benevolent goblins, she fell fast asleep, and the large, clear, grey eyes of the little woman gnome came and looked at her as she slept, and their gaze did not rouse her. Softly she went and came again, but although dinner was then ready, Ruth knew better than to wake her. She knew that sleep is the chief nourisher in life's feast, and would not withdraw the sacred dish. Her uncle said sleep was God's contrivance for giving man the help he could not get into him while he was awake. So the loving gnomes had their dinner together, putting aside the best portions of it against the waking of the beautiful lady lying fast asleep above. End of chapter 43 This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 44 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Paul Faber, Surgeon, by George MacDonald. The Corner of the Butcher's Shop. All that same Sunday morning, the minister and Dorothy had, of course, plenty of work to their hand, for their more immediate neighbours were all of the poor. Their own house, although situated on the very bank of the river, was in no worse plight than most of the houses in the town, for it stood upon an artificial elevation, and before long, while it had its lower parts full of water like the rest, its upper rooms were filled with people from the lanes around. But Mr. Drake's heart was in the pottery, for he was anxious as to the sufficiency of his measures. Many of the neighbours, driven from their homes, had betaken themselves to his enclosure, and when he went he found the salmon fishers still carrying families thither. He set out at once to get what bread he could from the bakers, a quantity of meat from the butcher, cheese, coffee, and tins of biscuits and preserved meat from the grocers. All within his bounds were either his own people or his guests, and he must do what he could to feed them. For the first time he felt rich, and heartily glad and grateful that he was. He could please God, his neighbour, and himself all at once, getting no end of good out of the slave of which the unrighteous make a god. He took Dorothy with him, for he would have felt helpless on such an expedition without her judgment, and, as Lisbeth's hands were more than full, they agreed it was better to take Amanda. Dorothy was far from comfortable at having to leave Juliet alone all day, but the possibility of her being compelled to omit her customary visit had been contemplated between them and she could not fail to understand it on this the first occasion. Anyhow, better could not be, for the duty at home was far the more pressing. That day she showed an energy which astonished even her father, nor did she fail of her reward. She received insights into humanity which grew to real knowledge. I was going to say that, next to an insight into the heart of God, an insight into the heart of a human being is the most precious of things. But when I think of it, what is the latter but the former? I will say this at least, that no one reads the human heart well to whom the reading reveals nothing of the heart of the Father. The wire gauze of sobering trouble over the flaming flower of humanity enabled Dorothy to see right down into its fire heart and distinguish there the loveliest hues and shades. Where the struggle for her own life is in abeyance, and the struggle for other life active, there the heart that God thought out and means to perfect, the pure love heart of his humans, reveals itself truly, and is gracious to behold. For then the will of the individual sides divinely with his divine impulse, and his heart is unified in good. When the will of the man sides perfectly with the holy impulses in him, then all is well, for then his mind is one with the mind of his Maker. God and man are one. Amanda shrieked with delight when she was carried to the boat, and went on shrieking as she floated over flower beds and box borders, caught now and then in bushes and overhanging branches but the great fierce current, ridging the middle of the brown lake as it followed the tide out to the ocean, frightened her a little. The features of the flat country were all but obliterated. Trees only and houses and corn stacks stood out of the water, while in the direction of the sea, where were only meadows, all indication of land had vanished. One wide brown level was everywhere, with a great rushing serpent of water in the middle of it. Amanda clapped her little hands in ecstasy. Never was there such a child for exuberance of joy, her aunt thought, or if there were others of glad, where were any who let the light of their gladness so shine before men, invading, conquering them as she did with the rush of her joy? 
Dorothy held fast to the skirt of her frock, fearing every instant the explosive creature would jump overboard in elemental sympathy. But polled carefully along by Mr. Drake, they reached in safety a certain old shed, and getting in at the door of the loft where a cowkeeper stored his hay and straw, through that descended into the heart of the pottery, which its owner was delighted to find, not indeed dry underfoot with such a rain falling, but free from lateral invasion. His satisfaction, however, was of short duration. Dorothy went into one of the nearer dwellings, and he was crossing an open space with Amanda to get help from a certain cottage in unloading the boat and distributing its cargo, when he caught sight of a bubbling pool in the middle of it. Alas, it was from a drain, whose covering had burst with the pressure from within. He shouted for help. Out hurried men, women, and children on all sides. For a few moments he was entirely occupied in giving orders, and let Amanda's hand go. Everybody knew her, and there seemed no worse mischief within reach for her than dabbling in the pools, to which she was still devoted. Two or three spades were soon plying busily, to make the breach a little wider, while men ran to bring clay and stones from one of the condemned cottages. Suddenly arose a great cry, and the crowd scattered in all directions. The wall of defence at the corner of the butcher's shop had given away, and a torrent was galloping across the pottery, straight for the spot where the water was rising from the drain. Amanda, gazing in wonder at the fright of the people about her, stood right in its course, but took no heed of it, or never saw it coming. It caught her, swept her away, and tumbled with her, foaming and roaring into the deep foundation of which I have spoken. Her father had just missed her, and was looking a little anxiously round, when a shriek of horror and fear burst from the people, and they rushed to the hole. Without a word spoken, he knew Amanda was in it. He darted through them, scattering men and women in all directions, but pulling off his coat as he ran. Though getting old, he was far from feeble, and had been a strong swimmer in his youth, but he plunged heedlessly, and the torrent, still falling some little height, caught him and carried him almost to the bottom. When he came to the top, he looked in vain for any sign of the child. The crowd stood breathless on the brink. No one had seen her, though all eyes were staring into the tumult. He dived, swam about beneath, groping in the frightful opacity, but still in vain. Then down through the water came a shout, and he shot to the surface to see only something white vanish but the recoil of the torrent from below caught her, and just as he was diving again, brought her up almost within arm's length of him. He darted to her, clasped her, and gained the brink. He could not have got out, though the cavity was now brimful, but ready hands had him in safety in a moment. Fifty arms were stretched to take the child, but not even to Dorothy would he yield her. Ready to fall at every step, he blundered through the water, which now spread over the whole place, and followed by Dorothy in mute agony, was making for the shed behind which lay his boat, when one of the salmon fishers, who had brought his cobble in at the gap, crossed them and took them up. Mr. Drake dropped into the bottom of the boat with the child pressed to his bosom. He could not speak. To Dr. Faber's! "'For the child's life,' said Dorothy, and the fisher rode like a madman. Faber had just come in. He undressed the child with his own hands, rubbed her dry, and did everything to initiate respiration. For a long time all seemed useless, but he persisted beyond the utmost verge of hope. Mr. Drake and Dorothy stood in mute dismay. Neither was quite a child of God yet, and in the old man a rebellious spirit murmured. It was hard that he should have evil for good, that his endeavours for his people should be the loss of his child. 
Faber was on the point of ceasing his efforts in utter despair when he thought he felt a slight motion of the diaphragm, and he renewed them eagerly. She began to breathe. Suddenly she opened her eyes, looked at him for a moment, then with a smile closed them again. To the watchers heaven itself seemed to open in that smile. But Faber dropped the tiny form, started a pace backwards from the bed, and stood staring aghast. The next moment he threw the blankets over the child, turned away, and almost staggered from the room. In his surgery he poured himself out a glass of brandy, swallowed it neat, sat down, and held his head in his hands. An instant after he was by the child's side again, feeling her pulse and rubbing her limbs under the blankets. The minister's hands had turned blue, and he had begun to shiver, but a smile of sweetest delight was on his face. "'God bless me!' cried the doctor. "'You've got no coat on, and you are drenched. I never saw anything but the child.' "'He plunged into the horrible hole after her,' said Dorothy. How wicked of me to forget him for any child under the sun. He got her out all by himself, Mr. Faber. Come home, father, dear. I will come back and see to Amanda as soon as I have got him to bed. Yes, Dorothy, let us go, said the minister, and put his hand on her shoulder. His teeth chattered and his hand shook. The doctor rang the bell violently. Neither of you shall leave this house tonight. Take a hot bath to the spare bedroom and remove the sheets, he said to the housekeeper, who had answered the summons. My dear sir, he went on, turning again to the minister, you must get into the blankets at once. How careless of me! The child's life will be dear at the cost of yours. You have brought me back the soul of the child to me, Mr. Faber said the minister, trembling, and I can never thank you enough. There won't be much to thank me for, if you have to go instead. Miss Drake, while I give your father his bath, you must go with Mrs. Roberts and put on dry clothes. Then you will be able to nurse him. As soon as Dorothy, whose garments Juliet had been wearing so long, was dressed in some of hers, she went to her father's room. He was already in bed, but it was long before they could get him warm. Then he grew burning hot, and all night was talking in troubled dreams. Once Dorothy heard him say, as if he had been talking to God face to face, Oh, my God, if I had but once seen thee, I do not think I could ever have mistrusted thee, but I could never be quite sure. The morning brought lucidity. How many dawns a morning brings. His first words were, How goes it with the child? Having heard that she had had a good night and was almost well, he turned over and fell fast asleep. Then Dorothy, who had been by his bed all night, resumed her own garments and went to the door. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 45 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. Here and there. The rain had ceased and the flood was greatly diminished. It was possible, she judged, to reach the old house, and after a hasty breakfast she set out, leaving her father to Mrs. Roberts' care. The flood left her no choice but to go by the high road to Paul Worth's gate, and then she had often to wade through mud and water. The moment she saw the gatekeeper, she knew somehow by his face that Juliet was in the lodge. When she entered, she saw that already her new circumstances were working upon her for peace. The spiritual atmosphere, so entirely human, 
the sense that she was not and would not be alone the strange talk which they held openly before her the food they coaxed her to eat the whole surrounding of thoughts and things as they should be was operating far more potently than could be measured by her understanding of their effects or even consciousness of their influences she still looked down upon the dwarves condescending to them had a vague feeling that she honored them by accepting their ministration for which one day she would requite them handsomely not the less had she all the time a feeling that she was in the society of ministering spirits of god good and safe and true from the old house to the cottage was from the inferno to the purgatorio across whose borders strayed wafts from paradise now and then strayed wandering without knowing it she had begun already to love the queer little woman with the wretched body the fine head and gentle suffering face with the indescribable awe into which her aversion to the kobold with his pigeon chest his wheezing breath his giant head and his big still face which to such eyes as the curates seemed to be looking into both worlds at once had passed over bore no unimportant part to that portion of her discipline here commenced one of the loftiest spirits of the middle earth it was long before she had quite ceased to regard him as a power of the nether world partly human and at once something less and something more yet even already she was beginning to feel at home with them true the world in which they really lived was above her spiritual vision as beyond her intellectual comprehension yet not the less was the air around them the essential air of homeness for the truths in which their spirits lived and breathed were the same which lie at the root of every feeling of home safety in the world which make the bliss of the child in her mother's bed the bliss of young beasts in their nests of birds under their mother's wing the love which enclosed her was far too great for her as the heaven of the mother's face is beyond the understanding of the newborn child over whom she bends but that mother's face is nevertheless the child's joy and peace she did not yet recognize it as love saw only the ministration but it was what she sorely needed she said the sort of thing that suited her and at once began to fall in with it what it cost her entertainers with organization as delicate as uncouth in the mere matter of bodily labor she had not an idea imagined indeed that she gave them no trouble at all because having overheard the conversation between them upon her arrival she did herself a part in the work required for her comfort in her own room she never saw the poor quarters to which ruth for her sake had banished herself never perceived the fact that there was nothing good enough wherewith to repay them except worshipful gratitude love admiration and submission feelings she could not have even imagined possible in regard to such inferiors and now dorothy had not a little to say to juliet about her husband in telling what had taken place however she had to hear many more questions than she was able to answer does he really believe me dead dorothy was one of them i do not believe there is one person in glaston who knows what he thinks answered dorothy i have not heard of his once opening his mouth on the subject he is just as silent now as he used to be ready to talk my poor paul murmured juliet and hid her face and wept indeed not a soul in glaston or elsewhere knew a single thought he had certain mysterious advertisements in the county paper were imagined by some to be his and to refer to his wife some as the body had never been seen did begin to doubt whether she was dead some on the other hand hinted that her husband had himself made away with her for they argued what could be easier to a doctor and why else did he make no search for the body to dorothy this supposed fact seemed to indicate a belief that she was not dead perhaps a hope that she would sooner betray herself if he manifested no anxiety to find her but she said nothing of this to juliet her news of him was the more acceptable of the famished heart of the wife that from his great kindness to them all and especially from the preservance which had restored to them the little amanda dorothy's heart had so warmed towards him that she could not help speaking of him in a tone far more agreeable to juliet than hitherto she had been able to use his pale worn look 
and the tokens of trouble throughout his demeanor, all more evident upon nearer approach, had wrought upon her, and she so described his care, anxiety, and tenderness over Amanda that Juliet became jealous of the child, as she would have been of any dog she saw him caress. When all was told, and she was weary of asking questions to which there were no answers, she fell back into her chair with a sigh. Alas, she was no nearer to him for the hearing of her ears. While she lived, she was open to his scorn, and deserved it the more that she had seemed to die. She must die, for then, at last, a little love would revive his heart. Ere he died too and followed her no whither, only first she must leave him his child to plead for her. She used sometimes to catch herself praying that the infant might be like her. Look at my jacket, said Dorothy. It was one of Juliet's, and she hoped to make her smile. Did Paul see you with my clothes on? she said angrily. Dorothy started with the pang of hurt that shot through her, but the compassionate smile on the face of Paulworth, who had just entered and had heard the last article of the conversation, at once set her right. For not only was he capable of immediate sympathy with emotion, but of revealing at once that he understood its cause. Ruth, who had come into the room behind him, second only to her uncle in the inside of love, followed his look by asking Dorothy if she might go to the old house, as soon as the weather permitted, to fetch some clothes for Miss Faber, who had brought nothing with her but what she wore. Whereupon Dorothy, partly for the leisure to fight her temper, said she would go herself and went. But when she returned, she gave the bag to Ruth at the door and went away without seeing Juliet again. She was getting tired of her selfishness, she said to herself. Dorothy was not herself yet perfect in love, which beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Paper to have been up all night by the bedside of the little Amanda. She scarcely needed such close attendance, for she slept soundly and was hardly at all feverish. Four or five times in the course of the night, he turned down the bedclothes to examine her body, as if he feared some injury not hitherto apparent. Of such there was no sign. In his youth, he had occupied himself much with comparative anatomy and physiology. His predilection for these studies had greatly sharpened his observation, and he noted many things that escaped the eyes of better than ordinary observers. Amongst other kinds of things, in which he kept his eyes open, he was very quick at noticing instances of the strange persistency with which nature perpetuates minute particularities, carrying them on from generation to generation. Occupied with Amanda, a certain imperfection in one of the curves of the outer ear attracted his attention. It is as rare to see a perfect ear as to see a perfect form, and the varieties of unfinished curves are many. But this imperfection was very particular. At the same time, it was so slight that not even the eye of a lover, none save that of a man of science, alive to minutest indications, would probably have seen it. The sight of it startled Faber not a little. It was the second instance of the peculiarity that had come to his knowledge. It gave him a new idea to go upon, and when the child suddenly opened her eyes, he saw another face looking at him out of hers. The idea then haunted him, and whether it was that it assimilated facts to itself, or that the signs were present, further search afforded what was to him confirmation of the initiatory suspicion. Notwithstanding the state of feebleness in which he found Mr. Drake the next morning, he pressed him with question upon question, amounting to a thorough cross-examination concerning Amanda's history. Undeterred by the fact, whether itself merely bored or its nature annoyed him, his patient plainly disrelished his catechizing. It was a subject which, as his love to the child increased, had grown less and less agreeable to Mr. Drake. She was to him so entirely his own that he had not the least desire to find out anything about her, to learn a single fact or hear a single conjecture, to remind him that she was not in every sense as well as the best his own daughter. He was therefore not a little annoyed at the persistency of the doctor's questioning, but, being a courteous man, and under endless obligation to him for the very child's sake as well as his own, he combated disinclination, and with success, acquainting the doctor with every point he knew concerning Amanda. Then the doctor grew capable of giving his attention to the minister himself, 
whose son if he had been he could hardly have shown him greater devotion a whole week passed before he would allow him to go home dorothy waited upon him and amanda ran out of the house the doctor and she had been friends from the first and now when he was at home there was never any doubt where amanda was to be found the same day on which the drakes left him faber stayed by the night train for london and was absent three days amanda was now perfectly well but mr drake continued poorly dorothy was anxious to get him away from the riverside and proposed putting the workmen into the old house at once to this he readily consented but would not listen to her suggestion that in the meantime he should go to some watering place he would be quite well in a day or two and there was no rest for him he said until the work so sadly bungled was properly done he did not believe his plans were defective but could not help doubting whether they had been faithfully carried out but the builder a man of honest repute protested also that he could not account for the yielding of the wall except he had had the mishap to build over some deep drain or old well which was not likely so close to the river he offered to put it up again at his own expense when perhaps they might discover the cause of the catastrophe sundry options and more than one rumour were current among the neighbours at last they were mostly divided into two parties one professing that the conviction that the butcher who was known to have some grudge at the minister had under the testudo shelter of his slaughterhouse undermined the wall the other indignantly asserting that the absurdity had no foundation except in the evil thought of churchmen towards dissenters being in fact a wicked slander when the suggestion reached the minister's ears he knowing the butcher and believing the builder was inclined to institute investigations but as a course was not likely to lead the butcher to repentance he resolved instead to consult with him how his premises might be included in the defence the butcher chuckled with conscious success and for some months always chuckled when sharpening his knife but by and by the coals of fire began to scorch and went scorching the more that mr drake very soon became his landlord and voluntarily gave him several advantages but he gave strict orders that there should be no dealings with him it was one thing he said to be good to the sinner and another to pass by his fault without confession treating it like a mere personal affair which might be forgotten before the butcher died there was not a man who knew him who did not believe he had undermined the wall he left a will assigning all his property to trustees for the building of a new chapel but when his affairs came to be looked into there was hardly enough to pay his debts the minister was now subject of a sort of ague to which he paid far too little heed when dorothy was not immediately looking after him he would slip out in any weather to see how things were going in the pottery it was no wonder therefore that his health did not improve but he could not be induced to regard his condition as at all serious end of chapter forty five this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 46 of Paul Faber, Surgeon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron Walker Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald The Minister's Study Helen was in the way of now and then writing music to any song that specially took her fancy, not with foolish hankering after publication, but for the pleasure of brooding in melody upon the words and singing them to her husband. One day he brought her a few stanzas by an unknown poet which, he said, seemed to have in them a slightly new element. They pleased her more than him and began at once to sing themselves. No sooner was her husband out of the room than she sat down to her piano with them, before the evening, she had written to them an air with a simple accompaniment. When she now sung the verses to him, he told her, to her immense delight, that he understood and liked them far better. The next morning, having carried out one or two little suggestions he had made, she was singing them by herself in the drawing room, when Faber, to whom she had sent because one of her servants was ill, entered. He made a sign begging her to continue, and she finished the song. Will you let me see the words? he said. She handed them to him. He read them, laid down the manuscript, and requesting to be taken to his patient, returned to the door. 
Perhaps he thought she had laid a music snare for him. The verses were these. A year song. Sighing above, rustling below, through the woods the winds go. Beneath dead crowds, above life bare, and the besom winds sweep the air. Heart, leave thy woe. Let the dead things go. Through the brown leaves, gold stars push. A mist of green veils the bush. Here a twitter, there a croak. They are coming, the spring folk. Heart, be not dumb. Let the live things come. Through the beach, the winds go, with a long speech, loud and slow. The grass is fine, and soft to lie in. The sun doth shine, the blue sky in. Heart, be alive, let the new things thrive. Round again, here now, a rimy fruit on a bare bough. There the winter and the snow, and a sighing ever to fall and go. Heart, thy hour shall be, thy dead will comfort thee. Faber was still folded in the atmosphere of the song when, from the curate's door, he arrived at the minister's, resolved to make that morning a certain disclosure, one he would gladly have avoided, but felt bound in honor to make. The minister grew pale as he listened, but held his peace. Not until the point came at which he found himself personally concerned did he utter a syllable. I will, in my own words, give the substance of the doctor's communication, stating the facts a little more fairly to him than his pride would allow him to put them in his narrative. Paul Faber was a student of St. Bartholomew's, and during some time held there the office of assistant house surgeon. Soon after his appointment, he being then three and twenty, a young woman was taken into one of the wards, in whom he gradually grew much interested. Her complaint caused her much suffering, but was more tedious than dangerous. Attracted by her sweet looks, but more by her patience and the gratitude with which she received the attention shown her, he began to talk to her a little especially during a slight operation that had to be not unfrequently performed. Then he came to giving her books to read, and was often charmed with the truth and simplicity of the remarks she would make. She had been earning her living as a clerk, had no friends in London, and therefore no place to betake herself to in her illness but the hospital. The day she left it, in the simplicity of her heart and with much timidity, she gave him a chain she had made for him of her hair. On the ground of supplementary attention, partly desirable, partly a pretext, but unassociated with any evil intent, he visited her after in her lodging. The joy of her face, the light of her eyes when he appeared, was enchanting to him. She pleased every gentle element of his nature. Her worship flattered him. Her confidence bewitched him. His feelings toward her were such that he never doubted he was ever friend. He did her no of kindness, taught her much, gave her good advice as to her behavior and the danger she was in would have protected her from every enemy, real and imaginary, while all the time, undesignedly, he was depriving her of the very nerve of self-defense. He still gave her books, and good books, Carlyle even, and Tennyson, read poetry with her, and taught her to read aloud, went to her chapel with her sometimes of a Sunday evening. For he was then, so he said, and so he imagined, a thorough believer in Revelation. He took her to the theater, to pictures, to concerts, taking every care of her health, her manners, her principles, but one enemy he forgot to guard her against. How is a man to protect even the woman he loves from the hidden god of his idolatry, his own grand contemptible self? It is needless to set the foot of narration upon every step of the slow descending stair. With all his tender feelings and generous love of his kind, Paul Faber had not yet learned the simplest lesson of humanity, that he who would not be a murderer must be his brother's keeper. Still more his sisters, protecting every woman first of all from himself, from every untruth in him, chiefly from every unhallowed approach of his lower nature, from everything that calls itself love and is but its black shadow, its demon ever murmuring, I love, that it may devour. The priceless reward of such honesty is the power to love better, but let no man insult his nature by imagining himself noble for so carrying himself. As soon let him think himself noble that he is no swindler. Doubtless Faber said to himself as well as to her, and said it yet oftener when the recoil of his selfishness struck upon the door of his conscience and roused Don Worm, that he would be true to her forever. But what did he mean by the words? Did he know? Had they any sense of which he would not have been ashamed even before the girl himself? Would such truth as he contemplated make of him her hiding place from the wind, her covert from the tempest? He never even thought whether to marry her or not, 
never vowed, even in his heart, not to marry another. All he could have said was that at the time he had no intention of marrying another, and that he had the intention of keeping her for himself indefinitely, which may be all the notion some people have of eternally. But things went well with them, and they seemed to themselves, notwithstanding the tears shed by one of them in secret, only the better for the relation between them. At length a child was born. The heart of a woman is indeed infinite, but time, her presence, her thoughts, her hands are finite. She could not seem so much a lover as before, because she must be a mother now. God only can think of two things at once. In his enduring selfishness, Faber felt the child come between them and reproached her neglect, as he called it. She answered him gently and reasonably, but now his bonds began to weary him. She saw it, and in the misery of the waste vision opening before her eyes, her temper, till now sweet as devoted, began to change. And yet, while she loved her child the more passionately that she loved her forebodingly, almost with the love of a woman already forsaken, she was nearly mad sometimes with her own heart, that she could not give herself so utterly as before to her idol. It took but one interview after he had confessed it to himself to reveal the fact to her that she had grown a burden to him. He came a little seldomer, and by degrees which seemed to her terribly rapid, more and more seldom. He had never recognized duty in his relation to her. I do not mean that he had not done the effects of duty toward her. Love had as yet prevented the necessity of appeal to the stern daughter of God. But love with which our humanity is acquainted can keep healthy without calling it the aid of duty. Perfect love is the mother of all duties and all virtues, and needs not be admonished of her children. But not until love is perfected may she, casting out fear, forget also duty. And hence are the conditions of such a relation altogether incongruous. For the moment the man, not yet debased, admits a thought of duty, he is aware that far more is demanded of him than, even for the sake of purest right, he has either the courage or the conscience to yield. But even now Faber had not the most distant intention of forsaking her. Only why should he let her burden him and make his life miserable? There were other pleasures besides the company of the most childishly devoted of women. Why should he not take them? Why should he give all his leisure to one who gave more than half of it to her baby? He had money of his own, and, never extravagant upon himself, he was more liberal to the poor girl than ever she desired. But there was nothing mercenary in her. She was far more incapable of turpitude than he, for she was of higher nature, and loved much where he loved only a little. She was nobler, sweetly prouder than he. She had sacrificed all to him for love, could accept nothing from him without the love which alone is the soul of any gift alone makes it rich. She would not, could not see him unhappy. In her fine generosity, struggling to be strong, she said to herself that, after all, she would leave him richer than she was before, richer than he was now. He would not want the child he had given her. She would, and she could, live for her upon the memory of two years of such love as comforting herself in sad womanly pride. She flattered herself woman had seldom enjoyed. She would not throw the past from her because the weather of time had changed. She would not mar every fair memory with the inky sponge of her present loss. She would turn her back upon her son ere he set quite, and carry with her into the darkness the last gorgeous glow of his departure. While she had his child, should she never see him again, there remained a bond between them, a bond that could never be broken. He and she met in that child's life. Her being was the eternal fact of their unity. Both she and he had to learn that there was yet a closer bond between them, Necessary, indeed, to the fact that a child could be born of them, namely, that they too had issued from the one perfect heart of love. And every heart of perplexed man, although too much for itself, it cannot conceive how the thing should be, has to learn that there, in that heart whence it came, lies for it restoration, consolation, content. Herein, O God, lies a task for thy perfection, for the might of thy imagination, which needs but thy will and thy suffering, to be creation. One evening, when he paid her a visit after the absence of a week, he found her charmingly dressed and merry, but in a strange fashion which he could not understand. The baby, she said, was downstairs with the landlady, and she free for her Paul. She read to him, she sang to him, she bewitched him afresh with the graces he had helped to develop in her. He said to himself when he left her that surely never was there a more gracious creature, and she was utterly his own. It was the last flicker of the dying light, the gorgeous sunset she had resolved to carry with her in her memory forever. When he sought her again the next morning, he found her landlady in tears. She had vanished, taking with her nothing but her child and her child's garments. 
The gown she had worn the night before hung in her bedroom. Everything but what she must then be wearing was left behind. The woman wept, spoke of her with genuine affection, and said she had paid everything. To his questioning, she answered that they had gone away in a cab. She had called it, but knew neither the man nor his number. Persuading himself she had but gone to see some friend, he settled himself in her rooms to await her return. But a week rightly served to consume his hope. The iron entered into his soul and for a time tortured him. He wept, but consoled himself that he wept, for it proved to himself that he was not heartless. He comforted himself further in the thought that she knew where to find him, and that when trouble came upon her, she would remember how good he had been to her, and what a return she had made for it. Because he would not give up everything to her, liberty and all, she had left him. And in revenge, having so long neglected him for the child, she had for the last once roused in her every power of enchantment, had brought her every charm into play, that she might lastingly bewitch him with the old spell and the undying memory of their first bliss, then left him to his lonely misery. She had done what she could for the ruin of a man of education, a man of family, a man on the way to distinction, a man of genius, he said even, but he was such only as every man is. He was a man of latent genius. But verily, though our sympathy goes all with a woman like her, such a man, however little he deserves, and however much he would scorn it, is far more an object of pity. She has her love, has not been false thereto, and one day will, through suffering, find the path to the door of rest. When she left him, her soul was endlessly richer than his. The music of which he said she knew nothing, in her soul moved a deep wave. While it blew but a sparkling ripple on his, the poetry they read together echoed in a far profounder depth of her being, and I do not believe she came to loathe it as he did. And when she read of him who reasoned that the sins of a certain woman must have been forgiven her, else how could she love so much? She may well have been able, from the depth of such another loving heart, to believe utterly in him. While we know that her poor, shrunken lover came to think it manly, honest, reasonable, meritorious to deny him. Weeks, months, years passed, but she never sought him. And he so far forgot her by ceasing to think of her, that at length, when a chance bubble did rise from the drowned memory, it broke instantly and vanished. As to the child, he had almost forgotten whether it was a boy or a girl. But since, in his new desolation, he discovered her, beyond a doubt, in the little Amanda, old memories had been crowding back upon his heart. And he had begun to perceive how Amanda's mother must have felt when she saw his love to King visibly before her, and to suspect that it was in the self-immolation of love that she had left him. His own character had been hitherto so uninformally pervaded with a refined selfishness as to afford no standpoint of a different soil, whence by contrast to recognize the true nature of the rest, but now it began to reveal itself to his conscious judgment. And at last it struck him that twice he had been left, by women who he loved, at least by women who loved him. Two women had trusted him utterly, and he had failed them both. Next followed the thought stinging him to the heart that the former was the purer of the two, that the one on whom he had looked down because of her lack of education and her familiarity with the humble things and simple forms of life knew nothing of what men count evil, while she in whom he had worshipped refinement, intellect, culture, beauty, song, she who, in love teachableness, had received his doctrine against all the prejudices of her education was what she had confessed herself. But against all reason and logic, the result of this comparison was that Juliet returned fresh to his imagination in all the first witchery of her loveliness, and presently he found himself for the first time making excuses for her. If she had deceived him, she had deceived him from love. Whatever her past, she had been true to him, and was, from the moment she loved him, incapable of wrong. He had cast her from him, and she had sought refuge in the arms of the only rival he ever would have had to fear, the bare-ribbed death. Naturally followed the reflection. What was he to demand purity of any woman? Had he not accepted? Yes. Tempted, enticed from the woman who preceded her, the sacrifice of one of the wings of her soul on the altar of his selfishness, then driven her from him, thus maimed and helpless to the mercy of the rude blasts of the world? She, not he ever, had been the noble one, the bountiful giver, the victim of shameless ingratitude, flattering himself that misery would drive her back to him. He had not made a single effort to find her, or mourned that he could never make up to her for the wrongs he had done her. He had not even hoped for a future in which he might humble himself before her. What room was there here to talk of honor? If she had not sunk to the streets, it was through her own virtue and none of his care. 
and now she was dead, and his child, but for the charity of a despised superstition, would have been left an outcast in the London streets to wither into the old-faced weakling of a London workhouse. End of chapter 46「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.」Chapter 47 of Paul Faber, Surgeon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron Walker Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald. The Blowing of the Wind. Smaller and smaller, Faber felt as he pursued his plain, courageous confession of wrong to the man whose life was even now in peril for the sake of his neglected child. When he concluded with the expression of his conviction that Amanda was his daughter, then first the old minister spoke. His love had made him guess what was coming, and he was on his guard. May I ask what is your object? In making this statement to me, Mr. Faber, he said coldly, I am conscious of none but to confess the truth, and perform any duty that may be mine in consequence of the discovery, said the doctor. Do you wish this truth published to the people of Glaston? inquired the minister in the same icy tone. I have no such desire, but I am of course prepared to confess Amanda my child and to make you what amends may be possible for the trouble and expense she has occasioned you. Trouble? Expense? cried the minister fiercely. Do you mean in your cold-blooded heart that because you, who have no claim to the child but that of self-indulgence, because you believe her yours, I who have for years carried her in my bosom, am going to give her up to a man who, all these years, has made not one effort to discover his missing child? In the sight of God, which of us is her father? But I forget, that is a question you cannot understand. Whether or not you are her father, I do not care a straw. You have not proved it. And I tell you that, until the court of chancery orders me to deliver up my darling to you, to be taught there is no living father of men, and that by the fittest of all men to enforce the lie, not until then will I yield a hair of her head to you. God grant, if you were her father, her mother had more part in her than you. A thousand times, rather I would, we had both perished in the roaring mud, than that I should have to give her up to you. He struck his fist on the table, rose, and turned from him. Faber also rose, quietly, silent and pale. He stood a moment, waiting. Mr. Drake turned. Faber made him an obeisance and left the room. The minister was too hard upon him. He would not have been so hard but for his atheism. He would not have been so hard if he could have seen into his soul. But Faber felt he deserved it. Ere he reached home, however, he had begun to think it rather hard that, when a man confessed a wrong and desired to make what reparation he could, he should have the very candor of his confession thus thrown in his teeth. Fairly, even toward the righteous among men, candor is a perilous duty. He entered the surgery. There he had been making some experiments with peroxide of manganese, a solution of which stood in a bottle on the table. A ray of brilliant sunlight was upon it, casting its shadow on a piece of white paper, a glorious red. It had caught his eyes. He could never tell what it had to do with the current of his thoughts, but neither could he afterward get rid of the feeling that it had had some influence upon it. For as he looked at it, scarcely knowing he did, and thinking still how hard the minister had been upon him, suddenly he found himself in the minister's place, and before him Juliet making her sad confession. How had he met that confession? The whole scene returned, and for the first time struck him right on the heart, and then first he began to be in reality humbled in his own eyes. What if, after all, he was but a poor creature? What if, instead of having anything to be proud of, he was in reality one who, before any jury of men or women called to judge him, must hide his head in shame. The thought once allowed to enter and remain long enough to be questioned, never more went far from him. For a time he walked in the midst of a dull cloud, first of dread, then of dismay, 
a cloud from which came thunders and lightnings and rain. It passed, and a doubtful dawn rose dim and scared upon his consciousness, a dawn in which the sun did not appear, and on which followed a gray, solemn day. A humbler regard of himself had taken the place of confidence and satisfaction, an undefined hunger, far from understood by himself, but having vaguely for its object clearance and atonement and personal purity even, had begun to grow, and move within him. The thought stung him with keen self-contempt, yet think he must and did, that a woman might be spotted not a little, and yet be good enough for him in the eyes of retributive justice. He saw plainly that his treatment of his wife, knowing what he did of himself, was a far worse shame than any fault of which a girl, such as Juliet was at the time, could have been guilty. And with that, for all that he believed it utterly in vain, his longing after the love he had lost grew and grew, ever passing over into sickening despair, and then springing afresh. He longed for Juliet as she had prayed to him, as the only power that could make him clean. It seemed somehow as if she could even help him in his repentance for the wrong done to Amanda's mother. The pride of the Pharisee was gone, the dignity of the husband had vanished, and his soul longed after the love that covers a multitude of sins, as the air in which alone his spirit could breathe and live and find room. I set it down briefly. The change passed upon him by many degrees, with countless alternations of mood and feeling, and without the smallest conscious change of opinion. The rest of the day, after receiving Faber's communication, poor Mr. Drake roamed about like one on the verge of insanity, struggling to retain lawful dominion over his thoughts. At times he was lost in apprehensive melancholy, at times roused to such fierce anger that he had to restrain himself from audible malediction. The following day, Dorothy would have sent for Faber, but he had a worse attack of the fever than ever before, but he declared that the man should never again cross his threshold. Dorothy concluded there had been a fresh outbreak between them of the old volcano. He grew worse and worse and did not object to her sending for Dr. Mather, but he did not do him much good. He was in a very critical state, and Dorothy was miserable about him. The fever was persistent, and the cough which he had had ever since that day that brought his illness grew worse. His friends would gladly have prevailed upon him to seek a warmer climate, but he would not hear of it. Upon one occasion, Dorothy, encouraged by the presence of Dr. Mather, was entreating him afresh to go somewhere from home for a while. No, no, what would become of my money? he answered with a smile which Dorothy understood. The doctor imagined it the speech of a man whom previous poverty and suddenly supervening wealth had made penurious. Oh, he remarked reassuringly, you need not spend a penny more abroad than you do at home. The difference in the living would, in some places, quite make up for the expense of the journey. The minister looked bewildered for a moment, then seemed to find himself, smiled again, and replied, you do not quite understand me. I have a great deal of money to spend, and it ought to be spent here in England where it was made. God knows how. You may get help to spend it in England, without throwing your life away with it, said the doctor, who could not help thinking of his own large family. Yes, I dare say I might from many, but it was given me to spend, in destroying injustice, and in doing to men as others ought to have done to them. My preaching was such a poor affair that it is taken from me, and a lower calling given me to spend money. If I do not well with that, then indeed I am a lost man. If I be not faithful in that which is another's, who will give me that which is my own? If I cannot further the coming of Christ, I can at least make a road or two, exalt a valley or two, to prepare his way before him. Thereupon it was the doctor's turn to smile. All that was to him as if spoken in a language unknown, except that he recognized the religious tone in it. The man is true to his profession, he said to himself, as he ought to be, of course. But catch me spending my money that way, if I had but a hold of it. His father died soon after, and he got a hold of the money he called his, whereupon he parted with the practice, and by idleness and self-indulgence, knowing all the time what he was about, brought on an infirmity which no skill could cure, and is now a grumbling invalid at one or another of the German spas. 
I mention it partly because many preferred this man to Faber on the ground that he went to church every Sunday and always shook his head at the other's atheism. Faber wrote a kind, respectful letter, somewhat injured in tone to the minister, saying he was much concerned to hear that he was not so well, and expressing his apprehension that he himself had been in some measure the cause of his relapse. He begged leave to assure him that he perfectly recognized the absolute superiority of Mr. Drake's claim to the child. He had never dreamed of asserting any right in her, except so much as was implied in the acknowledgment of his duty to restore the expense which his wrong and neglect had caused her true father, beyond that he well knew he could make no return save in gratitude, but if he might, for the very partial easing of his conscience, be permitted to supply the means of the child's education, he was ready to sign an agreement that all else connected with it should be left entirely to Mr. Drake. He begged to be allowed to see her sometimes, for, long ere a suspicion had crossed his mind that she was his, the child was already dear to him. He was certain that her mother would have much preferred Mr. Drake's influence to his own, and for her sake also, he would be careful to disturb nothing. But he hoped Mr. Drake would remember that, however unworthy, he was still her father. The minister was touched by the letter, moved also in the hope that an arrow from the quiver of truth had found in the doctor a vulnerable spot. He answered that he should be welcome to see the child when he would, and that she should go to him when he pleased. He must promise, however, as the honest man everybody knew him to be, not to teach her there was no God, or lead her to despise the instructions she received at home. The word honest was to favor like a blow. He had come to the painful conclusion that he was neither honest man nor gentleman. Doubtless, he would have knocked anyone down who told him so, but then who had the right to take with him the liberties of a conscience? Pure love only, I suspect, can do that without wrong. He would not try less to be honest in the time to come, but he had never been, and could no more ever feel honest. It did not matter much. What was there worth any effort? All was flat and miserable, a hideous long life. What did it matter what he was, so long as he hurt nobody any more? He was tired of it all. It added greatly to his despondency that he found he could no longer trust his temper. That the cause might be purely physical was no consolation to him. He had been accustomed to depend on his imperturbability, and now he could scarcely recall the feeling of the mental condition. He did not suspect how much the change was owing to his new gained insight into his character and the haunting dissatisfaction it caused. To the minister, he replied that he had been learning a good deal of late, and among other things, that the casting away of superstition did not necessarily do much for the development of the moral nature, in consequence of which discovery he did not feel bound, as before, to propagate the negative portions of his creed. If its denials were true, he no longer believed them powerful for good, and merely as facts he did not see that a man was required to disseminate them. Even here, however, his opinion must go for little, seeing he had ceased to care much for anything, true or false. Life was no longer of any value to him, except indeed he could be of service to Amanda. Mr. Drake might be assured she was the last person on whom he would wish to bring to bear any of the opinions so objectionable in his eyes. He would make him the most comprehensive promise to that effect. Would Mr. Drake allow him to say one thing more? He was heartily ashamed of his past history, and if there was one thing to make him wish there were a God, of which he saw no chance, it was that he might beg of him the power to make up for the wrongs he had done, even if it should require an eternity of atonement. Until he could hope for that, he must sincerely hold that his was the better belief, as well as the likelier, namely, that the wronger and the wronged went into darkness friendly with oblivion, joy and sorrow alike forgotten, there to bid adieu both to reproach and self-contempt. For himself he had no desire after prolonged existence. Why should he desire to live a day, not to say forever, worth nothing to himself or to anyone? If there were a God, he would rather entreat him, and that he would do humbly enough to unmake him again. Certainly, if there were a God, he had not done over well by his creatures, making them so ignorant and feeble that they could not fail to fall. Would Mr. Drake have made his Amanda so? When Wingfold read the letter of which I have thus given the substance, it was not until a long time after in Polworth's room he folded it softly together and said, When he wrote that letter, Paul Faber was already becoming not merely a man to love, but a man to revere. After a pause, he added, But what a world it would be 
filled with contented men, all capable of doing the things for which they would despise themselves. It was some time before the minister was able to answer the letter except by sending Amanda at once to the doctor with a message of kind regards and thanks, but his inability to reply was quite as much from the letters giving him so much to think of first as from his weakness and fever, for he saw that to preach, as it was commonly understood, the doctrine of the forgiveness of sins to such a man would be useless. He would rather believe in a God who would punish them than in one who would pass them by. To be told he was forgiven would but rouse in him contemptuous indignation. What is that to me? he would return. I remain what I am. Then grew up in the mind of the minister the following plant of thought. Things divine can only be shadowed in the human. What is in man must be understood of God with a divine difference, not only of degree but of kind, involved in the fact that he makes me, I can make nothing and if I could, should yet be no less a creature of him, the creator. Therefore, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and what we call his forgiveness may be, must be something altogether transcending the conception of man, overwhelming to such need as even that of Paul Faber, whose soul has begun to hunger after righteousness, and whose hunger must be a hunger that will not easily be satisfied. For a poor nature will for a time be satisfied with the middling God, but as the nature grows richer, the ideal of the God desired grows greater. The true man can be satisfied only with the God of magnificence, never with a God such as in his childhood and youth had been presented to favor as the God of the Bible. That God, only whom Christ reveals to the humble seeker, can ever satisfy human soul. Then it came into the minister's mind, thinking over favor's religion toward his fellows, and his lack toward God, how when the young man asked Jesus what commandments he must keep up that he might inherit eternal life, Jesus did not say a word concerning those at the first table, not a word, that is, about his duty toward God. He spoke only of his duty toward man. Then it struck him that our Lord gave him no sketch or summary or part of a religious system, only told him what he asked, the practical steps by which he might begin to climb toward eternal life. One thing he lacked, namely, God himself. But as to how God would meet him, Jesus says nothing. But himself meets him on those steps with the offer of God. He treats the duties of the second table as a stair to the first, a stair which, probably by its crumbling away and failure beneath his feet as he ascended, would lift him to such a vision and such a horror of final frustration as would make him stretch forth his hands like the sinking Peter to the living God. The life eternal which he blindly sought, without whose closest presence he could never do the simplest duty aright, even of those he had been doing from his youth up. His measure of success and his sense of utter failure would together lift him toward the one good. Thus, looking out upon truth from the cave of his brother's need, and seeing the direction in which the shadow of his atheism fell, the minister learned in what direction the clouded light lay. And turning his gaze thitherward, learn much. It is only the age to have dropped thinking that becomes stupid. Such can learn no more, until first their young nurse death has taken off their clothes and put the old babies to bed. Of such was not Walter Drake. Certain of his formerly petted doctrines he now threw away as worse than rubbish. Others he dropped with indifference. Of some it was as if the angels picked his pockets without his knowing it, or even missing them, and still he found, whatever so-called doctrine he parted with, that the one glowing truth which had lain at the heart of it, buried, mired, obscured, not only remained with him, but shone out fresh, restored to itself by the loss of the clay lump of worldly figures and phrases in which the human intellect had enclosed it. His faith was elevated, and so confirmed. End of chapter 47This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 48 of Paul Faber's Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Paul Favors Surgeon by George MacDonald. The Borderland. Mr. Drew the Draper was, of all his friends, the one who most frequently visited his old pastor. He had been first, although a deacon of the church, in part to forsake his ministry, and join the worship of, as he honestly believed, a less scriptural community, because in the abbey church he heard better news of God and his kingdom. To him, rightly, the gospel was everything, and this church or that, save for its sake, less than nothing and vanity. It had hurt Mr. Drake not a little at first, but he found Drew, in consequence, only the more warmly his personal friend, and since learning to know Wingfold, had heartily justified his defection. And now that he was laid up, he missed something any day that passed without a visit from the draper. One evening Drew found him very poorly, though neither the doctor nor Dorothy could prevail upon him to go to bed. He could not rest, but kept walking about, his eye feverish, his pulse fluttering. He welcomed his friend even more warmly than usual, and made him sit by the fire while he paced the room, turning and turning like a caged animal that fain would be king of an infinite space. "'I am sorry to see you so uncomfortable,' said Mr. Drew. "'On the contrary, I feel uncommonly well,' replied the pastor. "'I always measure my health by my power of thinking, and to-night my thoughts are like birds.' or like bees rather that keep flying in delight from one lovely blossom to another only the fear keeps intruding that an hour may be at hand when my soul will be dark and it will seem as if the lord had forsaken me does not uh, our daily bread mean our spiritual as well as our bodily bread said the draper is it not just as wrong in respect of the one as of the other to distrust god for to-morrow when you have enough for to-day is he a god of times and seasons of this and that or is he the all in all you are right old friend said the minister and ceasing his walk he sat down by the fire opposite him i am faithless still o oh, father in heaven give us this day our daily bread I suspect, Drew, that I have had as yet no more than the shadow of an idea how immediately I—we live upon the Father. I will tell you something. I had been thinking what it would be if God were now to try me with heavenly poverty, as for a short time he tried me with earthly poverty. That is, if he were to stint me of life itself— not to give me enough of himself to live upon, enough to make existence feel a good. The fancy grew to a fear, laid hold upon me, and made me miserable. Uh, suppose, for instance, I said to myself, I were no more to have any larger visitation of thoughts and hopes and aspirations than old Mrs. Bloxham, who sits from morning to night with the same stocking on her needles and absolutely the same expression, or as near nothing as may be upon human countenance, nor changes whoever speaks to her. She says uh, the Lord is with her, suggested the draper. Well, uh, rejoined the minister in a slow cogitative tone, and plainly life is to her worth having, added the draper. Clearly she has as much of life as is necessary to her present stage. Ah, you are right. I have been saying just the same things to myself, and I trust when the Lord comes he will not find me without faith. But just suppose life were to grow altogether uninteresting. Suppose certain moods, such as you, with all your good spirits and blessed temper, must surely sometimes have experienced. Suppose they were to become fixed, and life to seem utterly dull, God nowhere, and your own dreary self, and nothing but that self everywhere. Let me read you a chapter of St. John, said the draper. Presently I will, but I am not in the right mood just this moment. 
let me tell you first how i came to my present mood don't mistake me i am not possessed by the idea i am only trying to understand its nature and set a trap fit to catch it if it should creep into my inner premises and from an idea swell to a seeming fact well i had a strange kind of a vision last night uh, uh, no not a vision uh, yes a kind of vision anyhow a very strange experience i don't know whether the draught uh, the doctor gave me i wish i had poor faber back this fellow is fitter to doctor oxen and mules than men i don't know whether the draught had anything to do with it i thought i tasted something sleepy on it anyhow thought is thought and truth is truth whatever drug no less than whatever joy or sorrow may have been midwife to it the first i remember of the mental experience whatever it may have to be called is that i was coming awake returning to myself after some period wherein consciousness had been quiescent of place or time or circumstance i knew nothing i was only growing aware of being i speculated upon nothing i did not even say to myself i was dead and now i am coming alive i only felt and i had but one feeling and that feeling was love the outgoing of a longing heart toward uh, i could not tell what uh, toward uh, i cannot describe the feeling uh, toward the only existence there was and that was everything toward pure being not as an abstraction but as the one actual fact whence the world men and me a something i knew only by being myself an existence it was more me than myself yet it was not me or i could not have loved it i never thought me myself by myself my very existence was the consciousness of this absolute existence in and through and around me it made my heart burn and the burning of my heart was my life and the burning was the presence of the absolute if you can imagine a growing fruit all blind and deaf yet loving the tree it could neither look upon nor hear knowing it only through the unbroken arrival of its life therefrom that is something like what i felt i suspect the from of the feeling was supplied by shadowy memory of the time before i was born while yet my life grew upon the life of my mother by degrees came a change what seemed the fire in me burned and burned until it began to grow light in which light i began to remember things i had read and known about jesus christ and his father and my father and with those memories the love grew and grew till i could hardly bear the glory of god in his christ it made me love so intensely then the light seemed to begin to pass out beyond me somehow and therewith i remembered the words of the lord let your light so shine before men only i was not letting it shine for while i loved like that i could no more keep it from shining than i could the sun the next thing was that i began to think of one i had loved then of another and another and another then of all together whomever i had loved one after another then all together and the light that went out from me was a nimbus enfolding every one in a speechlessness of my love but lo then the light stayed not there but leaving them not went on beyond them reaching and enfolding every one of those also whom after the manner of men i had on earth merely known and not loved and therewith i knew that for all the rest of the creation of god i needed but the hearing of the ears or the seeing of the eyes to love each and every one in his and her degree whereupon such a perfection of bliss awoke in me that it seemed as if the fire of the divine sacrifice had at length seized upon my soul and i was dying of absolute glory which is love and love only i had all things yea the all and i was full and unutterably immeasurably content 
Yet still the light went flowing out and out from me, and love was life, and life was light, and light was love. On and on it flowed, until at last it grew eyes to me, and I could see. Lo, before me was the multitude of the brothers and sisters whom I loved, individually, a many, many, not a mass. I loved every individual with that special, peculiar kind of love which alone belonged to that one, and to that one alone. The sight dazzled the eyes which love itself had opened. I said to myself, Ah, how radiant, how lovely, how divine they are, and they are mine, every one, the many, for I love them. Then suddenly a whisper, not to my ear, I heard it far away, but whether in some distant cave of thought, away beyond the flaming walls of the universe, or in some forgotten dungeon corner of my own heart, I could not tell. O oh man, it said, what a being, what a life is thine. See all these souls, these fires of life, regarding and loving thee. It is in the glory of thy love their faces shine. Their hearts receive it, and send it back in joy. Seest thou not all their eyes fixed upon thine? Seest thou not the light come and go upon their faces, as the pulses of thy heart flow and ebb? See now they flash, and now they fade. Blessed art thou, O man, as none else in the universe of God is blessed. It was, or seemed, only a voice. But therewith, horrible to tell, the glow of another fire arose in me, an orange and red fire, and it went out from me and withered all the faces, and the next moment there was darkness. All was black as night. But my being was still awake. Only if then there was bliss, now was there the absolute blackness of darkness, the positive negation of bliss, the recoil of self to devour itself, and forever. The consciousness of being was intense, but in all the universe was there nothing to enter that being and make it other than an absolute loneliness. It was, and forever, a loveless, careless, hopeless monotony of self-knowing, a hell with but one demon, and no fire to make it cry. My self was the hell, my known self the demon of it, a hell of which I could not find the walls, cold and dark and empty, and I longed for a flame that I might know there was a God. Somehow, I only remembered God as a word. However, I knew nothing of my whence or whither. One time there might have been a God, but there was none now. If there ever was one, he must be dead. Certainly there was no God to love, for if there was a God, how could the creature whose very essence was to him an evil love the creator of him? I had the word love, and I could reason about it in my mind, but I could not call up the memory of what the feeling of it was like. The blackness grew and grew. I hated life fiercely. I hated the very possibility of a God who had created me a blot of blackness. With that I felt blackness begin to go out from me, as the light had gone before. Not that I remembered the light. I had forgotten all about it, and remembered it only after I awoke. Then came the words of the Lord to me. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness! And I knew what was coming. Oh, horror! In a moment more I should see the faces of those I had once loved, dark with the blackness that went out from my very existence. Then I should hate them, and my being would then be a hell to which the hell I now was would be a heaven. There was just grace enough left in me for the hideousness of the terror to wake me. I was cold as if I had been dipped in a well. But, oh... How I thanked God that I was what I am, and might yet hope after what I may be. 
the minister's face was pale as the horse that grew gray when death matted him and his eyes shone with a feverous brilliancy the draper breathed a deep breath and rubbed his white forehead the minister rose and began again to pace the room drew would have taken his departure but feared leaving him in such a state he bethought himself of something that might help to calm him and took out his pocket-book the minister's dream had moved him deeply but he restrained himself all he could from manifesting his emotion your vision he said reminds me of some verses of mr wingfold's of which mrs wingfold very kindly let me take a copy i have them here in my pocket-book may i read them to you the minister gave rather a listless consent but that was enough for mr drew's object and he read the following poem shall the dead praise thee i cannot praise thee by his instrument the organ-master sits nor moves a hand for see the organ pipes o'erthrown and bent twisted and broke like cornstalks tempest fanned i well could praise thee for a flower a dove but not for life that is not life in me not for a being that is less than love a barren shoal half lifted from a sea and for the land whence no wind bloweth ships and all my living dead ones thither blown rather i'd kiss no more their precious lips than carry them a heart so poor and prone yet i do bless thee thou art what thou art that thou dost know thyself that thou dost know a perfect simple tender rhythmic heart beating thy blood to all in bounteous flow and i can bless thee too for every smart for every disappointment ache and fear for every hook thou fixest in my heart for every burning cord that draws me near but prayer of these wake not a song thyself i crave come thou or all thy gifts away i fling thou silent i am but an empty grave think to me father and i am a king then like the wind stirred bones my pipe shall quake the air burst as from burning house and blaze and swift contending harmony shall shake thy windows with a storm of jubilant praise thee praised i haste me humble to my own then love not shame shall bow me at their feet then first and only to my stature grown fulfilled of love a servant all complete at first the minister seemed scarcely to listen as he sat with closed eyes and knitted brows but gradually the wrinkles disappeared like ripples an expression of repose supervened and when the draper lifted his eyes at the close of his reading there was a smile of quiet satisfaction on the now aged looking countenance as he did not open his eyes drew crept softly from the room saying to dorothy as he left the house that she must get him to bed as soon as possible she went to him and now found no difficulty in persuading him but something she could not tell what in his appearance alarmed her and she sent for the doctor he was not at home and had expected to be out all night she sat by his bedside for hours but at last as he was quietly asleep ventured to lay herself on a couch in the room there she too fell fast asleep and slept till morning undisturbed when she went to his bedside she found him breathing softly and thought him still asleep but he opened his eyes looked at her for a moment fixedly and then said dorothy child of my heart uh, things may be very different from what we have been taught or what we may of ourselves desire but every difference will be the step of an ascending stair each nearer and nearer to the divine perfection which alone can satisfy the children of a god alone supply the poorest of their cravings she stooped and kissed his hand then hastened to get him some food when she returned he was gone up the stair of her future leaving behind him like a last message that all was well the loveliest smile frozen upon a face of peace 
the past had laid hold upon his body he was free in the eternal dorothy was left standing at the top of the stair of the present This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 49 of Paul Faber's Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Paul Faber's Surgeon by George MacDonald empty houses the desolation that seized on dorothy seemed at first overwhelming there was no refuge for her the child's tears questions and outbreaks of merriment were but a trouble to her even wingfold and helen could do little for her sorrow was her sole companion her sole comfort for a time against the dreariness of life then came something better as her father's form receded from her his spirit drew nigh i mean no phantom out of hades no consciousness of local presence such things may be i think sometimes they are but i would rather know my friend better through his death than only be aware of his presence about me that will one day follow how much the more precious than the absence will have doubled its revelations, its nearness. To Dorothy, her father's character, especially as developed in his later struggles after righteousness, the root righteousness of God, opened up itself day by day. She saw him combating his faults, dejected by his failures, encouraged by his successes, and he grew to her the dearer for his faults, as she perceived more plainly how little he had sighted, how hard he had fought with them the very imperfections he repudiated gathered him honour in the eyes of her love sowed seeds of perennial tenderness in her heart she saw how in those last days he had been overcoming the world with accelerated victory and growing more and more of the real father that no man can be until he has attained to sonship the marvel is that our children are so tender and so trusting to the slow developing father in us the truth and faith which the great father has put in the heart of the child makes him the nursing father of the fatherhood of his father and thus in part it is that the children of men will come at last to know the great father the family with all its powers for the development of society is a family because it is born and rooted in and grows out of the very bosom of god Gabriel told Zacharias that his son John, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, should turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Few griefs can be so paralyzing as, for a time, that of a true daughter upon the departure, which at first she feels as a loss, of a true parent. But through the rifts of such heartbreaks the light of love shines clearer, and where love is, there is eternity." One day, he who is the householder of the universe will begin to bring out of its treasury all the old things, as well as the better new ones. How true must be the bliss up to which the intense realities of such sorrows are needful to force the way for the faithless heart and feeble will. Lord, like thy people of old, we need yet the background of the thundercloud against which to behold thee. But one day, the only darkness around thy dwelling will be the too much of thy brightness. For thou art the perfection which every heart sighs toward, no mind can attain unto. If thou wast one whom created mind could embrace, thou wouldst be too small for those whom thou hast made in thine own image. The infinite creatures that seek their God, a being to love and know infinitely. For the created to know perfectly, would be to be damned for ever in the nutshell of the finite he who is his own cause alone can understand perfectly and remain infinite for that which is known and that which knows are in him the same infinitude 
Faber came to see Dorothy, solemn, sad, kind. He made no attempt at condolence, did not speak a word of comfort, but he talked of the old man, revealing for him a deep respect, and her heart was touched and turned itself toward him. Some change, she thought, must have passed upon him. Her father had told her nothing of his relation to Amanda. It would have to be done some day, but he shrunk from it. She could not help suspecting that there was more between Faber and him than she had at first imagined. But there was in her a healthy contentment with ignorance, and she asked no questions. Neither did Faber make any attempt to find out whether she knew what had passed. Even about Amanda and any possible change in her future, he was listless. He had never been a man of plans, and had no room for any now under the rubbish of a collapsed life. His days were gloomy, and his nights troubled. He dreamed constantly either of Amanda's mother or of Juliet, sometimes of both together, and of endless perplexity between them. Sometimes he woke weeping. He did not now despise his tears, for they flowed neither from suffering nor self-pity, but from love and sorrow and repentance. A question of the possibility of his wife's being yet alive would occasionally occur to him, but he always cast the thought from him as a folly in which he dared not indulge, lest it should grow upon him and unman him altogether. Better she were dead than suffering what his cruelty might have driven her to. He had weakened her self-respect by insult, and then driven her out helpless. People said he took the loss of his wife coolly, but the fact was that in every quiet way he had been doing all man could do to obtain what information concerning her there might possibly be to be had. Naturally, he would have his proceedings as little as possible in the public mouth and to employ the police or the newspapers in such a quest was too horrible. But he had made inquiries in all directions. He had put a question or two to Polworth, but at that time he knew nothing of her, and did not feel bound to disclose his suspicions. Knowing not to what it might not expose her, he would not betray the refuge of a woman with a woman. Favor learned what everybody had learned, and for a time was haunted by the horrible expectation of further news from the lake. Every knock at the door made him start and turn pale, but the body had not floated and would not now. We have seen that in the light thrown upon her fault from the revived memory of his own, a reaction had set in. The tide of it grew fiercer as it ran. He had deposed her idol, the god who she believed could pardon, and the bare belief in whom certainly could comfort her. He had taken the place of her of that imaginary yet for some necessary being but when in the agony of repentant shame she looked to him for the pardon he alone could give her he had turned from her with loathing contempt and insult he was the one in the whole earth who by saying to her let it be forgotten could have lifted her into life and hope she had trusted in him and he an idol indeed had crumbled in the clinging arms of her faith. Had she not confessed to him what else he would never have known, humbling herself in a very ecstasy of repentance? Was it not an honor to any husband to have been so trusted by his wife? And had he not from very scorn refused to strike her? Was she not a woman still, a being before whom a man, when he can no longer worship, must weep? Can any fault, ten times worse than she had committed, make her that she was no woman? That he, merely as a man, owed her nothing? Her fault was grievous. It stung him to the soul. What then was it not to her? Not now for his own shame merely, or the most, did he lament it, but for the pity of it, that the lovely creature should not be clean, had not deserved his adoration that she was not the ideal woman, that a glory had vanished from the earth, that she he had loved was not in herself worthy. What then must be her sadness? And this was his, the man's, response to her agony. This his balm for her woe, his chivalry, his manhood, 
to dash her from him and to do his potent part to fix forever upon her the stain which he bemoaned stained why then did he not open his arms wide and take her poor sad stain and all to the bosom of love which by the very agony of its own grief and its pity over hers would have burned her clean what did it matter for him what was she what was his honour had he had any what fitter use for honour than to sacrifice it for the redemption of a wife that would be to honour honour but he had none there was not a stone on the face of the earth that would consent to be thrown at her by him amen men gentlemen was there ever such a poor sneaking scarecrow of an idol as that gaping straw-stuffed inanity you worship and call honour it is not honour it is but your honour it is neither gold nor silver nor honest copper but a vile worthless pinchbeck it may be however for i have not the honour to belong to any of your clubs that you no longer insult the world by using it at all it may be you have deposed it and enthroned another word of less significance to you still but what the recognized slang of the day may be is nothing therefore unnecessary to what i have to say which is that the man is a wretched ape who will utter a word about a woman's virtue when in himself soul and body there is not a clean spot when his body nothing but the furnace of the grave his soul nothing but the eternal fire can purify for him is many a harlot far too good she is yet capable of devotion she would like her sisters of old recognize the holy if she saw him while he would pass by his maker with a rude stare or the dullness of the brute which he has so assiduously cultivated in him by degrees faber grew thoroughly disgusted with himself then heartily ashamed were it possible for me to give every finest shade and gradation of the change he underwent there would be still an unrepresented mystery which i had not compassed but were my analysis correct as fact itself and my showing of it as exact words as i could make it never a man on whom such change had not at least begun to pass would find in it any revelation he ceased altogether to vaunt his denials not that now he had discarded them but simply because he no longer delighted in them they were not interesting to him any more he grew yet paler and thinner he ate little and slept ill and the waking hours of the night were hours of torture he was out of health and he knew it but that did not comfort him it was wrong and its misery that had made him ill not illness that had made him miserable was he a weakling a fool not to let the past be the past things without all remedy should be without regard what's done is done but not every strong man who has buried his murdered in his own garden and set up no stone over them can forget where they lie it needs something that is not strength to be capable of that the dead alone can bury their dead so and there is a bemoaning that may help to raise the dead but sometimes such dead come alive unbemoaned oblivion is not a tomb strong enough to keep them down the time may come when a man will find his past but a cenotaph and his dead all walking and making his present night hideous and when such dead walk so it is a poor chance they do not turn out vampires when she had buried her dead out of her sight dorothy sought solitude and the things unseen more than ever the winged folds were like swallows about her never folding their wings in ministry but not haunting her with bodily visitation she never refused to see them but they understood the hour was not yet when their presence would be a comfort to her the only comfort the heart can take must come not from but through itself day after day she would go into the park avoiding the lodge and there brood on the memories of her father and his late words and ere long she began to feel nearer to him than she had ever felt while he was with her for where the outward sign has been understood the withdrawing of it will bring the inward fact yet nearer 
when our lord said the spirit of himself would come to them after he was gone he but promised the working of one of the laws of his father's kingdom it was about to operate in loftiest grade most people find the first of a bereavement more tolerable than what follows they find in its fever a support when the wound in the earth is closed and the wave of life has again rushed over it when things have returned to their wanted now desiccated show then the very sahara of desolation opens around them and for a time existence seems almost insupportable with dorothy it was different alive in herself she was hungering and thirsting after life therefore death could not have dominion over her to her surprise she found also she could not tell how the illumination had come she wondered even how it should ever have been absent that since her father's death many of her difficulties had vanished some of them remembering there had been such she could hardly recall sufficiently to recognize them she had been lifted into a region above that wherein moved the questions which had then disturbed her peace from a point of clear vision she saw the things themselves so different that those questions were no longer relevant the things themselves misconceived naturally no satisfaction can be got from meditation upon them or from answers sought to the questions they suggest if it be objected that she had no better ground for believing them before i answer that if a man should be drawing life from the heart of god it could matter little though he were unable to give a satisfactory account of the mode of its derivation that the man lives is enough that another denies the existence of any such life save in the man's self-fooled imagination is nothing to the man who lives it his business is not to raise the dead but to live not to convince the blind that there is such a faculty of sight but to make good use of his eyes he may not have an answer to any one objection raised by the adopted children of science their adopted mother raises none do that which he believes but there is no more need that should trouble him than that a child should doubt his bliss at his mother's breast because he cannot give the chemical composition of the milk he draws that in the thing which is the root of the bliss is rather beyond chemistry is a man not blessed in his honesty being unable to reason of the first grounds of property if there be truth that truth must be itself must exercise its own blessing nature upon the soul which receives it in loyal understanding that is in obedience a man may accept no end of things as facts which are not facts and his mistakes will not hurt him he may be unable to receive many facts as facts and neither they nor his refusal of them will hurt him he may not a whit the less be living in and by the truth he may be quite unable to answer the doubts of another but if in the progress of his life those doubts should present themselves to his own soul then will he be able to meet them he is in the region where all true answers are gathered he may be unable to receive this or that embodiment or form of truth not having yet grown to its level but it is no matter so long as when he sees a truth he does it to see and not do would at once place him in eternal danger hence a man of ordinary intellect and little imagination may yet be so radiant in nobility as to the true poet heart to be right worshipful there is in the man who does the truth the radiance of life essential eternal a glory infinitely beyond any that can belong to the intellect beyond any that can ever come within its scope to be judged proven or denied by it through experiences doubtful even to the soul in which they pass the life may yet be flowing in to know god is to be in the secret place of all knowledge and to trust him changes the atmosphere surrounding mystery and seeming contradiction from one of pain and fear to one of hope the unknown may be some lovely truth in store for us which yet we are not good enough to apprehend a man may dream all night that he is awake and when he does wake be none the less sure that he is awake in that he thought so all the night when he was not but he will find himself no more able to prove it than he would have been then only able to talk better about it 
the differing consciousnesses of the two conditions cannot be produced in evidence or embodied in forms of the understanding but my main point is this that not to be intellectually certain of a truth does not prevent the heart that loves and obeys that truth from getting its truth good from drawing life from its holy factness present in the love of it as yet dorothy had no plans except to carry out those of her father and mainly for juliet's sake to remove to the old house as soon as ever the work there was completed but the repairs and alterations were of some extent and took months nor was she desirous of shortening juliet's sojourn with the Palworths. the longer that lasted with safety the better for juliet and herself too she thought on christmas eve the curate gave his wife a little poem helen showed it to dorothy and dorothy to juliet by this time she had some genuine teaching far more than she recognized as such and the spiritual song was not altogether without influence upon her here it is that holy thing they all were looking for a king to slay their foes and lift them high thou camest a little baby thing that made a woman cry o son of man to right my lot not but thy presence can avail yet on the road thy wheels are not nor on the sea thy sail my how or when thou wilt not heed but come down thine own secret stair that thou mayst answer all my need yea every bygone prayer This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 50 of Paul Faber, Surgeon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron Walker Paul Faber, Surgeon by George MacDonald fallow fields the spring was bursting in bud and leaf before the workmen were out of the old house the very next day dorothy commenced her removal every stick of the old furniture she carried with her every book of her father's she placed on the shelves of the library she had designed but she took care not to seem neglectful of juliet never failing to carry her the report of her husband as often as she saw him it was to Juliet like an odor from paradise making her weep, when Dorothy said that he looked sad, so different from his old self. One day Dorothy ventured hardly to hint, but to approach a hint of mediation. Juliet rose indignant. No one where he an angel from heaven should interfere between her husband and her. If they could not come together without that, there should be a mediator, but not such as Dorothy meant. No, Dorothy, she resumed, after a rather prolonged silence. The very word mediation would imply a gulf between us that could not be passed. But I have one petition to make you, Dorothy. You will be with me in my trouble, won't you? Certainly, Juliet. Please God I will. Then promise me, if I can't get through, if I'm going to die, that you will bring him to me. I must see my Paul once again before the darkness. Wouldn't that be rather unkind? Rather selfish? returned Dorothy. She had been growing more and more pitiful of Paul. Juliet burst into tears, called Dorothy cruel, said she meant to kill her. How was she to face it but in the hope of death? And how was she to face death but in the hope of seeing Paul once again for the last time? She was certain she was going to die. She knew it. And if Dorothy would not promise, she was not going to wait for such a death. But there will be a doctor, said Dorothy. And how am I? Juliet interrupted her not with tears, but words of indignation. Did Dorothy dare imagine she would allow any man but her Paul to come near her? Did she? Could she? What did she think of her? But of course she was prejudiced against her. It was too cruel. The moment she could get in a word, Dorothy begged her to say what she wished. You do not imagine, Juliet, she said, that I could take such a responsibility on myself. I have thought it all over, answered Juliet. There are women properly qualified, and you must find one. When she says I am dying, when she gets frightened, 
you will send for my husband? Promise me. Juliet, I will, answered Dorothy, and Juliet was satisfied. But notwithstanding her behaviors continuing so much the same, a change, undivined by herself as well as unsuspected by her friend, had begun to pass upon Juliet. Every change must begin further back than the observation of man can reach, in regions, probably, of which we have no knowledge. To the eyes of his own wife, a man may seem in the gall of bitterness and the bond of inequity, when, larger, other eyes than ours, may be watching with delight the germ of righteousness swell within the enclosing husk of evil. Sooner might the man of science detect the first moment of actinic impact and the simultaneously following change in the hitherto slumbering acorn than the watcher of humanity make himself aware of the first movement of repentance. The influences now for some time operative upon her were the more powerful that she neither suspected nor could avoid him. She had a vague notion that she was kind to her host and hostess, that she was patronizing them, that her friend Dorothy, with whom she would afterwards arrange the matter, filled their hands for her use, that, in fact, they derived benefit from her presence. And surely they did, although not as she supposed. The only benefits they reaped were invaluable ones, such as spring from love and righteousness and neighborhood. She little thought how she interfered with the simple pleasures and comforts of the two. How many a visit of friends, whose talk with a holy revelry of thought and utterance, Polworth warded, to avoid the least danger of her discovery. How often fear for her shook the delicate frame of Ruth. How often her host left some book unbought that he might procure instead of something to tempt her to eat. How often her hostess turned faint in cooking for her. The crooked creatures pitied, as well they might, the lovely lady. They believed that Christ was in her, that the deepest in her was the nature he had made, his own, and not that which she had gathered to herself and thought her own. For the sake of the Christ hidden in her, her own deepest, best, purest self, that she might be lifted from the dust heap of the life she had for herself ruined, into the clear air of a pure will and the divine presence, they counted their best labor most fitly spent. It is the human we love in each other, and the human is the Christ. What we do not love is the devilish. No more the human than the morrow's wormy mass was the manna of God. To be for the Christ in a man is the highest love you can give him. For in the unfolding alone of that Christ can the individuality, the genuine peculiarity of the man, the man himself, be perfected. The flower of his nature be developed, in its own distinct loveliness, beauty, splendor, and brought to its idea. The main channel through which the influences of the gnomes reached the princess was their absolute simplicity. They spoke and acted what was in them. Through this open utterance, their daily common righteousness revealed itself, their gentleness, their love of all things living, their care of each other, their acceptance as the will of God concerning them of whatever came, their general satisfaction with things as they were, though it must in regard to some of them have been in hope that they would soon pass away, for one of the things Juliet least could fail to observe was their suffering patience. They always spoke as if they felt where their words were going, as if they were hearing them arrive, as if the mind they addressed were a bright silver table on which they must not set down even the cup of water of life roughly. It must make no scratch, no jar, no sound beyond a faint sweet salutation. Pain had taught them not sensitiveness but delicacy. A hundred are sensitive for one that is delicate. Sensitiveness is a miserable, a cheap thing in itself, but invaluable if it be used for the nurture of delicacy. They refused to receive offense. Their care was to give none. The burning spot in the center of that distorted spine, which ought to have lifted Ruth up to a lovely woman, but had failed and sunk and ever after ached bitterly, as if with defeat, had made her pitiful over the pains of humanity? She could bear it, for there was something in her deeper than pain, but alas for those who were not thus upheld. Her agony drove her to pray for the whole human race, exposed to like passion with her. The asthmatic choking which so often made Polworth's nights a long misery taught him sympathy with all prisoners and captives, chiefly with those bound in the bonds of an evil conscience. To such he held himself specially devoted. They thought little of bearing pain. To know they had caused it would have been torture. Each, graciously uncomplaining, was tender over the ailing of the other. Juliet had not been long with them before she found the garments she had in her fancy made for them did not fit them, and she had to devise afresh. They were not gnomes, kobolds, goblins or dwarfs, but a prince and a princess of sweet nobility, who had loved each other in beauty and strength, 
and knew that they were each crushed in the shell of a cruel and mendacious enchantment. How they served each other! The uncle would just as readily help the niece with her saucepans as the niece would help the uncle to find a passage in Shakespeare or a stanza in George Herbert, and to hear them talk. For some time Julia did not understand them and did not try. She had not an idea what they were talking about. Then she began to imagine they must be weak in the brain, a thing not unlikely with such spines as theirs, and had silly secrets with each other like children, which they enjoyed talking about chiefly because none could understand but themselves. Then she came to fancy it was herself and her affairs they were talking about, deliberating upon, in some mental if not lingual gibberish of their own. By and by it began to disclose itself to her that the wretched creatures, to mask their misery from themselves, were actually playing at the kingdom of heaven, speaking and judging and concluding of things of this world by quite other laws, other scales, other weights and measures than those in use in it. Everything was turned topsy-turvy in this their game of make-believe. Their religion was their chief end and interest, and their work their play, as lightly followed as diligently. What she counted their fancies, they seemed to count their business. Their fancies ran over upon their labor, and made every day look and feel like a harvest home, or the eve of a long-desired journey, for which every preparation but the last and lightest was over. Things which she saw no significance made them look very grave, and what she would have counted of some importance to such as they drew a mere smile from them. She saw all with bewildered eyes, much as his neighbors looked upon the strange carriage of Lazarus as represented by Robert Browning in the wonderful letter of the Arab physician. But after she had begun to take note of their sufferings, and come to mark their calm, their peace, their lighted eyes, their ready smiles, the patience of their very moans, she began to doubt whether somehow they might not be touched to finer issues than she. It was not, however, until after having, with no little reluctance and recoil, ministered to them upon an occasion in which both were disabled for some hours, that she began to feel they had a hold upon something unseen, the firmness of which hold made it hard to believe it closed upon an unreality. If there was nothing there, then these dwarfs, in the exercise of their foolish, diseased, distorted fancies, came nearer to the act of creation than any grandest of poets. For these, their inventions did more than rectify for them the wrongs of their existence, not only making of their chaos a habitable cosmos, but of themselves heroic dwellers in the same. Within the charmed circle of this their well-being, their unceasing ministrations to her wants, their thoughtfulness about her likings and dislikings, their sweetness of address, in wistful watching to discover the desire they might satisfy, or the solace they could bring, seemed every moment enticing her. They soothed the aching of her wounds, mollified with ointment the stinging rents in her wronged humanity. At first, when she found they had no set prayers in the house, she concluded that, for all the talk of the old gnome in the garden, they were not very religious. But by and by, she began to discover that no one could tell when they might not be praying, at the most unexpected time she would hear her host's voice somewhere uttering tones of glad beseeching, of outpour to adoration. One day, when she had a bad headache, the little man came into her room and, without a word to her, kneeled by her bedside and said, Father, who through thy son knowest pain, and who dost even now in thyself feel the pain of this thy child? Help her to endure until thou shalt say it is enough, and send it from her. Let it not overmaster her patience. Let it not be too much for her. What good it shall work in her, thou, Lord, needest not that we should instruct thee. Therewith he rose and left the room. For some weeks after she was jealous of latent design to bring their religion to bear upon her, but perceiving not a single direct approach, not the most covert hint of attack, she began gradually convinced that they had no such intent. Polworth was an absolute serpent of holy wisdom, and knew that upon certain conditions of the human being the only powerful influences of religion are the all but insensible ones. A man's religion, he said, ought never to be held too near his neighbor. It was like violets, hidden in the banks. They fill the air with their scent, but if a bunch of them is held to the nose, they stop away their own sweetness. Not unfrequently she heard one of them reading to the other, and by and by came to join them occasionally. Sometimes it would be a passage of the New Testament, sometimes of Shakespeare, or of this or that old English book, of which, in her so-called education, Juliet had never even heard, but of which the gatekeeper knew every landmark. He would often stop the reading to talk, explaining and illustrating what the writer meant, in a way that filled Juliet with wonder. Strange, she would say to herself. 
I never thought of that. She did not suspect that it would have been strange indeed if she had thought of it. In her soul began to spring a respect for her host and hostess, such as she had never felt toward God or man. When, despite of many revulsions, it was a little established, it naturally went beyond them in the direction of that which they revered. The momentary hush that preceded the name of our Lord, and the smile that so often came with it, the halo, as it were, which in their feelings surrounded him, the confidence of closest understanding, the radiant humility with which they approached his idea, the way in which they brought the commonest questions side by side with the ideal of him in their minds, considering the one in the light of the other and answering it thereby, the way in which they took all he said and did on the fundamental understanding that his relation to God was perfect, but his relation to men as yet an imperfect, endeavoring relation, because of this distance from his father, these, with many another outcome of their genuine belief, began at length to make her feel, not merely as if there had been, but as if there really were such a person as Jesus Christ. The idea of him ruled potent in the lives of the two. Filling heart and brain and hands and feet, how could she help a certain awe before it, such as she had never felt? Suddenly, one day, the suspicion awoke in her mind that the reason why they asked her no questions, put out no feelers after discovery concerning her, must be that Dorothy had told them everything. If it was, never again would she utter word good or bad to one whose very kindness, she said to herself, was betrayal. The first moment, therefore, she saw Polworth alone, unable to be still an instant with her doubt unsolved. She asked him, with sick essay, but point blank, whether he knew why she was in hiding from her husband. I do not know, ma'am, he answered. Miss Drake told you nothing? pursued Juliet. Nothing more than I know already, that she could not deny when I put it to her. But how did you know anything? She almost cried out in a sudden rush of terror as to what the public knowledge of her might after all be. If you will remember, ma'am, Polworth replied, I told you the first time I had the pleasure of speaking to you that it was by observing and reasoning upon what I observed that I knew you were alive and at the old house, but it may be some satisfaction to you to see how the thing took shape in my mind. Thereupon he set the whole process plainly before her. Fresh wonder, mingled with no little fear, laid hold upon Juliet. She felt not merely as if he could look into her, but as if he had only to look into himself to discover all her secrets. I should not have imagined you a person to trouble himself to that extent with other people's affairs she said, turning away. So far as my service can reach, the things of others are also mine, replied Polworth very gently. But you could not have had the smallest idea of serving me when you made all those observations concerning me. I had long desired to serve your husband, ma'am. Never from curiosity would I have asked a single question about you or your affairs. But what came to me I was at liberty to understand if I could, and use for lawful ends if I might. Juliet was silent. She dared hardly think. Lest the gnome should see her very thoughts in their own darkness, yet she yielded to one more urgent question that kept pushing to get out. She tried to say the words without thinking of the thing, lest he should thereby learn it. I suppose then you have your own theory as to my reasons for seeking shelter with Miss Drake for a while? She said, and the moment she said it, felt as if some demon had betrayed her, and used her organs to utter the words. If I have, ma'am, answered Polworth, it is for myself alone. I know the sacredness of married life too well to speculate irreverently on its affairs. I believe that many an awful crisis of human history is there past. Such, I presume, as God only sees and understands, the more carefully such are kept from the common eye and the common judgment, the better, I think. If Juliet left him with yet a little added fear, it was also with growing confidence and some comfort which the feeble presence of an infant humility served to enlarge. Polworth had not given much thought to the question of the cause of their separation. That was not of his business. What he could not well avoid seeing was that it could hardly have taken place since their marriage. He had at once, as a matter of course, concluded that it lay with the husband. But from what he had since learned of Juliet's character, he knew she had not the strength of either of moral opinion or of will to separate for any reason past and gone from the husband she loved so passionately. And there he stopped, refusing to think further, for he found himself on the verge of thinking what, in his boundless respect for women, he shrank with deepest repugnance from entertaining even as a transient flash of conjecture. 
One trifle I will here mention, as admitting latterly a single ray of light upon Polworth's character, Juliet had come to feel some desire to be useful in the house beyond her own room, and descrying not only dust, but what she judged disorder in her landlord's little library, for such she chose to consider him, which, to her astonishment in such a mere cottage, consisted of many more books than her husband's, and ten times as many readable ones, she offered to dust and rearrange them properly. Polworth instantly accepted her offer, with thanks, which were solely for the kindness of the intent. He could not possibly be grateful for the intended result, and left his books at her mercy. I do not know another man who, loving his books like Polworth, would have done so. Every book had its own place. He could, I speak advisedly, have laid his hand on any book of at least three hundred of them in the dark. While he used them with perfect freedom, and cared comparatively little about their covers, he handled them with a delicacy that looked almost like respect. He had seen ladies handle books, he said laughing to Wingfold in a fashion that would have made him afraid to trust them with a the child. It was a year after Juliet left the house before he got them by degrees muddled into order again, for it was only as he used them that he would alter their places, putting each when he had done with it for the moment as near where it had been before as he could, thus in time out of a neat chaos, restoring a useful work-a-day world. Dorothy's thoughts were in the meantime much occupied for Juliet. Now that she was so sadly free, she could do more for her. She must occupy her old quarters as soon as possible after the workmen had finished. She thought at first of giving out that a friend in poor health was coming to visit her, but she soon saw that would either involve lying or lead to suspicion, and perhaps discovery, and resolved to keep her presence in the house concealed from the outer world as before. But what was she to do with respect to Lisbeth? Could she trust her with the secret? She certainly could not trust Amanda. She would ask Helen to take the latter for a while and do her best to secure the silence of the former. She so represented the matter to Lisbeth as to rouse her heart in regard to it even more than her wonder. But her injunctions to secrecy were so earnest that the old woman was offended. She was no slip of a girl, she said, who did not know how to hold her tongue. She had had secrets to keep before now, she said, and in proof of her perfect trustworthiness, was proceeding to tell some of them when she read her folly in Dorothy's fixed regard and ceased. Lisbeth, said her mistress, you have been a friend for sixteen years, and I love you. But if I find that you have given the smallest hint, even that there is a secret in the house, I solemnly vow you shall not be another night in it yourself, and I shall ever after think of you as a wretched creature who periled the life of a poor, unhappy lady rather than take the trouble to rule her own tongue. Lisbeth trembled and did hold her tongue, in spite of the temptation to feel herself for just one instant the most important person in Glaston. As the time went on, Juliet became more fretful and more confiding. She was never cross with Ruth, why she could not have told, and when she had been cross to Dorothy, she was sorry for it. She never said she was sorry, but she tried to make up for it. Her husband had not taught her the virtue, both for relief and purification, that lies in the acknowledgment of wrong. To take up blame that is our own is to wither the very root of it. Juliet was pleased at the near prospect of the change, for she had naturally dreaded being ill in the limited accommodation of the lodge. She formally thanked the two crushed and rumpled little angels, begged them to visit her often, and proceeded to make her very small preparations with a fitful cheerfulness. Something might come of the change. She flattered herself. She had always indulged a vague fancy that Dorothy was devising help for her, and it was in part the disappointment of nothing having yet justified the expectation that had spoiled her behavior to her. But for a long time Dorothy had been talking of Paul in a different tone, and that very morning had spoken of him even with some admiration. It might be a prelude to something. Most likely Dorothy knew more than she chose to say. She dared ask no question for the dread of finding herself mistaken. She preferred the ignorance that left room for hope, but she did not like all Dorothy said in his praise, for her tone, if not her words, seemed to imply some kind of change in him. He might have his faults, she said to herself, like other men, but she had not yet discovered them, and any change would, in her eyes, be for the worse. Would she ever see her own old Paul again? One day, as Faber was riding at a good round trot along one of the back streets of Glaston, approaching his own house, he saw Amanda who still took every opportunity of darting out at an open door, running to him with outstretched arms, right in the face of Niger, just as if she expected the horse to stop and take her up. 
Unable to trust him so well as his dear old Ruber, he dismounted, and taking her in his arms, led Niger to his stable. He learned from her that she was staying with the Wingfolds, and took her home, after which his visits to the rectory were frequent. The Wingfolds could not fail to remark the tenderness with which he regarded the child. Indeed, it soon became clear that it was for her sake he came to them. The change that had begun in him, the loss of his self-regard following on the loss of Juliet, had left a great gap in his conscious being. Into that gap had instantly begun to shoot the all-clothing greenery of natural affection. His devotion to her did not at first cause them any wonderment. Everybody loved the little Amanda. They saw in him only another of the child's conquests, and rejoiced in the good the love might do him. Even when they saw him looking fixedly at her with eyes over clear, they set it down to the frustrated affection of the lonely, wifeless, childless man. But by degrees they did come to wonder a little. His love seemed to grow almost a passion. Strange thoughts began to move in their minds, looking from the one to the other of this love and the late tragedy. I wish, said the curate one morning as they sat at breakfast, if only for Faber's sake, that something definite was known about poor Juliet. There are rumors in the town, roving like poisonous fogs. Some profess to believe he has murdered her, getting rid of her body utterly, then spreading the report that she had run away. Others say she is mad, and he has her in the house, but stupefied with drugs to keep her quiet. Drew told me he had even heard it darkly hinted that he was making experiments upon her to discover the nature of life. It is dreadful to think what a man is exposed to from evil imaginations groping after theory. I dare hardly think what might happen should those fancies get rooted among the people. Many of them are capable of brutality. For my part, I don't believe the poor woman is dead yet. Helen replied she did not believe that, in her sound mind, Juliet would have had the resolution to kill herself, but who could tell what state of mind she was in at the time? There was always something mysterious about her, something that seemed to want explanation. Between them it was concluded that, the next time Faber came, Wingfold should be plain with him. He therefore told him that if he could cast any light on his wife's disappearance, it was most desirable he should do so for reports were abroad greatly to his disadvantage. Faber answered, with a sickly smile of something like contempt, that they had had a quarrel the night before, for which he was to blame, that he had left her, and the next morning she was gone, leaving everything, even to her wedding ring, behind her, except the clothes she wore, that he had done all he could to find her, but had been utterly foiled. More he could not say. The next afternoon he sought an interview with the curate in his study, and told him everything he had told Mr. Drake. The story seemed to explain a good deal more than it did, leaving the curate with the conviction that the disclosure of this former relation had caused the quarrel between him and his wife, and more doubtful than ever as to Juliet's having committed suicide. End of chapter 50「ファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウトオブフォーファイブアウ It was a lovely moonlighted midnight when they set out, the four of them, to walk from the gate across the park to the old house. Like shadows, they flitted over the green sward, all silent as shadows. Scarcely a word was spoken as they went, and the stray syllable now and then was uttered softly as in the presence of the dead. Suddenly, but gently, opened in Juliet's mind a sense of the wonder of life. The moon, having labored through a heap of cloud into a lake of blue, seemed to watch her with curious interest as she toiled over the level sward. The air now and then made a soundless sigh about her head, like a waft of wings invisible. The heavenly distances seemed to have come down and closed her softly in. All at once, as if waked from an eternity of unconsciousness, she found herself, by no will of her own, with no power to say nay, present to herself, 
a target for sorrow to shoot at, a tree for the joy birds to light upon and depart, a woman scorned of the man she loved, bearing within her another life, which by no will of its own, and with no power to say nay, must soon become aware of its own joys and sorrows, and have no cause to bless her for her share in its being. Surely there must be a heart life somewhere in the universe, to whose will the unself-willed life could refer for the justification of its existence, for its motive, for the idea of it that should make it seem right to itself, to whom it could cry to have its divergence from that idea rectified? Was she not now, she thought, upon her silent way to her own deathbed, walking, walking, the phantom of herself in her own funeral? What if, when the bitterness of death was past, and her child was waking in this world, she should be waking in another, to a new life, inevitable as the former, another, yet the same? We know not whence we came. Why may we not be going whither we know not? We did not know we were coming here. Why may we not be going there without knowing it? This much more open-eyed, more aware that we know we do not know? That terrible morning she had come this way, rushing swiftly to her death. She was caught and dragged back from Hades to be thereafter, now driven slowly toward it, like an ox to the slaughter. She could not avoid her doom, and she must encounter that which lay before her. That she shrunk from it with fainting terror was nothing. On she must go. What an iron net! What a combination of all chains and manacles and fetters and iron masks and cages and prisons was this existence! At least to a woman, on whom was laid the burden of the generations to follow. In the lore of centuries was there no spell whereby to be rid of it? No dark saying that taught how to make sure death should be death, and not a fresh waking? That the future is unknown, assures only danger. New circumstances have seldom to the old heart proved better than the new piece of cloth to the old garment. Thus meditated Juliet. She was beginning to learn that, until we get to the heart of life, its outsides will be forever fretting us, that among the mere garments of life we can never be at home. She was hard to teach, but God's circumstance had found her. When they came near the brow of the hollow, Dorothy ran on before, to see that all was safe. Lisbeth was, of course, the only one in the house. The descent was to Juliet like the going down to the gates of death. Polworth, who had been walking behind with Ruth, stepped to her side the moment Dorothy left her. Looking up in her face, with the moonlight full upon his large features, he said, I have been feeling all the way, ma'am, as if another was walking beside us. The same who said, I am with you always even to the end of the world. He could not have meant that only for the few that were so soon to follow him home. He must have meant it for those also who should believe by their word. Becoming disciples, all promises the Master made to his disciples are theirs. It matters little for poor me, answered Juliet with a sigh. You know I do not believe in him. But I believe in him, answered Polworth, and Ruth believes in him. And so does Miss Drake, and if he be with us, he cannot be far from you. With that he stepped back to Ruth's side and said no more. Dorothy opened the door quickly. The moment their feet were on the steps, they entered quickly, and she closed it behind them at once, fearful of some eye in the night. How different was the house from that which Juliet had left? The hall was lighted with a soft lamp showing dull, warm colors on walls and floors. The dining room door stood open. A wood fire was roaring on the hearth and candles were burning on a snowy table spread for a meal. Dorothy had a chamber candle in her hand. She showed the Paulworths into the dining room, then, turning to Juliet, said, I will take you to your room, dear. I have prepared your old quarters for you, she said as they went up the stair. With the words there rushed upon Juliet such a memory of mingled dreariness and terror that she could not reply. You know it will be safest, added Dorothy, and as she spoke set the candle on a table at the top of the stair, they went along the passage, and she opened the door of the closet. All was dark. She opened the door in the closet, and Juliet started back with amazement. It was the loveliest room, and, like a marvel in a fairy tale, the great round moon was shining gloriously, first through the upper branches of a large yew, and then through an oriel window, filled with lozenges of soft greenish glass, through which fell a lovely picture on the floor in light and shadow and something that was neither or both. Juliet turned in delight, threw her arms around Dorothy, and kissed her. I thought I was going into a dungeon, she said, and it is a room for a princess. Sometimes almost believe, Juliet, 
returned Dorothy, that God will give us a great surprise one day. Juliet was tired and did not want to hear about God. If Dorothy had done all this, she thought, for the sake of reading her a good lesson, it spoiled it all. She did not understand the love that gives beyond the gift, that mantles over the cup and spills the wine into the spaces of eternal hope. The room was so delicious that she begged to be excused from going down to supper. Dorothy suggested it would not be gracious to her friends. Much as she respected and indeed loved them, Juliet resented the word friends, but yielded. The little two would themselves rather have gone home. It was so late, but stayed, fearing to disappoint Dorothy. If they did run a risk by doing so, it was for a good reason, therefore of no great consequence. How your good father will delight to watch you here sometimes, Miss Drake, said Polworth, if those who are gone are permitted to see walking themselves unseen. Juliet shuddered. Dorothy's father not two months gone and the dreadful little man to talk to her like that. Do you then think, said Dorothy, that the dead only seem to have gone from us? And her eyes looked like storehouses of holy questions. I know so little, he answered, that I dare hardly say I think anything. But if, as our Lord implies, there be no such thing as that which the change appears to us. Nothing like that we are thinking of when we call it death. May it not be that. Obstinate as is the appearance of separation, there is, notwithstanding, none of it. I don't care, mind. His will is, and that is everything. But there can be no harm. Where I do not know his will, in venturing a maybe... I am sure he likes his little ones to tell their fancies in the dimmets about their nursery fire. Our souls yearning after light of any sort must be a pleasure to him to watch. But on the other hand, to resume the subject, it may be that, as it is good for us to miss them in the body that we may, the better, find them in the spirit. So it may be good for them also to miss our bodies that they may find our spirits. But, suggested Ruth, they had that kind of discipline while yet on earth, in the death of those who went before them, and so another sort might be better for them now. Might it not be more of a discipline for them to see, in those left behind, how they themselves, from lack of faith, went groping about in the dark, while crowds all about them knew perfectly what they could not bring themselves to believe? It might, Ruth, it might. Nor do I think anything to the contrary or it might be given to some and not to others, just as it was good for them. It may be that some can see some, or can see them sometimes, and watch their ways in partial glimpses of revelation. Who knows who may be about the house when all its mortals are dead for the night, and the last of the fires are burning unheeded? There are so many hours of both day and night, in most houses, in which those in and those out of the body need never cross each other's paths. And there are tales, legends, reports, many mere fiction doubtless, but some possibly of a different character, which represent this and that doer of evil as compelled, either by the law of his or her own troubled being, or by some law external thereto ever, or at fixed intervals, to haunt the moldering scenes of their past and ever dream horribly afresh the deeds done in the body. These, however, tend to no proof of what we have been speaking about, for such extravagant and erring spirit does not haunt the living from love, but the dead from suffering. In this life, however, few of us come really near to each other in the genuine simplicity of love, and that may be the reason why the credible stories of love meeting love across the strange difference are so few. It is a wonderful touch, I always think, in the play of Hamlet, that, while the prince gazes on the spirit of his father, noting every expression and gesture, even his dress, as he passes through his late wife's chamber, Gertrude, less unfaithful as widow than as wife, not only sees nothing, but by no sigh or hint, no sense in the air, no beat of her own heart, no creep even of her own flesh divines his presence is not only certain that she sees nothing, but that she sees all there is. She is the dead, not her husband. To the dead all are dead. 
The eternal life makes manifest both life and death. Please, Mr. Polworth, said Juliet, remember it is the middle of the night. No doubt it is just the suitable time, but I would rather not make one in an orgy of horrors. We have all to be alone presently. She hated to hear about death in the grandest of words, eternal life, which to most means nothing but prolonged existence, meant to her just death. If she had stolen a magic spell for avoiding it, she could not have shrunk more from any reference to the one thing commonest and most inevitable. Often as she tried to imagine the reflection of her own death in the mind of her Paul, the mere mention of the ugly things seemed to her ill-mannered, almost indecent. The Lord is awake all night, said Polworth, rising, and therefore the night is holy as the day. Ruth, we should be rather frightened to walk home under that awful sky if we thought the Lord was not with us. The night is fine enough, said Juliet. Yes, said Ruth, replying to her uncle, not to Juliet. But even if he were asleep, you remember how he slept once, and yet reproached his disciples with their fear and doubt. I do, but in the little faith with which he reproached them, he referred, not to himself, but to his father. Whether he slept or waked, it was all one. The sun may sleep for the father never sleeps. They stood beside each other, taking their leave, what little objects they were. Opposite the two graceful ladies who also stood beside each other, pleasant to look upon, sorrow and suffering, lack and weakness, though plain to see upon them both, had not yet greatly dimmed their beauty. The faces of the dwarfs, on the other hand, were marked and lined with suffering, but the suffering was dominated by peace and strength. There was no sorrow there, little lack, no weakness or fear, and a great hope. They never spent any time in pitying themselves. The trouble that alone ever clouded their sky was the suffering of others. Even for this they had comfort. Their constant ready help consoled both the sufferer and themselves. Will you come and see me if you die first, uncle? said Ruth as they walked home together in the moonlight. You will think how lonely I am without you. If it be within the law of things, if I be at liberty, and the things seem good for you, my Ruth, you may be sure I will come to you. But of one thing I am pretty certain, that such visions do not appear when people are looking for them. You must not go staring into the dark trying to see me. Do your work, pray your prayers, and be sure I love you. If I am to come, I will come. If I be in the hot noon or in the dark night, it may be with no sight and no sound, yet a knowledge of presence. Or I may be watching you, helping you, perhaps, and you never know it until I come to fetch you at the last, if I may. You have been daughter and sister and mother to me, my Ruth. You have been my one in the world. God, I think sometimes, has planted about you and me, my child, a cactus hedge of ugliness, that we might be so near and so lonely as to learn love, as few have learned it in this world. Love without fear, or doubt, or pain, or anxiety with constant satisfaction in presence, and calm content in absence. Of the last, however, I cannot boast much, seeing we have not been parted a day for. How many years is it, Ruth? Ah, Ruth, a bliss beyond speech is waiting us in the presence of the Master, where, seeing him as he is, we shall grow like him, and be no more either dwarfed or sickly. But you will have the same face, Ruth, else I should be forever missing something. But do you not think we shall be perfect all at once? No, not all at once. I cannot believe that. God takes time to what he does. The doing of it is itself good. It would be a sight for heavenly eyes to see you, like a bent and broken and withered lily, straightening and lengthening your stalk, and flushing into beauty. But fancy what it will be to see at length the very heart of the person you love, and love him perfectly, and that you can love him. Every love will then be a separate heaven, and all the heavens will blend in one perfect heaven, the love of God, the all in all. They were walking like children hand in hand. Ruth pressed that of her uncle, for she could not answer in words. Even to Dorothy their talk would have been vague, vague from the intervening mist of her own atmosphere. To them it was vague only from the wide stretch of its horizon the distance of its zenith. There is all difference between the vagueness belonging to an imperfect sight and the vagueness belonging to the distance of the outlook. 
But to walk on up the hill of duty is the only way out of the one into the other. I think some only know they are laboring, hardly know they are climbing, till they find themselves near the top. End of chapter 51。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 52 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron James Walker. Paul Faber, Surgeon, by George MacDonald. The Level of the Life. Dorothy's faith in Polworth had, in the meantime, largely increased. She had not only come to trust him thoroughly, but gained much strength from the confidence. As soon as she had taken Juliet her breakfast the next morning, she went to meet him in the park, for so they had arranged the night before. She had before acquainted him with the promise Juliet had exacted from her that she would call her husband the moment she seemed in danger, a possibility which Juliet regarded as a certainty. And had begged him to think how they could contrive to have favor within call. He had now a plan to propose with this object in view, but began apparently at a distance from it. You know, Miss Drake, he said, that I am well acquainted with every yard of this ground. Had your honored father asked me whether the old house was desirable for a residence, I should have expressed considerable doubt. But there is one thing which would greatly improve it. Would indeed, I hope, entirely remove my objection to it. Many years ago, I noted the state of the stone steps leading up to the door. They were much and diversely out of the level, and the cause was evident with the first great rain. The lake filled the whole garden to the top of the second step. Now, this, if it take place only once a year, must of course cause damp in the house. But I think there is more than that will account for. I have been in the cellars repeatedly, both before and since your father bought it, and always found them too damp. The cause of it, I think, is that the foundations are as low as the ordinary level of the water in the pond, and the ground at the depth is of large gravel. It seems to me that the water gets through to the house. I should propose, therefore, that from the bank of the lithe a tunnel be commenced. Rising at a gentle incline until it pierces the basin of the lake. The ground is your own to the river, I believe. It is, answered Dorothy. But I should be sorry to empty the lake altogether. My scheme, returned Polworth, includes a strong sluice by which you could keep the water at what height you pleased and at any moment send it into the river. The only danger would be of cutting through the springs, and I fancy they are less likely to be on the side next the river, where the ground is softer, else they would probably have found their way directly into it, instead of first hollowing out the pond. Would it be a difficult thing to do? asked Dorothy. I think not, answered Polworth. But with your permission, I will get a friend of mine, an engineer, to look into it. I leave it in your hands, said Dorothy. Do you think we will find anything at the bottom? Who can tell? But we do not know how near the bottom the tunnel may bring us. There may be fathoms of mud below the level of the river bed. One thing, thank God, we shall not find there. The same week all was arranged with the engineer. By a certain day, his men were to be at work on the tunnel. For some time now, Things had been going on much the same with all in whom my narrative is interested. There come lulls in every process, whether of growth or of tempest, whether of creation or destruction, and those lulls, coming as they do in the midst of force, are precious in their influence, because they are only lulls, and the forces are still at work. All the time the volcano is quiet, something is going on below. From the first moment of exhaustion, the next outbreak is preparing. To be faint is to begin to gather, as well as to cease to expend. Faber had been growing better. He sat more erect on his horse. His eye was keener, 
his voice more kindly, though hardly less sad, and his step was firm. His love to the child and her delight in his attentions were slowly leading him back to life. Every day, if but for a moment, he contrived to see her, and the wingfolds took care to remove every obstacle from the way of their meeting. Little they thought why Dorothy let them keep the child so long. As little did Dorothy know that what she yielded for the sake of the wife, they desired for the sake of the husband. At length, one morning came a break. Faber received a note from the gatekeeper, informing him that Miss Drake was having the pond at the foot of her garden emptied into the lithe by means of a tunnel, the construction of which was already completed. They were now boring for a small charge of gunpowder expected to liberate the water. The process of emptying would probably be rapid, and he had taken the liberty of informing Mr. Faber, thinking he might choose to be present. No one but the persons employed would be allowed to enter the grounds. This news gave him a greater shock than he could have believed possible. He thought he had supped full of horrors. At once he arranged with his assistant for being absent the whole day, and rode out, followed by his groom. At the gate, Polworth joined him, and walked beside him to the old house, where his groom, he said, could put up the horses. That done, he accompanied him to the mouth of the tunnel, and there left him. Faber sat down on the stump of a felled tree threw a big cloak, which he had brought across the pommel of his saddle, over his knees, and covered his face with his hands. Before him the river ran swiftly toward the level country, making a noise of watery haste. Also the wind was in the woods, with the noises of branches and leaves, but the only sounds he heard were the blows of the hammer on the boring chisel, coming dull, and as if from afar, out of the depths of the earth. What a strange, awful significance they had to the heart of Faber! But the end was delayed hour after hour, and there he still sat, now and then in a louder noise than usual lifting up the white face, and staring toward the mouth of the tunnel. At the explosion the water would probably rush in a torrent from the pit, and in half an hour, perhaps, the pond would be empty. But Polworth had taken good care there should be no explosion that day. Ever again came the blow of iron upon iron, and the boring had begun afresh. Into her lovely chamber Dorothy had carried to Juliet the glad tidings that her husband was within a few hundred yards of the house, and that she might trust Mr. Polworth to keep him there until all danger was over. Juliet now manifested far more courage than she had given reason to expect. It seemed as if her husband's nearness gave her strength to do without his presence. At length the child, a lovely boy, lay asleep in Dorothy's arms. The lovelier mother also slept. Polworth was on his way to stop the work, and let the doctor know that its completion must be postponed for a few days, when he heard the voice of Elizabeth behind him, calling as she ran. He turned and met her, then turned again and ran, as fast as his little legs could carry him to the doctor. Mr. Faber, he cried, there is a lady up there at the house, a friend of Miss Drake's, taken suddenly ill. You are wanted as quickly as possible. Faber answered not a word but went with hasty strides up the bank, and ran to the house. Polworth followed as fast as he could, panting and wheezing. Lisbeth received the doctor at the door. Tell my man to saddle my horse, and be at the back door immediately, he said to her. Polworth followed him up the stair to the landing, where Dorothy received Faber, and led him to Juliet's room. The dwarf seated himself on the top of the stair, almost within sight of the door. End of chapter 52。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 53 of Paul Faber, Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron Walker. Paul Faber, Surgeon, by George MacDonald. My Lady's Chamber. When Faber entered, a dim, rosy light from drawn window curtains filled the air. He could see little more than his way to the bed. Dorothy was in terror lest the discovery he must presently make should unnerve the husband for what might be required of the doctor. But Juliet kept her face turned aside, and a word from the nurse let him know at once what was necessary. He turned to Dorothy and said, I must send my man home to fetch me something. Then to the nurse, and said, 
go on as you are doing. Then once more to Dorothy saying, Come with me, Miss Drake. I want writing things. He led the way from the room, and Dorothy followed, but scarcely were they in the passage when the little man rose and met them. Faber would have pushed past him annoyed, but Polworth held out a little file to him. Perhaps this is what you want, sir, he said. The doctor caught it hastily, almost angrily, from his hand, looked at it, uncorked it, and put it to his nose. Thank you, he said. This is what I wanted, and returned instantly to the chamber. The little man resumed his patient seat on the side, breathing heavily. Ten minutes of utter silence followed. Then Dorothy passed him with a note in her hand and hurried down the stair. The next instant, Polworth heard the sound of Niger's hoofs tearing up the slope behind the house. I have got some more medicines here, Miss Drake, he said when he reappeared on the stair. As he spoke, he brought out file after file as if his pockets widened out below into the mysterious recesses of the earth to which, as a gnome, he belonged. Dorothy, however, told him it was not a medicine the doctor wanted now, but something else. She did not know what. Her face was dreadfully white, but as calm as an ice field. She went back into the room and Pulver sat down again. Not more than twenty minutes had passed when he heard again the soft thunder of Nitra's hoofs upon the sward, and in a minute more up came Lisbeth, carrying a little Morocco case which she left at the door of the room. Then an hour passed, during which he heard nothing. He sat motionless, and his troubled lungs grew quiet. Suddenly he heard Dorothy's step behind him and rose. "'You had better come downstairs with me,' she said in a voice he scarcely knew, and her face looked almost as if she had herself passed through a terrible illness. "'How is the poor lady?' he asked. "'The immediate danger is over,' the doctor says, "'but he seems in great doubt. He has sent me away. Come with me. I want you to have a glass of wine.' "'Has he recognized her?' I do not know. I haven't seen any sign of it yet, but the room is dark. We can talk better below. I am in want of nothing, my dear lady, said Polworth. I should much prefer staying here, if you will permit me. There is no knowing when I might be of service. I am far from unused to sick chambers. Do as you please, Mr. Polworth, said Dorothy, and going down the stair went into the garden. Once more Polworth resumed his seat. There came the noise of a heavy fall, which shook him where he sat. He started up went to the door of the chamber, listened a moment, heard a hurried step in the sweeping of garments, and making no more scruple, opened it and looked in. All was silent, and the room was so dark he could see nothing. Presently, however, he descried, in the middle of the floor, a prostrate figure that could only be the doctor, for plainly it was the nurse on her knees by him. He glanced toward the bed. There all was still. She is gone, he thought with himself, and the poor fellow has discovered who she was. He went in. Have you no brandy? He said to the nurse. On that table, she answered. Lay his head down and fetch it. Notwithstanding his appearance, the nurse obeyed. She knew the doctor required brandy, but had lost her presence of mind. Polworth took his hand. The pulse had vanished, and no wonder. Once more, utterly careless of himself, had the healer drained his own life spring to supply that of his patient, knowing as little now what that patient was to him as he knew than what she was going to be. A thrill had indeed shot to his heart at the touch of her hand, scarcely alive as it was, when first he felt her pulse. What he saw of her averted face through the folded shadows of pillows and curtains both of window and bed woke wild suggestions. As he bared her arm, he almost gave a cry. It was fortunate that there was not light enough to show the scar of his own lancet, but always at any critical moment self-possessed to coldness. He schooled himself now with sternest severity. He insisted to himself that he was in mortal danger of being fooled by his imagination, that a certain indelible imprint on his brain had begun to phosphoresce. If he did not banish the fancies crowding to overwhelm him, his patient's life, and probably his own reason as well, would be the penalty. Therefore, with will obstinately strained, he kept his eyes turned from the face of the woman, drawn to it as they were even by the terror of what his fancy might there show him, and held to his duty in spite of growing agony. His brain, he said to himself, was so fearfully excited that he must not trust his senses. They would reflect from within, instead of transmitting from without. And victoriously did he rule, until all the life he had in gift being exhausted, his brain, deserted by his heart, gave way, and when he turned from the bed all but unconscious, he could only stagger a pace or two, and fell like one dead. Polworth got some brandy into his mouth with a teaspoon. In about a minute, his heart began to beat. I must open another vein, 
he murmured as if in a dream. When he had swallowed a third teaspoonful, he lifted his eyelids in a dreary kind of way, saw Polworth, and remembered that he had something to attend to. A patient at the moment on his hands, probably. He could not tell. Tut, give me a wine glass of the stuff, he said. Polworth obeyed. The moment he swallowed it, he rose, rubbing his forehead as if trying to remember, and mechanically turned toward the bed. The nurse, afraid he might not yet know what he was about, stepped between, saying softly, She is asleep, sir, and breathing quietly. Thank God, he whispered with a sigh, and turning to a couch, laid himself gently upon it. The nurse looked at Polworth as much as to say, Who is to take the command now? I shall be outside, nurse. Call me if I can be useful to you, he replied to the glance, and withdrew to his watch on the top of the stair. After about a quarter of an hour, the nurse came out. Do you want me? said Polworth, rising hastily. No, sir, she answered. The doctor says all immediate danger is over, and he requires nobody with him. I am going to look after my baby. And please, sir, nobody is to go in, for he says she must not be disturbed. The slightest noise might spoil everything. She must sleep now all she can. Very well, said Polworth, and sat down again. The day went on, the sun went down, the shadows deepened, and not a sound came from the room. Again and again Dorothy came and peeped up the stair, but seeing the little man at his post, like Zacchaeus of the sycamore, was satisfied and withdrew. But at length Polworth bethought him that Ruth would be anxious and rose reluctantly. The same instant the door opened, and Faber appeared. He looked very pale and worn, almost haggard. Would you call Miss Drake? he said. Polworth went, and following Dorothy up the stair again, heard what Faber said. She is sleeping beautifully, but I dare not leave her. I must sit up with her tonight. Send my man to tell my assistant that I shall not be home. Could you let him have something to eat? And you take my place? And there is Polworth. He has earned his dinner, if anyone has. I do believe we owe the poor lady's life to him. Dorothy ran to give the message in her own orders. Polworth begged that she would tell the groom to say to Ruth as he passed that all was well, and when the meal was ready, joined Faber. It was speedily over. The doctor seemed anxious to be again with his patient. Then Dorothy went to Polworth. Both were full of the same question. Had Faber recognized his wife or not? Neither had come to a certain conclusion. Dorothy thought he had, but that he was too hard and proud to show it. Polworth thought he had not, but had been powerfully reminded of her. He had been talking strangely, he said, during their dinner, and had a drunk of good deal of wine in a hurried way. Polworth's conclusion was correct. It was with an excitement almost insane, and a pleasure the more sorrowful that he was aware of its transientness. A pleasure now mingling, now alternating with utter despair, that Faber returned to sit in the darkened chamber, watching the woman who, with such sweet torture, reminded him of her own he had lost. What a strange, unfathomable thing is the pleasure given us by a likeness. It is one of the mysteries of our humanity. Now she had seemed more, now less like his Juliet, but all the time he could see her at best only very partially. Ever since his fall, his sight had been weak, especially in twilight, and even when, once or twice, he stood over her as she slept, and strained his eyes to their utmost. He could not tell what he saw, for in the hope that, by the time it did come, its way would have prepared by a host of foregone thoughts. Dorothy had schemed to delay as much as she could the discovery, which she trusted in her heart must come at last, and had therefore contrived, not by drawn curtains merely, but by closed Venetian shutters as well, to darken the room greatly. And now he had no light but a small lamp, with a shade. He had taken a book with him, but it was little he read that night. At almost regular intervals he rose to see how his patient fared. She was still floating in the twilight shallows of death, whether softly drifting on the ebb tide of sleep out into the open sea or on its flow again up the river of life he could not yet tell. Once the nurse entered the room to see if anything were wanted, Faber lifted his head and motioned her angrily away, making no ghost of a sound. The night wore on and still she slept. In his sleepless and bloodless brain strangest thoughts and feelings went and came. The sense of old roses, the stings of old sins, awoke and vanished like the pulsing of fireflies. But even now he was the watcher of his own moods, and when among the rest the thought would come, what if this should be my own Juliet? Do not time and place agree with the possibility? And for a moment life seemed as if it would burst into the very madness of delight. Ever and again his common sense drove him to conclude that his imagination was fooling him. He dared not yield to the intoxicating idea. If he did, he would be like a man drinking poison, well knowing that every sip, in itself a delight, brought him a step nearer to agony and death. 
When she would wake and he let the light fall upon her face, he knew, so he said to himself, he knew the likeness would vanish in an appalling unlikeness, a mockery, a scoff of the whole night in its lovely dream, in a face which, if beautiful as that of an angel not being Juliet's, would be to him ugly, unnatural, a discord with the music of his memory. Still the night was checkered with moments of silvery bliss. In the indulgence of the mirror, the known fancy of what it would be if it were she, vanishing ever in the reviving rebuke, that he must nerve himself for the loss of that which the morning must dispel. Yet, like one in a dream, who knows it is but a dream, and scarce dares breathe lest he should break the mirrored ecstasy, he would not carry the lamp to the bedside. No act of his should disperse the airy flicker of the lovely doubt, not a movement, not a nearer glance, until stern necessity should command. History knows well the tendency of things to repeat themselves. Similar circumstances falling together must incline to the production of similar consequent events. Toward morning, Juliet awoke from her long sleep, but she had the vessel of her brain too empty of the life of this world to recognize barely that which was presented to her bodily vision. Over the march of two worlds, that of her imagination and that of fact, her soul hovered fluttering and blended the presentment of the two in the power of its unity. The only thing she saw was the face of her husband, sadly lighted by the dimmed lamp. It was some distance away, near the middle of the room. It seemed to her miles away, yet near enough to be addressed. It was a more beautiful face now than ever before, than even then when first she took it for the face of the Son of Man, more beautiful and more like him, for it was more humane. Thin and pale with suffering, it was no wise feeble, but the former self-sufficiency had vanished, and a still sorrow had taken its place. He had sunk in dim thought. A sound came that shook him as with an ague fit. Even then he mastered his emotion and sat still as a stone. Or was it delight unmastered and awe indefinable that paralyzed him? He dared not move lest he should break the spell. Were it fact, or were it but yet further phantom play on his senses, it should unfold itself. Not with a sigh would he jar the unfolding, but, ear only, listen to the end. In the utter stillness of the room, of the sleeping house, of the dark embracing night, he lay in famished wait for every word. Oh, Jesus, said the voice as of one struggling with weariness or one who speaks her thoughts in a dream, imagining she reads from a book a gentle tired voice. Oh, Jesus, after all, thou art there. They told me thou wast dead and gone nowhere. They said there never was such a one, and there thou art. Oh, Jesus, what am I to do? Art thou going to do anything with me? I wish I were a leper, or anything that thou wouldst make clean. But how couldst thou, for I never quite believed in thee, and never loved thee before? And there was my Paul, oh, how I loved my Paul, and he wouldn't do it. I begged and begged him, for he was my husband when I was alive, him to take me and make me clean, but he wouldn't. He was too pure to pardon me. He let me lie in the dirt. It was all right of him, but surely, Lord, thou couldst afford to pity a poor girl that hardly knew what she was doing. My heart is very sore, and my whole body is ashamed, and I feel so stupid. Do help me if thou canst. I denied thee, I know, but then I cared for nothing but my husband, and the denial of a silly girl could not hurt thee. If indeed thou art Lord of all worlds, I know thou wilt forgive me for that, but, O oh Christ, please, if thou canst any way do it, Make me fit for Paul. Tell him to beat me and forgive me. Oh, my Savior, do not look at me so. Oh, I shall forget Paul himself and die weeping for joy. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Paul! For Paul had gently risen from his chair and come one step nearer, where he stood looking on her with such a smile as seldom has been upon human face, a smile of unutterable sorrow, love, repentance, hope. She gazed speechless now, her spirit drinking in the vision of that smile. It was like mountain air, like water, like wine, like eternal life. It was forgiveness and peace from the Lord of all. And had her brain been as clear as her heart, could she have taken it for less? If the sinner forgave her, what did the perfect? Paul dared not go nearer. Partly from dread of the consequences of increased emotion, her lips began to move again and her voice to murmur, but he could distinguish only a word here and there. Slowly the eyelids fell over the great dark eyes. The words dissolved into syllables. The sounds ceased to be words at all and vanished. Her soul had slipped away into some silent dream. Then at length he approached on tiptoe, 
For a few moments he stood and gazed on the sleeping countenance, then dropped on his knees and cried, God, if thou be anywhere, I thank thee. Reader, who knowest better, do not mock him. Gently excuse him. His brain was excited. There was a commotion in the particles of human cauliflower. A rush of chemical changes and interchanges was going on. The tide was setting for the vasty deep of marvel, which was nowhere but within itself. And then he was in love with his wife, therefore open to deceptions without end. For is not all love a longing after what never was and never can be? He was beaten, but scorn him not for yielding. Think how he was beaten. Could he help it that the life in him proved too much for the death which which he had sighted? Was it pulled ruinery to desert the cause of ruin for that of growth? Of essential slavery for ordered freedom? Of disintegration for vital enlarging unity? He had said to corruption, Thou art my father, to the worm, thou art my mother and my sister. But a mightier than he, the life that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, had said, O thou enemy, destruction shall have a perpetual end. And he could not stand against the life by which he stood. When it comes to this, what can a man do? Remember, he was a created being, or, if you will not allow that, then something greatly less. If not loved into being by a perfect will, in his own image of life and law, he had but a mother whom he never could see, because she could never behold either herself or him. He was the offspring of the dead, and must be pardoned if he gave a foolish cry after a parent worth having. Wait, thou who countest such a cry a weak submission, until, having refused to take thine hour with thee, thine hour overtakes thee, then see if thou wilt stand out. Another's battle is easy. God only knows with what earthquakes and thunders that hour, on its way to find thee, may level the mountains and valleys between. If thou wouldst be perfect in the greatness of thy way, thou must learn to live in the fire of thy own divine nature turned against thy conscious self. Learn to smile content in that, and thou wilt out Satan Satan in the putridity of essential meanness, yea, self-satisfied in very virtue of thy shame. Thou wilt count it the throned apotheosis of inbred honor, but seeming is not being, least of all self-seeming. Dishonor will yet be dishonor, if all the fools in creation should be in love with it and call it glory. In an hour Juliet woke again, vaguely remembering a heavenly dream, whose odorous air yet lingered and made her happy. She knew not why. Then what a task would have been Faber's, for he must not go near her. The balance of her life trembled on a knife edge, and a touch might incline it toward death. A sob might determine the doubt. But as soon as he saw sign that her sleep was beginning to break, he all but extinguished the light. Then, having felt her pulse, listened to her breathing, and satisfied himself generally of her condition, crept from the room and, calling the nurse, told her to take his place. He would be either in the next room, he said, or within call in the park. He threw himself on the bed but could not rest, rose and had a bath, listened at Juliet's door, and hearing no sound, went to the stable. Niger greeted him with a neigh of pleasure. He made haste to saddle him, his hands trembling so that he could hardly get the straps into the girth buckles. That's Niger, said Juliet, hearing his whinny. Is he come? Who, ma'am? asked the nurse, a stranger to Glaston, of course. The doctor. Is he come? He's but gone, ma'am. He's been sitting by you all night. Would let no one else come near you. Rather peculiar, in my opinion. A soft flush, all the blood she could show, tinged her cheek. It was Hope's own color, the reflection of a red rose from a white. End of chapter 53。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter fifty four of Paul Faber Surgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Paul Faber Surgeon by George MacDonald. Nowhere and Everywhere. Faber sprung upon Niger's back and galloped wildly through the park. His soul was like a southern sea under a summer tornado. The slow dawn was gathering under a smoky cloud with an edge of cold yellow. A thin wind was abroad. Rain had fallen in the night, and the grass was wet and cool to Niger's hoofs. The earth sent up a savor which, like a soft warp, 
was crossed by a woof of sweet odors from leaf buds and wild flowers and spangled here and there with the silver thread of bird song for but a few of the beast angels were awake yet through the fine consorting mass of silence and odor went the soft thunder of niger's gallop over the turf his master's joy had overflowed into him the creatures are not all stupid that cannot speak some of them are with us more than we think according to the grand old tale god made his covenant with all the beasts that came out of the ark as well as with noah for them also he set his bow of hope in the cloud of fear they are god's creatures god bless them and if not exactly human are i think something more than humanish niger gave his soul with his legs to his master's mood that morning he was used to hard gallops with him across country but this was different this was plainly a frolic the first he had had since he came into his service and a frolic it should be a deeper loftier lovelier morning was dawning in faber's world unseen one dread burden was lifted from his being his fierce pride his unmanly cruelty his spotless selfishness had not hunted a woman's soul quite into the mouldy jaws of the grave she was given back to him to tend and heal and love as he had never yet dreamed of loving endless was the dawn that was breaking in him unutterably sweet the joy life was now to be lived not endured how he would nurse the lily he had bruised and broken from her own remorse he would shield her he would be to her a summer land a refuge from the wind a covert from the tempest he would be to her like that saviour for whom in her wandering fancy she had taken him never more in vaguest thought would he turn from her if in any evil mood a thought unkind should dare glance back at her past he would clasp her the closer to his heart the more to be shielded that the shield itself was so poor once he laughed aloud as he rode to find himself actually wondering whether the story of the resurrection could be true for what had the restoration of his juliet in common with the outworn superstition in any overwhelming joy he concluded the heart leans to lovely marvel but there is as much of the reasonable as of to us the marvellous in that which alone has ever made credible proffer toward the filling of the gulf whence issue all the groans of humanity let him be tested by the only test that can on the supposition of his asserted nature be applied to him that of obedience to the words he has spoken words that commend themselves to every honest nature proof of other sort if it could be granted would leaving our natures where they were only sink us in condemnation why should i pursue the story further and if not here where better should i stop the true story has no end no end but endlessly dreary would the story be were there no life living by its own will no perfect will one with an almighty heart no love in whom we live and move and have our being offer me an eternity in all things else after my own imagination but without a perfect father and i say no let me die even as the unbelieving would have it not believing in the father of jesus they are right in not desiring to live heartily do i justify them therein for all this talk and disputation about immortality wherein is regarded only the continuance of consciousness beyond what we call death it is to me with whatever splendour of intellectual coruscation it be accompanied but little better than a foolish babble the crackling of thorns under a pot apart from himself god forbid there should be any immortality if it could be proved apart from him then apart from him it could be and would be infinite damnation it is an impossibility and were but an unmitigated evil and if it be impossible without him it cannot be believed without him if it could be proved without him the belief so gained would be an evil only with the knowledge of the father of christ did the endlessness of being become a doctrine of bliss to men if he be the first life 
the author of his own, to speak after the language of man, and the origin and source of all other life, it can be only by knowing him that we can know whether we shall live or die. Nay, more, far more. The knowledge of him by such innermost contact as is possible only between creator and created, and possible only when the created has aspired to be one with the will of the creator. Such knowledge and such alone is life to the created. It is the very life, that alone for the sake of which God created us. If we are one with God in heart, in righteousness, in desire, no death can touch us, for we are life, and the garment of immortality, the endless length of days, which is but the mere shadow of the eternal, follows as a simple necessity. He is not the God of the dead, or of the dying, but of the essentially alive. Without this inmost knowledge of him, this oneness with him, we have no life in us, for it is life, and that for the sake of which all this outward show of things and our troubled condition in the midst of them exists. All that is mighty, grand, harmonious, therefore in its own nature true, is. If not, then dearly I thank the grim death, that I shall die and not live. Thus undeceived, my only terror would be that the unbelievers might be but half fright, and there might be a life so called beyond the grave without God. My brother man, is the idea of God too good or too foolish for thy belief? Or is it that thou art not great enough or humble enough to hold it? In either case, I will believe it for thee and me. Only be not stiff-necked when the truth begins to draw thee. Thou wilt find it hard if she has to go behind and drive thee, hard to kick against the divine goads, which be thou ever so mulish, will be too much for thee at last. Yea, the time will come when thou wilt gold thyself toward the divine. But hear me this once more. The God, the Jesus in whom I believe, are not the God, the Jesus in whom you fancy I believe. You know them not. Your idea of them is not mine. If you knew them, you would believe in them, for to know them is to believe in them. Say not, let him teach me then, except you mean it in submissive desire, for he has been teaching you all this time. If you have been doing his teaching, you are on the way to learn more. If you hear and do not heed, where is the wonder that the things I tell you sound in your ears as the muttering of a dotard? They convey to you nothing, it may be, but that which makes of them words, words, words lies in you, not in me. Yours is the killing power. They would bring you life, but the death in him that knoweth and doeth not is strong. In your air they drop and die, winged things no more. For days Faber took measures not to be seen by Juliet, but he was constantly about the place, and when she woke from asleep, they had often to tell her that he had been by her side all the time she slept. At night he was either in her room or in the next chamber. Dorothy used to say to her that if she wanted her husband, she had only to go to sleep. She was greatly tempted to pretend, but would not. At length Faber requested Dorothy to tell Juliet that the doctor said she might send for her husband when she pleased. Much as he longed to hear her voice, he would not come without her permission. He was by her side the next moment, but for minutes not a word was spoken. A speechless embrace was all. It does not concern me to relate how by degrees they came to a close understanding. Where love is, everything is easy or, if not easy, yet to be accomplished. Of course Faber made his return confession in full. I will not say that Juliet had not her respondent pangs of retrospective jealousy. Love, although an angel, has much to learn yet, and the demon jealousy may be one of the schoolmasters of her coming perfection. God only knows. There must be a divine way of casting out the demon, else how would it be hereafter? unconfessed to each other their falls would forever have been between to part them confessed they drew them together in sorrow and humility and mutual consoling the little amanda could not tell whether juliet's house or dorothy's was her home when at the one she always talked of the other as home 
She called her father Papa and Juliet Mama. Dorothy had been Auntie, and from the first she always wrote her name Amanda Duck Faber. For all this, the gossips of Glaston explained everything satisfactorily. Juliet had left her husband on discovering that he had a child of whose existence he had never told her, but learning that the mother was dead, yielded at length and was reconciled. That was the nearest they ever came to the facts, and it was not needful they should ever know more. The talkers of the world are not on the jury of the court of the universe. They are many, doubtless, who need the shame of a public exposure to make them recognize their own doing for what it is. But of such Juliet had not been. Her husband knew her fault. That was enough. He knew also his own immeasurably worse than hers. But when they folded each other to the heart, they left their faults outside, as God does when he casts our sins behind his back in utter uncreation. I will say nothing definite as to the condition of mind at which Faber had arrived when last Wingfold and he had talked together. He was growing, and that is all we can require of any man. He would not say he was a believer in the supernal, but he believed more than he said, and he never talked against belief. Also, he went as often as he could to church, which, little as it means in general, did not mean little when the man was Paul Faber, and where the minister was Thomas Wingfold. It is time for the end. Here it is in a little poem, which on her next birthday the curate gave Dorothy. O wind of God that blowest in the mind, blow, blow, and wake the gentle spring in me. Blow, swifter blow, a strong, warm summer wind, till all the flowers with eyes come out to see. Blow till the fruit hangs red on every tree, and our high-soaring song larks meet thy dove. High the imperfect soars, descends the perfect love. Blow not the less, though winter cometh then. Blow, wind of God, blow hither changes keen. Let the spring creep into the ground again. The flowers close all their eyes, not to be seen. All lives in thee that ever once hath been. Blow, fill my upper air with icy storms. Breathe cold, O wind of God, and kill my canker worms. End of chapter 54 End of Paul Faber's Surgeon This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.